Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's so good to have you. I'm so excited today to share with you the second book in the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Romance series. Try saying that five times fast. I am thrilled to share Forrest and Mitzi's story. Mitzi is a single mom, barely making it through, and a reindeer snowflake shows up on her doorstep. There's so many wonderful things to discover in this book. So many Christmas magical things, so many reindeer wonderful things that I cannot wait to get you in there and get you over to the book. And I'll see you on the flip side. A Nutty Christmas Reunion A Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Christmas Romance Book Written by Lucy McConnell Prologue Billy Edge Eight-year-old Billy Edge trudged home from the sledding hill with his head hung low and his spirits even lower. He'd hoped the new sleigh he'd found under the tree Christmas morning would help the other kids see that he was just like them. It was made of hard plastic with handles on the edges and enough room for two to zoom down the hill together. Unlike his old sled, with a picture of a superhero on it, this one was solid gray, the color of a motorcycle or a fighter jet. Third grade was hard enough without moving to a new school. He kicked a clump of snow and watched it blow up. No one had to laugh at him. But they did. They laughed, and then they ignored him. He hated it here. At his old school, he had lots of friends. He wouldn't be alone the day after Christmas, he'd be at Jeff's house, building whatever giant Lego set Santa brought. Or he'd be in Cade's garage, fiddling with the scooter they were building. According to the YouTube videos, they only needed one more part. He hated his dad. If he hadn't run away from home, sniffing loudly Billy swiped at his face. He hated crying. He hated feeling like he was out of control and that no one cared. Mom did, but she was stressed all the time and not the same as she'd been before Dad left. Neither of them were. A whimper reached his ears, pulling Billy up short. The sled bounced off the back of his heels and stopped. He glanced behind him, expecting to see Jordan, the biggest bully in class, mocking him for crying. But Jordan wasn't there, and his were the only footprints in the snow. He must have misheard. He started walking, and the sound came again. This time he thought it came from the right. Leaving his sled, he stepped off the path and into the brush. There might be a rabbit caught in a trap or a wolf. He stopped and pulled his arms up to his chest. Wolves were dangerous enough when they were healthy, but a wounded one would bite him for sure. The sound came again, desperate and afraid. His little boy heart couldn't take it anymore, and he sprang into action, pushing branches aside. He stumbled into a clearing and froze at the sight of a reindeer tangled up in a harness attached to a sleigh. A real, honest-to-goodness Santa sleigh. She panted. Her chest heaved up and down as if she'd been fighting for hours to be free. Their eyes met. For Billy, it seemed as if the world stopped at the same time a door inside of his heart opened up. Help me. She seemed to plead with him. Or maybe she'd actually spoken. He wasn't sure. He just knew that she was asking for his help begging for kindness from a stranger she would otherwise shy away from. He held up his gloved hands. I'll get you out. She held still as he approached, tracking his movements. Her muscles were tight and hard, as if she was waiting to burst out of here. Don't run over me, okay? He continued to inch closer, aware of pokey ends on her antlers. His eyes dropped to the twisted harness, and he caught sight of an ugly piece of red skin. Oh, man. The leather strap was wrapped around her leg. It was swollen and purple and looked like it had burst open when the leather rubbed it the wrong way. He fell to his knees and started pulling on the strap, desperate for a way to loosen it. 
His eyes landed on a buckle, and he undid it. The sudden freedom caused the reindeer to lurch forward. She cried out again. Sorry. Billy yelped. She laid her head down on the snow and closed her eyes. His mom did that when she was trying to calm down and not cry. Sorry, he apologized again. She was still trapped by several more leather straps. He worked with more thoughtfulness and less fear. When he'd taken off everything but the harness around her face, he stepped back. Okay, can you get up? She drew in a breath and struggled to stand on shaking front legs. After a painful attempt to put weight on her back foot, she fell over again. Billy went to her head and knelt down. He ached for her. An animal with a broken leg wouldn't survive. Please don't leave me. His tears fell on her cheek, and she turned to watch him. I don't want you to die. Please get better. It seemed all his heartbreak over the last six months knotted in his throat, and he knew, he just knew, that if this reindeer didn't survive, a part of him wouldn't either. The reindeer sniffed his knee and then laid her heavy chin on his lap and huffed out. He had to save her. We have a barn. No one uses it but me. He wiped his cheeks. If we can get you there, I know you'll be safe. As if accenting his words, a wolf howled in the distance. She lifted her head, her brow wrinkling as she considered the forest around her. I can't leave you here. Please, you have to walk. With a worried glance over the ridge where the wolf howled, the reindeer began to move. Billy scrambled to his feet. You can do it. It's not far. I promise. Come on. She stomped her front hoof, and then she lifted all four hooves off the ground. Billy rubbed his eyes, the smooth fabric of his gloves ice cold against his face. You're, you're floating. She lifted an eyebrow at him, asking him to rephrase that. He looked at the sleigh. Santa's sleigh. You're flying. She bobbed her head with some effort, as flying with only three legs was only slightly better than walking. Billy grinned. For the first time since he'd learned the meaning of the word divorce and they'd come to this podunk town, he felt hope. Come on. I'll find something for you to eat. Do you like carrots? Her eyes brightened. We have a bag in the fridge. He started off, thought better of just leaving her to fly behind him, and found a long strip of leather, which he tied under her chin. Don't want you floating away. He wasn't sure how this flying reindeer thing worked, but he'd figure it out. She came with him, her head moving slowly up and down as she limped through the air. Her hurt leg hung straight down instead of bent like the other one. That was bad. He retrieved his sled, dragging it behind him as they went. Do you have a name? He checked to see if she responded. She nodded. Whom? I'm not sure how you're going to tell me. Can I call you Candy? It seemed like a good name for one of Santa's reindeer. She blew out her lips, making the raspberry sound. He laughed, the sound foreign after so many months of not hearing it. Dasher? Dancer? He went through all the reindeer names he knew before making it to the barn. But once they got there, it became more important to make a bed for the reindeer and get her settled than to figure out her name. He pulled open the door to one of the stalls in the back. Will this work? It was clean. Yeah, there was some dust, but it was a barn, so that was expected. The window above her was covered in gray film that had probably been there before he was born. She limped inside and inspected every corner before settling against the far wall with a moan and a huff and a heavy sigh. 
She was kind of dramatic, like Lucy at school, who was always in a crisis. She shifted and then laid her head down on the hard-packed dirt. That doesn't look very comfortable. I'll be right back. He took off for the house, making sure to shut the barn door so she didn't wander out. He pulled the blanket off the back of the couch and gathered it against his chest. It was old and worn out and he and mom used it for picnics, so it was okay to take outside. He was almost out the back door when mom called, Whoa there, Speedy. Whatcha doing? Billy turned around and stared at his mom, a big debate happening inside of him. He could tell her a quick fib and be on his way. But for some reason, he thought of how he'd laughed and felt happy around Santa's reindeer, and he wanted to see the light in his mother's eyes. Can you keep a secret? he asked her. She cocked her head. I'm actually a pretty great secret keeper. Follow me. He motioned for her to follow him through the kitchen and out the back door. Their house was weird. The road came up to the back of it, going right past the barn, and people were always knocking on the kitchen door because walking all the way around to the front was a lot of work. Mom took forever at getting her snow boots on, but they finally made their way out to the barn. At the door Billy put his finger over his lips. You have to be quiet, don't scream. Mom grabbed his shoulders. Billy Edge, please tell me you didn't trap a coyote in the barn. He shrugged off her hold. No, Mom. She's not dangerous, but she's hurt. Mom's forehead wrinkled. Before she could tell him he couldn't go inside, he pushed the door open wide enough for him and the blanket to fit and then squeezed through. Mom was right behind him, a hand on his shoulder, probably so she could yank him away from whatever was in there. Billy tried not to shrug her off. He wanted her to say he could keep the reindeer. He wanted to make her better and see her fly again. He made his way to the last stall mom creeping behind him like she was in a Scooby-Doo movie. Moms. He opened the door, half expecting the reindeer to have disappeared and left behind a pile of glitter. But she was there, looking at him with a lot of curiosity. Billy, mom, breathed quietly. What? How? I found her. He walked into the stall, holding the blanket out so the reindeer could sniff it. I brought you a blanket to lay on. He laid it out as best he could, wondering if she'd get up and move over to it or what. He'd never done this before. The reindeer turned and looked at mom, asking him, who is she? That's my mom, Mitzi. She's kind of nervous. I told her you wouldn't hurt us, though. He turned to face mom. It's one of Santa's reindeer. I found her in the woods with a sleigh. She's hurt. He pointed to her leg. It looks worse now. I shouldn't have let her fly on it, but she's too big to fit on my sleigh. Fly? Mom asked. Billy nodded. Mom pressed her lips together which meant a lecture was coming. Billy sagged. He'd listen and say he was sorry, whatever he had to do so they could help the reindeer faster. Mom thought for a minute before turning to the reindeer. Billy let out the breath he'd been holding. Mom approached slowly. Can I look at it? She asked the reindeer. She blinked a yes. Billy watched in wonder as Mom's hands moved over the leg. When it got to the spot where the leather had wrapped tight, the reindeer sucked in quickly. Mom yanked her hands back. Sorry. I know it's tender, but I need to check for a break. How do you know what to do? Billy asked. Mom smiled, a real one with teeth and everything. I lived on a farm, remember? 
We had to know all sorts of things about animals. Somehow, she looked younger when she talked about going to elementary school in North Dakota. She used to tell him stories all the time about her horse Buttercup, but she hadn't in a long time. He missed those stories. Hold her harness for me, would you? I don't want her thrashing while I probe the bone. Billy did as he was told and grabbed one side of the harness, gripping tight. Hold still now. Mom's good at fixing things. I had a cut once, right here. He pointed to his head. She used glue to put it back together, and you can't even see a scar because my hair covers it. Talking kept the reindeer's gaze on him and not on what mom was doing. Mom finished her exam and rocked back on her heels before sitting crisscross on the dirty floor. I'm afraid you fractured your leg. Down here, near the ankle. But the ankle is fine, which is good. The reindeer laid her head down as if the news was devastating. He patted her neck. We'll help you get better. Mom considered the two of them like she was looking to see how a puzzle piece fit in a certain spot. We'll have to brace it, and she won't be able to walk for at least three weeks. Maybe it would be better if we called animal control and let them take care of her. Billy wrapped his arms around the animal's neck. No. I found her. I promised I'd help. Besides, she can fly. We can't let someone else take her. They'll sell her to the circus or something. She has to get back to Santa. He started to cry. He just couldn't hold it all in, there were so many sad things. Mom reached for him, and he fell into her arms for a rocking hug. Okay. Okay. She stroked his hair, and his frantic feelings of loss abetted. I'll make you a deal. We'll do what we can. If she doesn't show improvement in a week, we'll find someone who can do more for her, okay? Sure. A week was forever. He sniffed. She'd get better. And he'd make sure she ate, and he'd clean up the stall. He glanced at the blanket, hoping she knew better than to poop on it. What are you going to call her? Mom asked. He shrugged. She has a name, but she won't tell me. Mom moved so she could see the reindeer's face. She reached out and traced the star on her forehead. Star, she asked. Wait. She moved her fingers over two smaller lines. It almost looks like a snowflake. The reindeer's eyes widened, and she nodded her head quickly. Mom laughed at her antics, the sound better than bells on Christmas. Billy's heart swelled. It worked. Already, Santa's reindeer was making Mom happy again. The magical reindeer could fix them, he just knew it. I think we'll call her Snowflake. Mom ran her hand down Snowflake's neck. I'll be back in a minute with some first aid supplies. She set him off her lap and stood up. Snowflake nudged his leg. And carrots, he called after mom. She likes carrots. Mom smiled, lifting both her hands as if she didn't know what to make of all this. Carrots it is. Billy listened as mom left, and then he took off his gloves and rubbed Snowflake's snowflake. Her hair was soft but thick. Promise me you'll never go away, he begged. Even if Santa comes back for you. Snowflake touched her nose to his, and he felt the promise all the way to his snow boots. You're my best friend, Snowflake. He hugged her as tight as he dared. You'll always be my best friend. He kissed her cheek and took in the earthy smell of her fur. Nothing's going to tear us apart. We're going to have a lot of fun together. 
and I'll read you all my favorite books while you're getting better. Mom reappeared, and he clammed up. You know, I used to talk to Buttercup all the time. Mom worked without looking at him. What would you talk about? Everything. She laid a wooden ruler over Snowflake's leg and eyed it for size. I'd tell her about my day at school, my fight with your Aunt Barbara, just about anything. She was a great listener. She set the ruler in place and began wrapping a bandage around the ruler and the leg. I'll bet Snowflake is a good listener too. Her ears are the perfect size for it. Snowflake flicked one ear in agreement. Billy met his mom's astonished gaze, and they laughed together. Once the wrapping was done, she pulled a long carrot out of her inside coat pocket. Go ahead, give this to her for being such a good patient. Billy held out the carrot. Snowflake sniffed the air around it before using her lips to draw it into her mouth and crunching loudly. Mom chuckled. Can we keep her, Mom? As much as Snowflake's promise to stay filled him up, Billy understood that there was a more powerful force in the universe, a mother's decree. Let's take it week by week, okay? Okay. He hugged her. Thanks, Mom. She ruffled his hair. Thanks for trusting me with your secret. Mitzi Edge Mitzi helped Billy get settled in the barn with the reindeer for an afternoon of storytelling and healing. She found herself chuckling as she stood at the kitchen sink to wash dishes and keep an eye on the barn. At first, she hadn't liked the layout of the house, with the single-lane road winding up at the back door, but right now, she was glad to have a view of the barn while she worked. The reindeer was something special. Her first thought when she'd seen Snowflake had been of Sleigh Bell County, where she'd spent most of her elementary school years. What had the Nicholas boys called themselves? Reindeer Wranglers. That was it. Even when they were no taller than Billy, they'd insisted they were Wranglers. She grinned. Well, one of them insisted, Forrest Nicholas. The sandy brown-haired boy was a tornado in a pair of cowboy boots. She'd spent many hours telling Buttercup about the stupid things Forrest did in class. That boy could get under her skin so fast. Looking back, she'd probably had a crush on him, but she'd been too young to understand why she could go from staring at him with her brain full of fog to matter than a wet hen in two seconds flat. Of course, it didn't help that Forrest liked to push her buttons. He was all grown up now. So was she. Grown up and wiser to the ways of charming men and their wandering hearts. Turning her thoughts back to her own barn, she contemplated where the reindeer had come from. They were too far from Reindeer Wrangler Ranch for it to be theirs, especially if she'd been harnessed to a sleigh. Mitzi would need to walk out with Billy and look it over. Maybe there was contact information or a license plate or something. She scoffed at her thoughts. They may be in farm country, but if it didn't have a motor, then it didn't need a plate. And even that rule was pushed aside if the tractor was old enough. Billy thought Snowflake was one of Santa's reindeer. Mitzi's heart ached for all that her son had lost over the last year, so much so that saying no to helping the wounded animal wasn't an option. If Mitzi could, she would have given Billy everything on his Christmas list and more. Between the sporadic child support checks and her minimum wage job, she was lucky to make ends meet, let alone spoil her son. She reflected on their time in the barn and the sound of laughter that filled the air. Billy seemed like his old self this afternoon. And she remembered what it felt like to let go of the clouds and let the sunshine through. Her sunshine. Maybe this was a good thing. 
Dad always said animals had a way of healing the soul, bless him for being a man she could count on. If only he were still around. She turned on an Elvis Presley Christmas playlist and swung her hips to the uptempo beat. She wanted laughter back in her life and her home. She wanted to be the kind of woman who took care of others, who opened her home and let Jesus shine through the windows of her soul. When the song ended, she blew a kiss towards the barn. Thanks, Snowflake. You reminded me of what Christmas is all about. With that, a love for the reindeer bloomed inside of her. Heaven helped the man who tried to come between her and her reindeer. They were keeping Snowflake, and that was that. Chapter 1 Somewhere in the Wilds of Oregon December 1st Trees bigger than any building back home crowded in, making the path disappear, but Forrest Nicholas wasn't discouraged by tripping over large roots or having to scurry over a wall in his snowshoes. Not when he was close to finally finding Snowflake. The speedy reindeer had flown off last Christmas Eve, taking a magical sleigh with her. The night had been a mess on multiple levels. When the magical dust had settled, it had become apparent that Snowflake wasn't going to find her way home and one of the reindeer wranglers would have to go after her before she was spotted, caught, or worse, hurt. A flying reindeer might be magical from Thanksgiving to New Year's, but she was likely to get shot right out of the air any other time of year especially since she was drawn to the less populated parts of the country. So far this year, he'd heard stories of her flying through Arkansas, New Mexico, and now Oregon all in one night. Considering she started in Las Vegas, she'd made an impressive number of appearances for a lone reindeer. We really need to install tracking devices on the sleighs. He grunted as he stomped the ground in a low area to make sure it was solid. He didn't want to fall into a river covered with snow. It happened. Although he couldn't hear water moving, that didn't mean it wasn't there. Being cautious had kept him alive for the last ten months as he trekked across this great country, a hotel bed was a blessing, as he spent most nights sleeping in the camper in the bed of his truck. You talking to me? called a gravelly voice, the kind that sounded like it didn't get used often. It brought to mind the old push mower he'd used growing up, he'd pull on the cord and the engine would grumble and work its way up to full speed. He scanned the tree line and found a stooped figure that he could have walked right by without knowing it was there. The old-timer had on a white camel military issue coat. His gray beard hung down at his belly, and his white hair tufted out from under a gray beanie. In this frozen world, he was no princess. I was talking to myself, but I'm glad to find a friend, Forrest responded. You lost? Nope. With his satellite phone and GPS, he had his location pinned down. Then what the heck are you doing out here? Forrest stopped his approach. The man's angry tone said he'd crossed a line somewhere. Sorry, friend. I didn't realize I was trespassing. I ain't your friend. He narrowed his eyes. And I don't own so much as a piece of dirt, so don't go getting all fussy at me. Forrest smiled easily. He'd met a few hermits on his travels this year. Only one of them was dangerous, and he'd handed over all his food and water in exchange for his life. It sounded scary, but really, he felt watched over at the time. Part of him wondered who was being watched over, though, the man desperate enough to point a knife at another human, or the one who had more than enough food to appease him. God certainly worked in mysterious ways, and who was Forrest to question him? I have some jerky and a couple apples. Want to trade? He motioned to a stump nearby where he could lay out his items and they could make a deal. The man nodded, and they took up positions on either side like contestants in a game show. After brushing the snow off the makeshift table as best he could, Forrest shifted his pack and it slung off his back and onto the ground. He hardly noticed the weight of it anymore, though he'd have permanent indents in his shoulders from the straps. I got this. The old-timer pulled out a bottle of moonshine. Forrest waved it off. You can keep that. He plopped the goods on the stump. He'd picked up a couple of apples two days ago and had been saving them for Snowflake. 
What I want is information. The man's eyes narrowed. I'm gathering stories. Weird stuff that happens in the woods. It wasn't exactly a lie. He had certainly collected his share of campfire-worthy tales over the last year as he met people who didn't want to be found. Bigfoot. Loch Ness type stuff. You know? He paused. The man's eyes darted to the side. Flying reindeer, Forrest ventured. The man flinched. Ah. Forrest opened the jerky. The scent of teriyaki-flavored meat filled the space between them. Here. He held out the bag. A hesitant hand reached in for a piece. No. Take the bag. He pushed it at the man. He took it and frowned. Can't exactly say what I saw. It was big, though. Forrest held back. What he wanted to do was grab the guy by the shoulders and shake the information out of him. But he'd learned the hard way that patience was better than eagerness. The man set a piece of meat between his teeth and tugged. He chewed for a minute, both on his thoughts and the food. If you're looking for strange, then you'll find it headed that way. He pointed east with his middle finger. Forrest did a double take. The man was missing his first finger altogether. Flying about a hundred miles per hour and prettiest deer I ever did see. She had a sleigh and a determined look. That's all I'm gonna say about that. He tucked the bag under his arm and stomped off. Wasn't long before he completely disappeared. There was enough snow out here to muffle the sound of a train engine. East. Forrest pulled out his SAT phone and dialed the house. Mom answered, her usual holiday cheer dripping through the phone like a Bing Crosby Christmas carol. Reindeer Wrangler Ranch, this is Anna speaking. It's me, Mom. Forrest. Forrest grinned. Mom never checked the caller ID. Did you find her? His grin slipped away faster than his newfound friend had only a moment ago. No. But I have a lead. Oh. Hang on. Mom moved away from the phone, but he could hear her talking to Jack, his older brother and a twin to Caleb. I should be there, Jack said, among other things that were hard to make out. If anyone should not be here, it was Jack. He was relentless. When Jack wanted something, he didn't care who he had to climb over to get it. For the most part, this served them well, as his determination meant that the ranch was protected legally and they often received grants to supplement the care for the animals. However, his bulldog tactics would have scared off the hermit in a heartbeat. No, Jack should not be here. Even knowing all that Forrest was homesick and wished for his brother's company. Growing up in a family of five boys meant he always had a partner in crime and an alibi. He missed the camaraderie, the closeness, the friendship. Standing in the middle of a forest full of trees, he knew exactly how small he was in this world and how far away from home. Mom, I gotta go. I need to get back to the truck and get on the road. Mom refocused on him. How much longer? Her voice was pained. She knew he didn't have an answer for her, but he loved that she missed him. I need to bring Snowflake home. I can't stop looking. Christmas is in 24 days. I want you home with or without the reindeer. Mom. He spoke low, not knowing how to convey the urgency inside of him to find Snowflake. I know. I saw the driving you before you left. But it's more than that, isn't it? We have a sacred responsibility to these reindeer, Mom. That we do. Although I never thought I'd be sending one of you off in search of them like this. We miss you, son. I miss you, and the family. Give everyone a hug from me. It was time to put a lid on the homesickness and get back to work. We'll continue to pray, for you and Snowflake. Love you. He told her he loved her too and hung up the phone, tucking it into the inside pocket of his coat so it stayed warm. The cold tended to drain batteries, and he didn't want to be out here without it. He turned around and began to retrace his path. He'd have a few hours to hike out, and then he'd have to dig a snow cave for the night. 
it was 26.3 miles to the truck. And then he had to pick up the trail in Idaho. At this rate, he wouldn't make it home in time for Christmas. No, he couldn't think like that. Things would work out. He just had to hold on to faith a little longer. Chapter 2 Snowflake Mitzi Edge tapped her toe. Not that it made any sound against the hard-packed dirt floor, but she was trying to convey a sense of sternness. As much as she hated it, the reindeer needed to be reprimanded. I know you're in there. Come on out and face the music. Bumblebee, the rooster, and the hens, Tweedle and Deedle, pecked at the remains of Snowflake's misadventure, eagerly hiding the evidence. Well, there was no hiding the old container. That was over a week's worth of breakfast for her and Billy. What was she supposed to feed him now? The door to Snowflake's stall slowly opened and Snowflake peeked around the edge, her big brown eyes full of remorse. For the love of all things Christmas. It was so much harder to stay mad at her when she was contrite. Mitzi held out a hand, and Snowflake moved to quickly press her forehead against her palm. How'd you get in the house with those antlers? The reindeer was like a ghost. When the first bits of food had gone missing, she thought Billy was feeding Snowflake more than he should. Billy had denied it, and she'd sent him to his room for lying. On the way back to the kitchen, she'd heard a noise. Creeping down the hall, she'd found Snowflake in her kitchen, calmly chewing on a celery stalk. Needless to say Billy had gotten out of trouble. The way these two watched out for each other was admirable. And concerning. Mitzi did her best not to think about the fact that her son's best friend was a reindeer. She did even better when she didn't think about how easy it was to fall into a conversation with the animal as if she could talk back. Life was hard enough without looking too deeply at the blessings. At least Billy had a best friend, and at least the reindeer was smart. Sometimes too smart. Stop taking human food. Mitzi wagged her finger at Snowflake. Snowflake hung her head and sighed. The sigh was half sorry for stealing, half sorry she'd been caught. You're too smart to be cooped up in here all day, you need a challenge. She rubbed Snowflake's neck. I get it. I do. But please stop taking our food. We need to eat too, and there's only so much to go around out here. Just then, Tweedle, or was it Deedle, let out a big gawk. And flapped off, leaving an egg behind. Mitzi stared in awe. Neither hen had laid an egg in three weeks. Snowflake looked at her. See? You have food. One egg isn't enough. She hurried over to grab it before one of the cats found it. They had two females Billy had rescued from behind the hardware store where she worked. They'd been fixed but were starved. She suspected someone had moved and abandoned them, leaving them to fend for themselves long enough that they were scrappy. One egg might not be enough to feed her and Billy, but she wasn't going to look a gift hen in the mouth. Four ducks waddled in out of the cold. As if they smelled the oats that had been eaten, they made a dash for the spot where the carton was lying on its side and commenced an inspection. Billy came in only a second later. He took one look at the carton on the floor, and his eyes went wide. Don't worry. Mitzi held up her hands. I've already had a talk with her. His eyes darted to Snowflake, who blinked, letting him know it wasn't so bad. Outside, a goose honked and five others answered. They wandered around the barnyard. When they'd first flown in last spring Mitzi had worried about feeding them too. Her meager paycheck was already stretched to the point of snapping. 
but the geese foraged on their own. She'd assumed they'd fly south for the winter, but they'd hung out beyond the first snowfall, roosting in the first stall at night and then wandering the property during the day. Billy picked up the oat container. Sorry, Mom. He went over and threw it in the garbage can. Mitzi tugged at the scarf around her neck. Why don't you think up some games for Snowflake? I think she'd like to work out some puzzles or something. Play hide and seek, maybe. Snowflake twitched her ears, telling them that she'd be up for a game or two. Billy brightened. Yeah. We'll be in the woods. The two of them darted out the door, leaving it swinging on its hinges. The sound was high-pitched and echoed across what their landlady called a yard. Mitzi called it dirt in the summer, mud in the spring and fall, and a slipping hazard in the winter. Right now, a snowman stood sentry smack dab in the middle. He wore her ex-husband's cowboy hat, which she thought was great, considering he'd spent more money on that hat than on her engagement ring. Maybe it was a waste to let it weather and be ruined, but it sure felt like therapy to her. She smiled in the direction the two friends scampered off. There was one thing about living in rural Idaho, it was a safe place to play outside. Besides, Snowflake would watch out for Billy. Her sense of peace was invaded by the sound of a diesel truck bumping up the dirt road to her back door. She frowned as Ely's outline became clear through the windshield. Darn! For a brief moment, she considered ducking into the barn and pretending she wasn't home, but her car was parked on the patch of crumbling concrete that passed as a driveway. Ely parked, set the brake, and opened the door. Before he could get too comfortable Mitzi was there. Evening, she said, even though it was barely afternoon. She didn't want him to think he had all the time in the world to hang out. Can I help you with something? Ely's chin jerked back. No. I, ah. Uh. He looked down at his boots as if he'd written notes there. Carla sent you some Christmas jam. He turned quickly back to the truck, reached inside, and when he spun back around, he had a loaf of bread in one arm and a bottle of jam in the other. Mitzi's heart softened at the sight. The Lord really did provide. She knew that. She knew it to her very bones as he proved over and over again that he held her and Billy in his hands. It was just that when a whole bag of oats went missing, she felt it like a wound. Mostly a wound to her pride that she wasn't able to provide for her son. She smiled easily. Thank you. Breakfast was looking mighty slim. She held up the egg, also a blessing from God. She should have thanked him earlier. If you need cash, Mitzi looked off to the side and cleared her throat. It was a joke. Oh. Good, then. Ely still held the bread close to his chest, and she wasn't about to get closer to take it from him. She could have given them to me at work. Carla was the owner of the hardware store. She was also Ely's stepmom. His dad had passed away before Mitzi moved to town. I told her I didn't mind running it out to you. Ely stared at her, a half-smile on his face and his eyes soft. Growing more uncomfortable by the nanosecond, she took the proffered items and headed for the house. Behind her, the truck door shut, and then Ely's footsteps followed. Great. Did he think she was going to invite him inside? Not a chance. So, I was thinking, Ely, she warned. They'd been down this road before. She didn't like to be the bad guy, but she had to stay firm. There's that ice skating thing. Mitzi stopped walking and faced him. Ely, you're a nice guy. 
But it wouldn't be fair to you to lead you on and make you think there's something here that's not. His eyes glinted and then softened. I know you've been hurt, but I'm not going to do that to you. Mitzi smiled. I believe you. I just don't have it in me to love anyone but Billy right now. He deserves all my attention. To her dismay, Ely brightened. I'm not in a hurry. He winked and spun on his boot. I'll see you later, Mitzi. He started whistling Winter Wonderland. Mitzi rolled her eyes. That's not what I meant, she called after him. But either he didn't hear her over his own whistle or he chose not to listen, because he didn't respond. She rolled her eyes and bumped the back door open with her hip. She stared around the kitchen, mentally picturing the sparse contents of the cupboards and fridge behind their closed doors. A sense of panic crept in like frost on a window, and she bowed her head, begging God to help her be strong. I don't see what you see, but please, show me how to do what I need to do. The bills are piling up. And I have too many mouths to feed. I don't even have a Christmas gift for Billy. She sniffed, feeling the loneliness of being single. Most times, she was happy to be on her own, making all the decisions and not having to make excuses for her ex's behavior. As the daughter of a single mother, she had an excellent example of a woman who could do it all. It was just, there were times she wanted to lean into a warm body and rest. In the silence that followed her plea came a warm reassurance that all would be well. When she opened her eyes, the stack of bills was still on the counter and the cupboards were still empty. But she had the courage to continue on. For now, that would have to be enough. Chapter 3 When he looked at a picture of a snow-covered landscape forest always felt peaceful, as if the world was quieter because of the blanket. Likely he'd been a boy and his mom would wrap him in a quilt before bed and rock him in her big chair by the fire. He was quieter in those moments. The reality of walking in a snow-covered landscape was quite different. There were sounds all around him, and it seemed as if Idaho was one of the loudest landscapes he'd tromped through. Geese honked not far away. A wolf howled, miles off. He wasn't worried. Most animals weren't looking for trouble, and he was all sorts of trouble today. For four days he'd looked for clues in town after town, asking without asking outright. He had to be careful when he brought up a flying reindeer. Laughter was the first reaction. If he was lucky, there'd be a child nearby, so adults would put up with his inquiries, even winking now and again as if they were in cahoots. He didn't need cahoots, he needed help. His phone trilled and he shook off his leather glove. Pax's name came up on the caller ID, breathing hard, he answered for his younger brother with a quick low. Hey, I'm in the barn so I can talk. Forrest focused in, ready for the bad news. How are things at the North Pole? Will they have enough reindeer? We think so. Pax sounded stressed. I talked to Ginger this morning. She may call up Dunder, but we don't want the old guy on for the long haul if we don't have to use him. He's doing okay, though. Last year, Dunder had given them all a scare coming down with a flu that about took the reindeer to Starlet Pastures forever. Yeah. Caleb and Faith have him on a new supplement, he's acting five years younger and I'd up the ladies this fall. Though we don't know if he managed to woo any of them. Not for a lack of opportunity. We pen him off with a smaller group of females just to see what happened, and we're watching the ladies for signs of pregnancy. Forrest grinned. That wouldn't be so bad. They had a startling few flying reindeer out of the huge herd they watched over. Dunder was one of the best, a specimen of perfection. When a child fell asleep counting reindeer, they looked like Dunder. Maybe he'll start a new line for us. We can only hope. And pray. How are the others coming along? Pack sighed. The same. 
Rudy's as clumsy as you were at thirteen when we harness him with another reindeer. Forrest nodded. Rudy was born blind but could fly. The first two years of his life had been tough. He'd undergone a corrective surgery last Christmas and was able to fly in the open now. Of course, that could be part sparkle too, she flusters him. Well, now that he sees how pretty she is, he's probably intimidated. He doesn't do well with Dunder either. Same problem, different reason. Truth. Forrest felt the stress of his search melt away as he talked with his brother about the reindeer in training and regular things of life. He missed these moments. Speaking of all this, we have a new reindeer in the flyer's barn. Forrest perked up. Who? Glory. 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 Forrest worked to picture her. They had over 700 reindeer in the herd, and he'd been gone for a while now. Glory? She has the blonde halo. Oh yeah. He smiled, thinking of the angelic reindeer. How's she doing? She shows promise. At least her attitude is good. That's 90% of it. How about you? Forrest's mood shifted with the shift in conversation. I'm, you're so stupid, a child shouted a ways off. That's not Santa's sleigh. Is too, fired back a smaller voice. Nah, it's too small. I may have stumbled onto something. I'll call you later. He hung up as Pax said goodbye, his interest already penned on where the fight was shaping up. It's proof. Santa is real. No, it's not. You're lying. Forrest's snow boots made it sound like a horse was coming up on the clearing, and when he burst through the underbrush, he had an audience of five wide-eyed boys. The scene was laid out and easy to read. The smaller boy with the red face must have been the one who thought this was Santa's sleigh. The other four were a tad larger, and disbelief poured off of them like water off an icicle in March. Hey! He stared at the sleigh. It was a two-seater, three if the third person was small. The last time he'd seen this sleigh, Stella Kringle was flying away from the ranch on a quest to save Christmas. The very one that Snowflake had taken off with last Christmas Eve. The elation at finding the sleigh was immediately replaced by worry. The reins were empty, weathered, and cracked. Someone had to have unharnessed her, but who? Every eyewitness report of Snowflake included a sleigh. Either she'd been grounded, or she was. Well, she was grounded. You boys don't believe in Santa, he asked. Santa's for babies. The tallest boy folded his arms, and his coat made a slippery sound as his arms rubbed together. Forrest strode forward. You sure? He pointed to the carving on the back of the seat, a scrolling SC that he knew Clarence Kringle had carved himself. Of course, he was retired from being Santa and living in Mexico these days, but he could still carve. He watched the boys as they shifted their feet, glancing at the SC as if they weren't sure bravado would be enough to save them if Santa thought they didn't believe in him or her, as the case may be. Growing up with the Kringle family, it hadn't been strange to have Ginger take over as Santa a few years ago. But the rest of the world hadn't caught on to the change yet. Who knew where things would go from here? Christmas magic had a mind of its own, that was for sure. His eye went to the smallest boy, who hung back. He didn't need to look at the carving. Maybe he'd examined it long before he brought these others along. I have an idea. Forrest clapped his leather-clad hands together. You all could test your theory about Santa this year. How? demanded the kid with cheeks so chubby they hung over his scarf. Forrest pulled his phone out of his inner pocket. I'll just call up to the North Pole and have you tell Santa you think Christmas is for babies. He started to dial. I'll just need a few names to tell the head elf. The boys scattered. Forrest chuckled but stopped when he saw the smallest kid staring wide-eyed at him. They were soon alone, and he still hadn't fled. You have Santa's phone number? he asked. Forrest nodded. He spun around and took off at a sprint, well, as fast of a sprint as he could do in knee-high snow wearing moon boots. At the top of a small hill, he turned back, 
his eyes full of fear. Fear? Okay, so maybe he wasn't too keen on being tattled on. But there was more to that look than a kid who was worried about a PlayStation delivery on Christmas morning. He knew something about the sled, maybe even about Snowflake. Forrest could feel it all the way to his insulated socks. Forrest wasn't in the habit of chasing small children, so he glanced down, letting the boy go and noting the direction he ran. There'd be time to follow his tracks later. The sleigh was the important thing right now. He hurried to the front and tugged the leather straps out of the snow. One snapped in his hand. It had been too long and they were far too worn to tell if they'd been cut or if Snowflake had been helped free. The sleigh was in bad shape. The seat was out of square and one side was cracked all the way through. If he tried to fly this out today, they'd end up crashing into a tree. Still, the runners were in good shape. That was a relief. Finding wood, screws, and other tools was much easier than finding a place where he could heat and work metal. He smacked his hand against the side in triumph. He had the sled, now all he needed was the reindeer to fly it. He glanced at his watch. There was a band bee in town. It was time to clean up and make himself presentable. No one liked talking to the weirdo who crawled out of the woods, but they were happy to open up to the wholesome-looking guy under all this facial hair. Hopefully he was still there. Forrest hadn't seen him in a while. Chapter 4 Merry Christmas, Mitzi told Steve Morley as she shut the cash register. He tugged the five-gallon bucket of paint off the floor with a groan. It will be if I can get the living room painted. Otherwise, I'll be watching for Santa from the doghouse. Mitzi smiled at him. See ya. He was a go-getter, and his wife was expecting their third baby. Busy times. Happy times. Good family. She'd thought her ex was like Steve when they'd married. Turned out, he was only good at going to get things that benefited himself. She turned to the paint mixer and made sure she'd shut the door so she didn't slam her thigh into it every time she turned around. Her eyes darted to the clock, and she cringed. School had just let out. She hated that she wasn't there when Billy got home. She wanted to be the mom with a plate of fresh cookies and hot cocoa, ready to hear all about his math test or history report. That was one thing that had changed between them. He used to tell her everything that happened in his life. Not anymore. Sure, kids kept more inside as they grew older, dealt with the nuances of a classroom on their own. This was different, though, and it made her ache. The back door opened and a motion sensor triggered on a speaker, sending a ho-ho-ho through the air that announced Carla's arrival. She'd gone to the post office to pick up a delivery. Mitzi waited, wondering what Carla had invested in this time. Her boss was always on the lookout for a hot item that was irresistible to shoppers. Carla, wearing a store hoodie and a pair of jeans, rolled a heavily loaded trolley right up in front of the checkout counter. She flipped her white and gray shoulder-length hair off her face. Her gray eyes were tired and had bags that indicated she hadn't slept well in days. Not that she would tell Mitzi why. That woman was a fortress of feelings. What Cha got there, curiosity made her ask. The outside of the boxes didn't have one clue. Carla rolled her eyes. Dancing Santas. Isn't it a bit late in the season? She motioned to the bare seasonal shelves. They still had holiday lights, but they stocked those all year long, as families like to use them for birthday parties and such nowadays. The wreaths were sold, as were the other knickknacks. As a hardware store, they didn't have much room for decor items. However, they were the only store in town that carried things like sheet sets and shower curtains, so having seasonal items wasn't too strange. 
The order was delayed. Carla lifted her shoulders. They were supposed to be my retirement fund, pictured M selling like fruitcakes. Now she really had to see these Santas. She opened a drawer and pulled out a box knife, handing it to Carla. Carla shook a finger at her. Don't go knocking fruitcake until you try it. Mitzi chuckled. Not going to happen. I should sell my grandma's fruitcakes in the store. I'd make a million off of them if I made a dime. Carla set to work opening the first box. Mitzi went around the counter to help. You're always hustling. I'm exhausted just trying to keep up with you each day. I can't imagine what it's like in that brain of yours. It was Carla's turn to laugh. How's your boy? She changed the subject as quickly as she changed get-rich-quick ideas. I have the best kid on the planet. I'm inclined to agree with you. And that's why we're friends, Mitzi teased. Carla zipped the knife along the tape and set it on the counter. I think all moms think that. At least they should. Even stepmoms. She winked. Mitzi half smiled and avoided commenting on Carla's stepson. Ely's visit last night still irked her. His best personality trait was persistence, and even that wore on her as he continued to show up unannounced in the evenings. If she wasn't worried about how it would affect her job, she would tell him never to come back. Carla touched her arm. And how are you doing? I'm holding it together. She used to say she was fine, but Carla saw through that every time. It was easier to be honest with her friend and boss. The front door opened, bringing in a chill that felt as though it had blown all the way from the South Pole. It caused goosebumps to raise on Mitzi's arms. Welcome to the hardware shop, she said as she lifted her eyes to find her landlady, Luann, marching her way. She wore a powder blue power suit with wide legs and a huge button holding the jacket together. All this was under a cream-colored coat with navy buttons. Her blonde hair was pulled back into a low bun and held in place with what might have been wall gloss. Her thin lips and pointed nose were made more so by the thick blue liner around her eyes. I was holding it together, Mitzi mumbled at the sight of her. Setting down the dancing Santa figurine in a red velvet suit, she squared off with Luann. Maybe she wasn't here for Mitzi. Maybe she had some shopping to do. Perhaps she decided to fix the hole in the sheet rock in the bathroom or replace the missing tiles in the backsplash. That would be a happy Christmas surprise. Hello. Is there something I can help you find today? Luann stopped in front of her and folded her arms. Yes. Your rent check. So much for her optimistic attitude. Mitzi's cheeks heated up. Her eyes darted to Carla, who pretended to be interested in a Santa box. She didn't want her boss to think she was irresponsible with her money, nor did she want her friend to know she was drowning in bills. Carla provided a good job for her here, and she paid the going rate for retail. However, she was the kind of person who would think she'd failed Mitzi just because she couldn't do more. That wasn't fair to her. Mitzi did her best to keep her eyes on Luann and not look at Carla. I mailed it on the first. That was October's, and it was a month late. Mitzi forced herself to smile. This was just a setback. I had a car repair that cost more than I was planning on. I promise you're the first person I'll pay. But I'm afraid payday isn't until... Luann pointed to Carla. Ask for an advance. Carla huffed. The sound was like a bull gearing up to take on a matador. 
Mitzi held up her palm to keep Carla from letting into Luann. It was so unprofessional of the woman to come into her place of work and demand money. But then, no one ever accused Luann of being a professional in this arena. She was just a lady who had a house to rent. That's not fair to Carla. She's running a business. So am I. Luann pointed at herself. I have people asking about the house, it's highly desirable in this market, and they can pay on time. Are you kicking me out? Mitzi's heart seized with fear. She'd never find another house in this town. She could move, but what would she do with Snowflake and the rest of Billy's flock? It's Christmas. Where would they go? Her parents were out of the picture. She had no one. Have a heart, said Carla. She's got a kid. Luann wagged her head from side to side as if she were weighing her needs against Mitzi's. If you don't have at least half, she hedged. Half of her rent was an insurmountable amount at the moment. If she cleared everything out of her checking, she might have a fifth. Carla walked around the counter and opened the register. No, Mitzi reached out a hand to stop her. I can't let you do this. You can't let me. Carla raised one thickly penciled eyebrow. Darlin', you don't let me do anything. I am my own woman. But it's not your debt. It's mine, Mitzi argued. How was this her life? She used to have a nice house and a reliable car. And this is my choice. Stop thinking with your pride and start thinking of that boy of yours. Though it was a reprimand, it came from a place of understanding. Carla had been through some pretty tough times herself. Besides, I could use a blessing or two. Mitzi bit her cheek. She didn't for one second believe that she was doing Carla a favor by letting her pay half of last month's rent. As much as she hated it, she'd have to take the money if she was going to stay in her house. There wasn't another place in this small town to rent, except for a room at the Band B, which would end up costing more than rent. There was more to consider besides her and Billy. What would she do with the five geese, four ducks, three chickens, two cats, and a reindeer in the barn? Here's six hundred. Carla slapped the money on the counter. And I don't want to see you in my store until after Christmas. She pasted on her business smile. Unless it's to make a purchase. Then we'll be happy to assist you. Luann grabbed the money up like she worried that Carla would change her mind. If she's not caught up by Christmas Eve, then she's out. She hurried from the store before either woman could protest. Mitzi sagged against the counter. Carla growled. Maybe she'll trip headfirst into a headstone next week, the big Scrooge. Mitzi laughed in shock. How can you say such mean things when your heart is so big? Carla gave her a wicked grin. I've known Luann all my life. Trust me, she hasn't changed a bit since she smeared melted marshmallow in my hair. Mitzi made a face. Why do you think people like that succeed in life? She hasn't succeeded. Carla started arranging Santas once again. Oh sure, she's got some money and property, but she's alone, lonely, and lost. You and me, we're the success stories in life. Mitzi thought of Billy and the way he took in and cared for stray animals. His heart was as open as the sky. She might not have won in marriage, but she'd won the jackpot when it came to kids. I think you're right. They shared a smile. 
As they finished filling the empty shelves with hip-shaking St. Nick's Mitzi's feeling of success slipped away and she began to worry about where they'd live if Luann kicked them out on Christmas. Adding to her load was the fact that she didn't have a gift for her son to find under the tree. She'd planned to use her next paycheck and pray for a miracle. Now the miracle would have to come first. Trouble was, she'd used up her miracle allotment a long time ago. If only Santa were real. Then she wouldn't have to worry so much about Christmas morning. Chapter 5 Forrest strode into the Banby, his thoughts on the sled. He tromped across the floral rug, his boots clomping along. They were clean, but loud. His hiking backpack hung off one shoulder, and he had a bag of dirty laundry in his other hand. His coat was open, showing the camel pants and shirt underneath. He'd thrown on a cowboy hat before coming inside because he needed to brush it and didn't want to go back out once he'd gotten a room. He was really looking forward to a shower and bed. There was so much to be done. The seat needed to be pulled out, recovered, and fitted in place. The broken panel had to be braced or replaced. If he could get it out without damaging it more, then he could. The lady behind the counter looked up from her computer and squeaked. Merciful heavens! She clutched the sting of pearls around her neck. Forrest startled and looked behind him. He didn't see any mice, not even Christmas mice. You okay? He squinted at her. She seemed like a stable person. I'm fine, sir. She added the last word as if she wasn't sure he was a sir. He glanced down at his heavy clothing, stained and disheveled, and realized he might be a little more forest hermit than respectable customer at the moment. Running a palm over his cheek, he wondered how scary he looked. Good thing his family wasn't here to see him like this. They'd either tease him until the new year or throw him in a watering trough to clean up. I'm sorry to startle you. Might as well address the situation right away. I've been on a cross-country trip, camping out and such. But I'm in need of some civilization and a warm bed. She pressed her lips together. Do you have a job? He nodded. I'm a wrangler. My family owns a ranch in North Dakota. He pulled a card out of his wallet and handed it to her. The gold outline of a reindeer glinted as she turned the card on the light. A reindeer ranch, she questioned. He nodded. We have the only permit in North America to raise this herd. It's an honor to work with such a majestic animal. Have you ever seen a real reindeer? She nodded. Me and my husband took an Alaskan cruise. His eyes brightened. Ah. I know those reindeer. Ours are a little smaller and come in a variety of browns. Her lips twitched, and he knew he was getting through to her. Here. He pulled up some photos on his phone to show her. His mom sent him something almost every day. She was fantastic like that. Made him feel like he was still a part of things and knew what was going on back home, even though he was far away. This time of year, we have the school kids come for tours. He scrolled as she looked. My, but those kids are close to the animals. Forrest leaned over to look at the screen. That's apples. She's a sweetheart as long as there's a treat involved. Just don't get between her and feeding time. He chuckled, a fondness for the reindeer filling his chest. Man, he missed their antics. Captain and his high and mighty ways. Sugar, who was always looking for a chance to cause trouble. Sparkle's ability to make mischief and then pretend she was innocent. I wish I was with them all now. The woman frowned. How much longer is your trip? He shrugged. I'm not sure. I'm looking for something, and I can't go home until I find it. Her shoulders sagged. I had a boy like you. She turned to the keyboard and began typing. She mumbled, didn't know how good he had it until it was gone. Forrest didn't try to correct her. His trouble wasn't that he didn't know how good home was, it was that he did. Being away from the reindeer magic was slowly eating at him, changing him. 
all he had to do was look in the mirror behind the desk to see a stranger. How much longer could he search without losing himself in it? Room 203 is open. He handed over his credit card and waited. She click-clacked for a moment, her fake nails making extra clicks. Your card went through. Her excitement made him chuckle. He looked like a credit risk. It was definitely time to clean himself up. Breakfast is at 9. We'll turn the bed down at 8 if you're not in your room, otherwise it's up to you. My name is Mary, and if you need anything, dial 0 on the phone. He took the proffered key. It was gold and had a long neck. Old-fashioned, it suited the place. Don't bother tonight. I'll fall in bed and sleep till morning. She glanced at the clock. Well, if you're hungry in the middle of the night, I leave snacks on the desk here. He smiled. I might just take you up on that, Mary. See you in the morning. He shouldered his bag and headed to the wide staircase. The wood risers were beautiful and shiny. The banister gleamed. Mary cared about this place, like his family cared about the reindeer. His eyes grew heavy, but at least he could mark off one thing on his list, find a place to stay. Snowflake had to be close, and he was going to find her first thing tomorrow. Then he could head home and celebrate Christmas like a Nicholas should, surrounded by family. The next morning Forrest landed at the bottom of the staircase and threw his hands out to the side. How do I look? he asked Mary in a teasing voice. Mr. Nicholas? She gaped. Had she been a cartoon, he would have picked her jaw up off the floor for her with a snow shovel. He ran his hand down his face, feeling the freshly cut beard go smooth. One and the same. You clean up nicely. That's what my mother tells me. She chuckled. You miss breakfast, but the Belly Up Cafe is just next door. He rubbed his hollow stomach. Thanks. I'll head right on over. He'd fallen into the flannel sheets last night, visions of home dancing in his head and slept right on through to the next morning. The rest was just what he needed, but also a problem. He planned to check out today with Snowflake in tow. Now, he just hoped to have time to find her before the sun set. The sun gleamed off the snow, making him shade his eyes the moment he stepped onto the wide wraparound porch. The band B was situated on the end of First Street and decorated for the holidays with white lights all around a wreath on the door, and a sign out front that read Santa Stop Here. A wide, open lawn was broken up with several flower beds, which he could picture full of color come spring. His mom loved to garden too. She and Mary would get along. He set out on foot, happy to leave his truck parked in the gravel lot. The day was cold, and his breath puffed out around him. He tucked his chapped hands into his coat pockets. The sidewalks were wet and crunchy with blue ice melt. Across the street was a hardware store. He'd need to stop in there and see about supplies to fix the sled. Next to that was a drugstore and then a chiropractor's office and a dentist. A truck lumbered by, going about 12 miles per hour. Nothing seemed to move fast in this town. He came upon the cafe and noted the red and white awning. Two Christmas bells clanged against the glass door as it swung open. He paused, taking in the red vinyl booths and black and white checkered floor. The smell of fifty years of grease that had been attacked with industrial cleaner overnight hit his nose, followed quickly by the scent of freshly grilled bacon. This was the kind of place he could spend some time. He bellied up to the counter and ordered the big breakfast off the faded menu posted on the wall. The guy putting away dishes called the order through the open window, and another man in the back repeated it. It'll be a few minutes, said the dishwasher. You passing through or staying a while? Passing through. I'm looking for a reindeer. It was time to start putting the truth out there and seeing what he could reel in. A reindeer, barked the guy at the grill. He had to bend down to be seen through the window where he passed a large plate full of pancakes, bacon, and eggs. My family owns a ranch, and we had one wander off. These guys weren't going anywhere and he was starved, so he took time to butter his pancakes and pour a generous amount of syrup over everything, even the eggs. 
When he had several bites, he motioned to the orange juice and the dishwasher poured him a glass. He took a long drink. One of our herd may have wandered through here. They glanced at one another and shrugged. In that movement Forrest picked up the family resemblance. The younger guy must take after his mother in looks, though he moved like the cook. Have you heard anything? He took another drink, purposefully dropping his eyes to give them the impression he was embarrassed to say this out loud. The cook guffawed. Yeah, from every kid under the age of ten. Pop, come on. The dishwasher finished wiping a glass dry and stacked it with the others. No one said anything. And we hear just about every bit of gossip in town. I, a flash of red raised by the window, followed by a blur of other colors. Forrest turned to see what it was and caught sight of the kid from yesterday, the one who'd taken off by himself. There was a pack of boys running the same direction. He threw a twenty on the counter, called keep the change over his shoulder, and jogged after them. The pack peeled off at a house with a headless snowman out front. Forrest stopped to look around. There wasn't much at this end of town. The businesses, some of them in homes that had been converted to commercial use, ran right into the residential area. The boy with the red hat ran from one side of the street to the other. Hey, you! Forrest called after him. He looked back, saw Forrest, and then broke into a sprint. Forrest kicked a mailbox, sending the snow on top plopping onto his boot. You got a problem with my mailbox? asked a man holding a snow shovel. He was about Forrest's age and wore a yellow plaid thick flannel jacket while he cleared the driveway. No. Sorry. The man looked down the road, then back at Forrest. Did that kid take something of yours? What? No, at least I don't think so. It wasn't likely that the boy had Snowflake. If he did, every kid in town and their parents would know about it. A reindeer wasn't common in these parts, especially one as friendly and talented as Snowflake. What do you want with him? Forrest turned all his attention on the stranger. You two related? Could be an uncle, sort of. Me and his mom have a thing. Ah. Well, that was something. Maybe he had some answers. I'm Forrest Nicholas. I'm looking for a reindeer. He handed over his card. There's a reward for tips that help bring her home. How much? He asked, eyeing up Forrest's card as if he wasn't sure if he should hand it back or tuck it away. A thousand dollars, Forrest replied. Whoa! A thousand bucks, the guy yelled before lowering his voice. Do you need her alive? Yes! The look of greed in his dull gray eyes was enough to convince Forrest that he'd made a huge mistake. He reached for the card at the same time the guy tucked it in his shirt pocket. Candy canes! Let me know if you see or hear anything. Name's Ely. He grinned as he threw a shovel full of snow. I'm sure you'll be hearing from me. Finding your reindeer just became my number one priority. That's great. Forrest realized how flat the words came out and added a quick smile. Ely brightened with as much fake friendship as Forrest, and they parted ways. Forrest's stomach swam with unease. That guy was bad news, and he was after Snowflake. Darn it all, why had he mentioned the reward money? Forrest had to beat Ely to Snowflake, or who knew what he'd do to her? Chapter 6 it got dark real early in northern Idaho, so most afternoons Mitzi drove home with the headlights on. Tonight was no exception. She pulled down the bumpy dirty road, her body loose as it bounced around in the bucket seat. At this rate, she'd have to replace the shocks before Valentine's Day. Like there was money for car repairs. More than likely, she'd end up on foot. It was only a couple miles to the hardware store. Maybe she should save gas and start walking now. Her thoughts were interrupted by the startling image of a man trying to open her barn door. Her thoughts flew to Snowflake and Billy. They usually spent the afternoons and early evenings together. Whoever this guy was, 
he was up to no good. On instinct, she gunned the engine and headed right for him, determined to protect her family. The lights blinked as she went over bumps, creating a crazy, psychedelic effect on the barn wood. Ely flipped around and pressed his back against the door. His eyes were huge as her headlights barreled down on him. He threw his arms over his face and screamed a curse word that would have Jacob Marley shaking his chains. She laid on the horn and swerved in plenty of time to avoid hitting him or the barn. Stupid man. He shouldn't be out here if she wasn't home. Without bothering to turn off the car, she threw open the door and yelled, What do you think you're doing? Me? He fired back. You almost ran over me. I thought you were a creep. He was a creep. Who snuck around someone's barn on the edge of town when they weren't home? She'd had enough of his helping himself to her house, her time, and her attention. His eyes darted every which way but at her. I was looking for Billy. Why? she demanded, her tone steely. Her muscle coiled and she was ready to pound him to kingdom come. So help me, if you. Ely held up both his hands to ward her off. I was looking out for him. I swear. There was a stranger in town, chasing him down the street. I wanted to make sure he got home okay. A new fear sliced through her. Fear of an unknown threat. Who? I don't know. Ely stepped to the side. But Billy got away from him. Good. A need to see her son and see him right that second raced through her veins. Like the mother bear instinct that almost had her run over Ely a moment ago, this need fueled her. Billy, she yelled. Billy. Ely called. You can go. She pointed to his truck, the truck he'd parked in her spot on the driveway as if he owned the place. He scowled. That's a fine how do you do after I came all the way out here on a good deed. The nerve of this man was too much. Sure, she was glad he'd come out here to check on Billy while she was at work, and as soon as she calmed down, she'd want to thank him. But right now, she needed him gone. Not now, Ely. I'm too keyed up. She shook out her hands, which were quickly becoming ice in the cold night air. He nodded. You want to move your car? Just shut the door and go around. She pushed the barn door open and then slipped inside, closing it behind her. Mom. Billy grabbed her around the middle from behind. Billy. She swung around, loosening his arms, and then dropped to her knees where she could hug him properly. Oh, his small frame. His hair that smelled like crayons and winter. He was here. He was all right. He was here. What in the world is going on around here? Behind Billy, Snowflake stood tall, her ears following the sound of Ely's truck as it pulled down the road. Slowly pulled down the road. If he went any slower, he wouldn't be leaving. Snowflake sniffed and twitched her tail. She lowered her head as if she was ready to charge. Good thing Ely hadn't come in, he would have been gored by the reindeer, by the looks of things. The geese weren't all that happy either. They flapped their wings at the door and lifted their necks high. The ducks stood behind them like soldiers waiting for their orders. Mitzi reached out her arm and motioned for Snowflake to join their hug. She came over, setting her chin on Mitzi's shoulder and allowing her to put her arm over her neck and pat the other side with her palm. Thank you, Mitzi whispered. Even though Ely wasn't a threat, Snowflake would have protected Billy. Are you two okay? Billy nodded. 
I heard Ely pull up, but I didn't feel good about talking to him. He seemed angry or something. You did good following your feelings. She looked at Snowflake. Both of you. Snowflake nodded, and something passed between the two of them. There was no doubt that Snowflake loved Billy enough to fight for him. That was a gift Mitzi would be eternally grateful for. And it was the only thing she wanted for Christmas. Well, we're all safe and sound and hungry. Am I right? She tickled Billy's side, trying to lighten the mood and get things back to normal. Later, before bed, she'd cry out the rest of the emotions swirling around her, but her pillowcase would be the only witness to her breakdown. He giggled and danced away from her. M.O.M. She grinned. Everything was okay. Her heartbeat was almost back to normal, and Ely wouldn't bother her again, not after the chilly way she treated him tonight. She felt bad about being so mean, but it had to be done. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gotten the message. Let's wash up and you can bring an apple out to Snowflake. Really? She rarely let Billy give the reindeer treats. Yep, she earned it. She rubbed between Snowflake's antlers as she passed. The reindeer allowed the affection with a small huff. What were you guys doing in the barn anyway? She asked as they made their way outside. Her car was running, and the door was still open. Nice. Checkers, Billy replied. Mitzi laughed at the mental image. Who won? I'm up two games to one, but Snowflake thinks she's going to beat me this game. He put his hand on Snowflake's shoulder as they walked in. A different worry rose to the surface of Mitzi's mind. Billy needed human playmates. While Snowflake wasn't imaginary, and she certainly was a loyal pet, she wasn't helping Billy socialize with kids his age. If she wasn't so afraid someone would take Snowflake away, she'd let Billy tell everyone about his amazing animal. When she'd explained how the government kept a close watch on reindeer and only allowed certain people with permits to have them, he'd agreed to keep their secret. Now, she wasn't so sure it was a good idea to put one more wall between him and the kids his age. The weight of carrying these decisions on her own threatened to pull her under. She tried to shake it off, to think of brighter things. But the stack of bills that greeted her upon entering the kitchen wasn't all that cheery. Neither was the knowledge that she didn't have a tree to decorate nor presents to put under it. While she sliced an apple Billy dug into his backpack and pulled out several sheets of paper. Here's my assignments. He threw them on the table and then rushed over to get the apple. She let him out the back door, it could be tricky to manage when your hands were full, and then went to look through the pages on the table. The last sheet was a picture he'd drawn of Snowflake pulling a sleigh. Her mind started to spin with a wonderful Christmas idea. One that could save the holiday for both of them and wouldn't cost her an arm and a leg. The old, broken sled in the woods might still work. It was beat up, but she worked at a hardware store. Surely Carla could loan her some tools and they had a pile of leftover wood in the storeroom. As she imagined Billy's face on Christmas morning, her mood brightened considerably. If she could fix up the sleigh, one of Billy's wishes could come true. Oh my goodness! he'd be so excited. Her heart lifted as she attached the picture to the fridge with a magnet. She could do this. The one thing she had going for her was her ability to work and work hard. She'd fix the sled, they'd have a Christmas ride together, and it would be the best holiday yet. She started humming as she pulled out a pound of ground beef to brown for supper. She'd go get the sled on her morning off, right after Billy went to school, and hide it in the garage. 
neither of them went in there. The space was too small to park her car in any way. But the sled would fit just right. With a plan in place, she felt like things were looking up for their little family. Chapter 7 Two days, two days of pawing around town with Sid the mechanic, who hung out at the diner for breakfast, brunch, and then again at dinner, yielded nothing. The man was old and grisly and hated working on cars, but he got to the shop every day by eleven. He had a good beat on what was going on in town and hadn't heard a thing about a reindeer. Forrest walked from the diner to the town park. He had a to-go lunch tucked under his arm. One thing was sure, he was eating better now than he did on the trail. His pants, which had hung on him when he'd arrived, were already starting to fit better. His lonely stroll was interrupted by a little girl. She couldn't have been more than seven. Excuse me? Her eyes, as blue as a clear winter day in North Dakota, stared up at him. Do you really know Santa Claus? Word spread fast in this town. His questions about reindeer had combined with the boy's story of his threat to call Santa to see which list they were on, and now he was a local celebrity with the under-11 crowd. He grinned as he adjusted his chocolate-colored cowboy hat. He kept the hat tucked away in the camper, wearing his black one in the rain and weather, so it had a nice shape to it. I do. Glancing around, he saw her mother standing a few feet away, a proud smile on her face. No doubt the girl was being brave, asking the question that weighed heavily on her mind. She made a contact with her mom, who nodded encouragingly. How many reindeer does he have? Well, he pushed his hat back and scratched his forehead as if thinking really hard. Last I checked, he had seventeen. But not all of them can pull the big sleigh on Christmas Eve. That takes a specially trained reindeer. Her eyes grew even larger, as if he were handing over trade secrets. Which he was, it was only the adults that didn't know it. Part of my job is to train up the reindeer so they can work together. He shook his head dramatically. It's not always easy. He drew closer and whispered, Reindeer can be stubborn. My daddy's stubborn, she added. My mommy says so. Forrest laughed. The girl's mom rushed forward and put a hand on her shoulder. Come on, Emma. We need to get to the grocery store. Emma's face fell. But I wanted to hear about the stubborn reindeer. Forrest barely held back his chuckle as the mom gave him a reproachful look. He shrugged in response. It wasn't his fault her husband was stubborn. They bustled away. He watched for a moment, then noted the couple across the street whispering and glancing his way. He wasn't sure being popular was a good thing. His phone rang, and he answered for his dad. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. The old man boomed in his deep voice. The sound of it filled Forrest with a longing for home. Dad would have a fresh batch of pumpkin cinnamon rolls on the sideboard, just waiting for one of their hungry boys to wander through, didn't matter that the boys were all men now. Mom's Christmas scented candles filled the air with pine and cinnamon. And then there was the tree all decorated in red and white, with the ornaments they'd made growing up dotting the branches. How she managed to keep the Cheerio wreath together over the years was incredible. How's it going? asked Dad. Forrest set his lunch on a picnic table and sat down on the cold metal bench. Not great. I know she's here. But either nobody knows or she's been hidden away. Neither scenario helps me all that much. Think you'll be home for Christmas? I don't know, Dad. He hemmed. I thought so, but I can't make any guarantees. I wouldn't expect a promise out of you, not when you're in uncharted territory. Dad sighed. In that case, I think I'd better give you some news. Why am I suddenly wary? Dad chuckled. You don't have to be. It's good. The best news, really. Caleb and Faith are expecting. His heart lifted for his brother. The two of them had been married last year, but they were more than ready to start a family together. He's going to make a great father. I know. Dad's voice caught. 
You should see your mother. She cries just about every day. She's so happy. Forrest laughed. I'll bet. When do we get to meet the little wrangler? Before New Year's. Forrest surged to his feet. What? Two turtle doves startled at his outburst and took flight. He paced. How? I mean... Son. We wanted to tell you in person. But you've been gone so long, time's just slipped away from us. I had a talk with your brother, and we decided that it was better you knew than missed it altogether. If I don't find that reindeer, I'll miss it. He could quit the search, go home, and welcome his niece or nephew into the family. But that would mean Snowflake would be on her own out here in the world. How much longer could she stay under the radar and be safe? Not to mention if someone found a flying reindeer, they might come looking for others. And what better place to look than a reindeer ranch? No. He had to finish this, not only to protect Snowflake, but to protect his family and their way of life. Speaking of that, hey, I found Snowflake's sled. I think I can get it ready to fly. Do you think we could get a Kringle and spare reindeer to fly down from the North Pole? Unless Dunder is up to it. Dad was quiet for a minute. I'll call up North and see if anyone's available. One of the younger reindeer would be better. Frost is out, the male can't wait a single moment in December. Stella too, toys can't make themselves. What about Lux? The Kringle sister whose job was managing Christmas magic had a steady workload. Well, except for the year when she'd almost blown up the North Pole. Maybe, but she hates flying. Right. He'd forgotten that about her. She was always so even-tempered and smart, until she stepped into a sled. Then her stomach was all over the place and she panicked. I think Ginger's our best bet. Or her dad if he's up for a quick trip. Okay, just give me a couple days to get it ready. Will do. They said their goodbyes, and Forrest ate his sandwich as fast as he could. He had a sleigh to fix. Maybe Mary would let him park it in the barn behind the band B. She had a soft spot for him, comparing him to the sun that got away. Keeping his eyes peeled for Snowflake, he made his way out of town on foot and then into the woods. He took a jingle bell out of his pocket and let it swing as he walked. The sound should call the reindeer to him if she was close. An uncle. He was going to be an uncle. That was the biggest, best news he'd heard in a long time. For him, the desire to be a father one day was as natural as breathing. Family was important. Which should have made his decision to return home an easy one. But it wasn't. He had to protect the ranch, especially if there was a new generation of wranglers to look after. He hummed here comes Santa Claus as he turned toward the crash site. The closer he got, the more sound he heard. Of all the gingerbread men, he stopped short at the darn near swear spoken with the sweetest voice he'd ever heard. Inching closer, conscious of the snow crunching under his boots, he craned his neck to see a figure hunched over, tugging on a rope tied to his sleigh. He frowned. The woman grunted and groaned, and finally the sled began to move forward. Laughing at her success, she charged forward, drawing the sleigh with her. Forrest's first instinct was to call out to her to get her mittens off his sled. But his better judgment stepped in, and he waited. If she wanted the sled, she may have a reindeer to pull it. The only reindeer that could do that was his. He followed her at a distance. Her occasional unkind reference to gingerbread men made it easy to stay on her trail even when he lost sight of her. It wasn't long before they came upon a rundown single story house in the middle of nowhere. The roof had a crazy pitch to it, making him think the whole thing might fall over in a stiff breeze. The siding was weathered and peeled back in some areas. The small garage, which seemed to be the woman's destination with the sled, had an old fashioned door that lifted in one piece instead of rolled. Off to the east was a barn where a small flock of geese waddled in and out. He grinned. There was only one reason geese wouldn't fly south for the winter, and that was if they'd made friends with the reindeer. His dad said that it was a birds of a feather kind of thing, but whatever the reason, 
those geese were a dead giveaway that Snowflake was in that barn. He considered the gingerbread-hating woman and the sled. He'd gladly let her keep the sled if it meant getting his reindeer back and being home before Christmas. He noted the lack of lock on the barn door. Well, that would make things easier. He'd sneak back over after dark and get Snowflake. For the first time since this crazy journey had started, he felt hope. Chapter 8 Mitzi couldn't hold in her excitement. The sled was in the garage. Once she'd gotten it out of the ruts it had sat in for almost a year, it had slid across the snow like a hot knife through butter. Snowflake would be able to pull the sled without a problem, she was sure of it, even with her and Billy aboard. Christmas was looking up, and so were her spirits. She'd hidden the sleigh in the garage, under a large blue tarp that Carla loaned her just for this purpose. When Mitzi confided her plans, Carla went into elf mode and handed over tools, wood, paint, and even fabric for the seat. Billy was at the church, practicing for the nativity scene. The preacher here did things a little differently. Instead of holding a pageant on Christmas Eve, everyone in town set up their creche in the church and the children provided a live nativity on certain days of the week. Billy was a wise man tonight, although he pointed out that his companions were technically wise women, because they were girls, and he was excited to play his part. She'd gone over after work to take pictures and wave at him. He was so sweet in his bathrobe and crown, trying hard to look like he had a long journey to the manger in Jerusalem by wiping his forehead every so often. So. Adorable. Since she had some time, she planned to measure the sleigh and start a cut list. Once she had an idea what she was up against, she'd be able to work out a schedule to get it all done by Christmas Eve. Her veins thrummed with the excitement. It had been a long time since she'd looked forward to Christmas this much. She turned on her Elvis Presley Christmas playlist and hummed along with the king. A song finished up, and she quickly became aware of another sound. Geese. Several of them, honking mad. They were better than guard dogs. The sound meant someone was in her barnyard. Carla was bringing Billy home, and her truck lights would have flashed across the kitchen. Whoever was there, they were not a planned guest. Ely. Did he know about Snowflake? Or was he just trying to cause trouble for her because she'd told him off? No way. She'd been married to one bully, and she wasn't about to let another one think he had a foothold in her life. Working her way out the garage door, she kept a low profile as she tried to figure out what to do. She could call the cops, but it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here, and that was with sirens wailing. 25 minutes was more likely. 25 minutes was an eternity, especially because she didn't want anyone to know she harbored an illegal reindeer in her barn. A shadowy figure sneaked along the side of the building toward the door. Her heart stopped. It wasn't Ely. This guy had broad shoulders and a thick trunk. He wore winter camo and a cowboy hat. She'd never seen Ely wear either. Her heartbeat broke into a dead run, and something inside of her honked to life, sounding an awful lot like a mad goose. Some women had a mother bear instinct, she must have a mother goose one. Rum balls. She was on her own. So be it. She'd been a single mother for almost two years now, what was one reindeer napper? Picking up the tire iron, she hurried across the icy driveway, grateful for the slippery stuff because it was quieter than snow. The man didn't see her. He was intent on finding the lever to open the door. The moon was hidden behind a thick layer of clouds. If Mitzi hadn't known her own yard well enough, she wouldn't be able to make out his shape. 
Hey! She yelled not far from him, hoping to startle him into running away. The man jumped and spun on her. She screamed, startled by the bearded face of a stranger. Acting out of self-preservation, she swung the tire iron, all the while screaming like a banshee. Whoa! Lady! The man raised his arm to protect himself, and the feeling of iron against bone made her sick to her stomach. As fast as she'd hit him, his other arm was around her, pinning her against his solid body. Let go, she ground out, wiggling and kicking for all she was worth. Lady. I'm no lady. She managed to get some traction and wiggle out of his one-armed hold. He gasped and stepped back, holding his other arm out and staring at it like it had betrayed him. Who are you? she demanded. She lifted her weapon, ready to strike again. What are you doing here? I came for my reindeer, what did you hit me with? He tried to turn his hand over and winced. What did you say? she asked again. Your reindeer. Oh shoot. Oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot. I think you broke my arm. He looked at her, really looked at her for the first time. His gaze was steady in the half moonlight. The shape of his brow and his blue eyes were familiar. They tugged at her memory, looking for something to hold on to. Mitzi. His eyes glazed over and he went down on one knee. Mitzi lowered the iron bar. He said her name like, like he knew her. But that was impossible. She didn't know anyone who looked like this guy, all rugged and handsome. Not that she was in the habit of noticing a man. It was just that this guy was striking even in the dark. Who are you? His face winced in the way a man does when he's in more pain than he wants to let on. He pulled his hurt arm to his chest. Is there an Instacare in town? She shook her head to clear it. As she did, the realization that she'd injured a man on her property, attacked him, really, possibly breaking his arm, washed over her. A man who knew her name. A man who claimed Snowflake was his reindeer. Oh man. What was she doing running around here like she was Rambo? She dropped the metal, and the sound clanged across the yard. Fruitcake. Yes. I'll just, I'll drive you. She said the last bit as a question, wondering if she'd lost her mind. Was she really offering to help the man who was sneaking around her property? Why hadn't he come to the door? He squeezed his eyes shut tight and took a deep breath. They could figure that out later. She leaned over, placing a hand on his large shoulder. Can you walk? Give me a second. I can't believe how much this hurts. He sucked air in through his teeth, held his breath, and then nodded his head, all without breathing. She went to help him up, but he gave her the stink eye, so she backed off. He managed to get to his feet by using the barn for support. She ran ahead to open the passenger door to her car. Once it was open, she ran in the house to get the keys and then came back out. He'd settled himself in the car and shut the door. Okay, he was a tough guy. She jumped in and cranked the engine. Please start. Please start. Please start, she prayed under her breath, as she did every time she turned the key. The car fired up, almost as if it was telling her she was being too dramatic. The man, who knew her name, laid his head back and threw his unbroken arm across his face. Mitzi navigated the potholes in the road to minimize the jostle. So, do you have a name? He didn't move. She'd killed him. Her eyes went to his chest to make sure he was still breathing. 
Are you alive? Yeah. They sat in silence for a moment. Name? She prompted as nicely as she could. I'm not sure I want to tell you. She scowled. Why not? You attacked me with a tire iron. He threw the words out like knives. Indignation fired inside. Obviously, she felt bad about it, or she wouldn't be driving him to get help. I wouldn't have done that if you weren't breaking into my barn. What would you do if you were in my situation? He lowered his arm and studied in her what little light there was on First Street. He sighed. I'd probably want to hit them with a tire iron. She felt oddly validated. And then the shame of her actions flooded her. I'm so sorry. Please believe that I don't usually go around hitting people. I know. He shifted carefully. She eyed him warily. Exactly how long had he been watching her? Was he some stalker who'd picked up her picture on social media? Or had her ex sent him to find out if she had money? If so, the joke was on him. How? Because you were always a sweet kid. Her eyebrows pulled together. He chuckled. You don't remember me, do you? Should I? I'd like to think I left an impression. He had a smidgen of satisfaction and a smudge of overconfidence that was adorably handsome. If this wasn't the strangest thing that had ever happened to her, she might think he was cute. He turned his head to the side, offering his profile. Look close. She did her best to scrutinize him in the Christmas lights that brushed through the windows. Sorry. I got nothing. He sighed. Forrest Nicholas. She slammed on the brakes, throwing them both forward. His good arm reached out to stop him from flying into the dashboard. What the peanut butter fudge, he snapped. Forrest Nicholas, she asked in disbelief. At the very name, she was taken back to her elementary school years where the little boy with cornflower blue eyes painted her hair brown in art class and left a melted candy bar that looked like poo in her desk. Forrest Nicholas, she repeated. He grunted, tugging on the seatbelt that no doubt yanked his body, causing pain. The one and only. Her stomach soured. Candy cane poop, she cursed. Forrest might actually have a claim on Snowflake. One thing she remembered about the Nicholas family was that they were very protective of their reindeer herd. Protective enough to send someone several states away to track one down and bring it home. They had a whole herd of reindeer, surely they could spare one. Especially one who was so important to a certain little boy. Noting how close they were to the Instacare, she got the car moving. Just like the tires rolling along, memories of Forrest rolled over the top of her thoughts. Of all the reindeer wranglers in all of North Dakota, why did he have to be the one to end up in her small Idaho town? Didn't he have, like, twelve brothers or something? She grunted at one particularly unpleasant memory. What? He prodded. His voice was soft enough, but she was getting riled up. Forrest Nicholas. What right did he have to walk into, no, try and break into her life once again? She'd left him behind when her mom was restationed, and he should have stayed in the past. Nothing, she spat. Sounds like it, he said sarcastically. His tone grated on her nerves as another memory came to the forefront of her mind. It was Christmas, and they were making wreaths out of Cheerios. He snuck from her pile and ate her art supplies. Her wreath looked horrible. She'd been too embarrassed to even show the teacher and took an F on the project. You owe me an apology. He scoffed. 
I don't think so. Really? She whipped her head to glare at him and was painfully aware of her messy bun wiggling around. Darn it all. Why couldn't she run into him when she was all dolled up and stunning? That would have shown him a thing or two. So you don't remember ruining my history project? His eyes widened. Or painting my hair in art class. Or overwatering my bean sprout so it died. Or sitting on my white elephant gift and smashing it. She pulled into a parking spot and stopped, yanking the keys out of the ignition. Pointing in his face, she hurled her last memory, or kissing me on the school bus. She felt the color slide out of her face as she realized what she'd just said. She threw open her door, ready to storm in and demand someone take this rascally wrangler off her hands. I'm sorry. She froze, not sure she'd heard him right. Unable to turn around and see if he was sincere, she waited to see if he'd say anything else. You were the cutest girl in class. I wanted you to notice me. I was such a dumb kid. She gritted her teeth to keep from firing back that she'd noticed and it wasn't good. But then she thought about Billy, about how awkward he was around Kelsey Ann. He had no idea what he was doing with girls, and Forrest probably hadn't either. The tight muscles in her neck loosened and she twisted to look over her shoulder at him. Their eyes met in the dim light, met and held as a connection formed between them, one of years gone by and time spent together as children. All that history became laced with a new awareness of one another as adults. They both tipped their heads as they took in the changes. Forrest had laugh lines around his eyes. His skin was weathered and thick, like a man's. His shoulders were broad and full of muscles. His facial hair was straight and thick, coming in several shades of brown. And that hat. Even as a kid, he'd always had a cowboy hat on his head, no matter the season. His eyes traced her face, doing the same calculations of time and change that she'd done. She wondered what he thought of the curves that had sprouted after pregnancy and the worry wrinkle in her forehead that had grown during her divorce. Deciding that she might not want to know what he thought about all that, she jumped out of the car and went around to help him out. Forrest was already on his feet when she got there. He held on to the top of the open car door, his knuckles white. She moved closer, placing a hand on his stomach to brace him as he walked. When he didn't take a step, she looked up and found him gazing at her. I'm sorry about everything, Mitzi. She nodded, the words it was a long time ago on the tip of her tongue. They'd been children, just learning everything from compound fractions to classroom dynamics. Everything but the kiss, he added. She froze in place, not sure she'd heard him right. Also, her belly did this thing that it hadn't done before. The sensation was scarily pleasant. He leaned closer and spoke deep. I remember the kiss. She rolled her eyes, trying to cover up the way her body responded to being so close to him with sarcasm. Yeah, I had game in the fourth grade. He chuckled. About as much as I did. She liked the way his laughter rumbled through him, like a train on the tracks, making its way lazily along without a care in the world. It made her feel like time slowed down. Like she didn't have to push or fight for everything in life. Like she could just be. Forrest Nicholas. She smiled softly. I can't believe you're here. And that I have my hand on your incredibly flat stomach. Chapter 9 Forrest laid in the hospital bed staring up at the speckled ceiling and willing it to tell him the answers to all the big questions in life. Also, he told it not to tell him what made the water stain in the corner. 
that was disturbing enough without an explanation. But Mitzi Edge? There was a mystery he'd like to solve. She'd moved into Sleigh Bell County in the second grade. All that red hair, sheesh. What was a guy to do but trip over himself? And he'd done it again tonight. What was I thinking? He groaned and threw his good arm over his face. I can't believe I said that about the kiss. Talking to yourself is a bad sign. The doctor walked in, a big smile on her face. Mr. Nicholas. He dropped his arm, pushing himself up on the bed as best he could. Why did they make them with tissue paper sheets? So annoying. I'm doubting my sanity, so if you can fix that while I'm here, I'd be much obliged. Dr. Manhattan smiled fondly, as if she was looking at her grandson. You said you were accidentally hit with a tire iron? He nodded. If Mitzi had known it was him skulking around her property, she wouldn't have attacked him, he hoped. After what he'd put her through as a kid, he wouldn't blame her if she'd hit him anyway. The first day he'd seen her, probably her first day of school, he'd been gobsmacked. That was the only word he could come up with to explain how his mind had scrambled and he felt like he was on a flying sleigh for the first time, his stomach dropping out. Even as a kid, he'd known better than to make fun of her hair. He'd been a real gentleman and painted it blue in art class. She hadn't noticed at first, and all he could see was the contrast between the blue paint and her red hair. Incredible. When she had noticed, she'd looked like she wanted to cut a hole in his Christmas stocking. But she'd looked at him. Noticed him. Learned his name. For him, the game was afoot. He'd never thought about what his pranks were doing to her. He had been so clueless. Dr. Manhattan slid an x-ray slide onto the light board and flipped it on. There, in black and white, was Forrest's forearm. If you look closely, you'll see a hairline fracture right there. He ran his pen, cap on, over the line. Forrest had to squint to make it out. Mitzi had broken his arm. There was no way he could tell his brothers about this. They'd never let him live down his stupidity, both for trying to break into a barn and for getting beaten up in the process. Falling out of a flying sleigh wasn't even a good excuse for a broken bone around their place, because they should all know how to hang on by now. He should have known better. But he was looking for the easy out. Like his dad always said, do it right the first time so you don't have to go back and do it again. Well, he'd have a heck of a time getting Snowflake home now. She was hard to handle on a good day. Only one of Santa's daughters even attempted it, and Stella Kringle was the best flyer in the family, not to mention the craziest. I'm going to put you in a brace, not a cast. But I don't want you to use it for three weeks. Three weeks? That's December 23rd. He couldn't wait three weeks to use his arm. Snowflake was a fast flyer, inexperienced, and strong. He need both arms just to keep them from crashing into a mountain. Three weeks and you should be 100%. But not a moment before, or you risk cracking it more and possibly even breaking the bone completely. Forrest flopped back on the pillow. Don't worry. Dr. Manhattan headed for the door. It will fly by. She left, and Forrest let out a groan. The nurse came in and fitted him with a brace, and then he was on his way down the hall, wondering if Idaho had Ubers and how he was going to get to his truck. His arm throbbed, and he let it hang limp in a sling across his chest. He could feel his pulse around the brake, and it wasn't a good feeling. When he got to the lobby, he came up short at the sight of Mitzi curled up in a chair, her head bobbing forward and the bun on the top of her head tipping at a crazy angle. She looked so peaceful, so unlike the stressed-out woman who brought him in. Time had done wonderful things for Mitzi. Her cheeks weren't as chubby, and the smattering of freckles across her nose had thickened. He liked that look, freckles were interesting, and he could stare at them for hours. Her lips were a shade lighter than the freckles and full. And that hair! As a kid, it had been bright orange, but it had mellowed into this deep rust color that made her one of a kind in his book. She must have felt him watching her, because she slowly opened her eyes and took him in. He smiled and wiggled his fingers on his good hand. 
Sorry to wake you. He glanced at the clock on the wall and grimaced. It was well past midnight. Mitzi dragged herself to her feet and yawned. Are you all good? She pointed to his arm. He shook his head. Hairline fracture. I'll be fine. Her eyes widened and she came fully awake. I broke you. He chuckled. More like cracked me. But I'll be fine in a couple weeks. Really? He checked himself. This was a strange moment for him, feeling bad about making the woman who attacked him with a tire iron feel bad. His life had made a loop-de-loop. -loop. Mitzi frowned. Come on. He followed her out to her car, and they climbed in. The temperatures had dropped, and it took a moment for the car to start up. Then it took a moment longer for the heater to blow warmish air. We should have brought my truck. His teeth chattered. She shrugged. We can get it in the morning. The morning? I promised the nurse I wouldn't leave you alone tonight. But? She held up a hand. It's late. I'm tired. Someone else tucked my son in tonight. If we could not argue, that'd be great. He bit back every reason she should drop him off at the Banby and leaned back in the cold seat. Fine. But won't your husband be upset about me coming over tonight? Her grip on the wheel tightened. My ex doesn't care what I do. They pulled onto the bumpy dirt road that led to her house. She sighed. However, my boss cares. She cares a lot and will ask so many questions. Especially if she sees me bring you home. So, he prompted her. So do you mind ducking down and staying out of sight until she leaves? Not at all. Protecting her reputation was the least he could do. And if she insisted he sleep over, he wasn't going to complain, because it got him all that closer to Snowflake. Although he wasn't sure what he'd do with her when he found her. It wasn't like they could fly home tomorrow. The night finally caught up to him, and his body sagged with exhaustion. There had to be a way to get Snowflake home before Christmas. If they couldn't fly, then they'd drive. Either way, they'd be in North Dakota before Santa checked the list twice. Chapter 10 Mitzi slept surprisingly well, considering there was a strange man in the house. She woke up the next morning with a start and a hefty dose of self-reclamation. What was she thinking, bringing Forrest home with her last night? She didn't know the man. He could be a serial killer or a weirdo who wanted to try on her shoes while she slept. Okay, that was far-fetched, but she'd watched while you were sleeping a couple nights ago and Joe Jr. was such a great character, a little off, but all he wanted was someone to love. She rubbed her eyes. She'd been alone too long if she was considering Joe Jr. a catch. She brushed her teeth and took an extra moment to arrange the messy bun on her head so it looked messy on purpose instead of an afterthought. She was standing there, contemplating her eyeliner, when she decided she was not primping for Forrest Nicholas. Tossing the tube on the counter in disgust, she tromped into the kitchen. Billy's alarm had gone off a few minutes before, and she heard the bathroom door shut behind her. Good. She wouldn't have to rouse him this morning. The kid slept like an elf the day after Christmas. Oh, to be young again. She glanced through the cupboards, hoping a food fairy had come through the night before and left a bunch of groceries in the fridge, but it was bare as ever. Oatmeal it is. She added cinnamon and brown sugar to the pan, as well as a dash of vanilla. Truly, the cheap flavoring was the only way to make oatmeal palatable. She could do many things out of necessity, but eating oatmeal every day tested even her limits. On the bright side, she had great blood pressure and no cholesterol. She made the mistake of glancing in the front room, where she'd covered an exhausted wrangler with an afghan last night. Forrest was sprawled out taking up every inch of the couch and hanging off the edge. 
one long leg kicked out from the blanket. He wore thick, wool Christmas socks, which was adorable in a manly way. He tucked his boots near the bottom of the couch and hung his coat on the hook. At least he was tidy. Darn it all if that wasn't as attractive as the way his chest moved up and down, drawing deep breaths. She missed hearing someone breathe beside her at night. There hadn't been many tender moments between her and her ex-husband, but in the beginning there'd been some good times. Little footsteps thundered down the hallway, alerting her to Billy's presence a full ten seconds before he blurred through the kitchen. I gotta let snow. She clamped a hand over his mouth and put a finger over her own. Then she took that finger and pointed it at the couch. Billy's eyebrows lowered. He pushed her hand away from his mouth. What's he doing here? You know him. She pulled his shoulders, holding him close to her. I've seen him in the woods. He asked about reindeers. What's he want? She pressed her lips. He wants his reindeer back. Billy threw her arms off and ran out the back door. She heaved a sigh. As she'd sat in the hard chair in the waiting room last night, she'd come to the conclusion that Snowflake must have escaped the reindeer ranch and made her way to Idaho. It was far-fetched, there were hundreds if not thousands of miles between them. Yet she'd stumbled into their lives, hurt and afraid, and stolen their hearts in the process. There wasn't much to be done about it, except return the reindeer and then pick up the pieces of Billy's heart. She grabbed her coat and hurried to the barn, where she found Billy huddled in the back of Snowflake's stall, his arms around her neck. Big, chocolate-drop-sized tears graced his cheeks before landing on her fur. Snowflake looked up as Mitzi entered the stall. What's wrong? She asked with a look. Mitzi's throat closed off with emotion. It's okay, she told the reindeer. I'll talk to him for a minute. Snowflake nuzzled Billy and then stepped back, making her way to the stall entrance. She lifted a brow as she passed, telling Mitzi she'd be here if she needed backup. Mitzi patted her side in response. Billy. She opened her arms, and he threw himself against her middle. It's not fair. He lost her. That means he didn't take care of her. We do, he yelled into her coat. I know. I know. But he came all this way to get her. So he must care about her. Mitzi ran her hand down the back of his hair. How much longer would he let her do things like that? Time was slipping away from her. Besides, he has a whole ranch full of reindeer. What if Snowflake has a family? Billy sniffed but otherwise remained silent. Snowflake's ears perked up and twitched. Mitzi watched in amazement as her eyes grew large and she surged out of the stall, making a noise that could only be called joyful. She and Billy followed her out into the breezeway where Forrest stood, his arms open. Snowflake, he yelled in happy surprise. Snowflake bounded over, nuzzling her head and neck all the way around the man several times over. Forrest's laughter boomed through the rafters. Watch those antlers, girl. He turned to move his splinted arm out of the way for her to continue her excited show. She backed up and then butted him in the side with her nose. I know. I know but it took me a while to find you. He rubbed her neck and her face. Then he pushed her chin away and danced to the side. Snowflake chortled and danced after him. The two frolicked. Mitzi shouldn't have been moved by the scene in front of her, but there was something about the way Forrest transformed when he was around the playful reindeer that had sugarplum fairies dancing through her stomach. 
He was boyish, free, and yet all manly shoulders, facial hair, and strong legs. The delight on his face was like a boy on Christmas morning, a stark contrast to the man she'd caught breaking into her barn and the patient she'd helped into the house the night before. This guy, this was two parts the forest of her childhood and one part the man of her dreams, a dangerous combination if ever there was one. Billy looked up at her, and Mitzi looked down at him to gauge his reaction. Snowflake never acted like that, at least not around her. She leaned over to whisper in Billy's ear. It looks like they know each other. Billy nodded and swiped his nose with the back of his hand. His eyes were deep green wells of misery and pain. Mitzi held her breath, her heart breaking for her son. Snowflake was his best and only friend here in Idaho. The boys from his old school had stopped video chatting with him months ago. She understood, for a kid, proximity was the motivating factor in friendship, and Billy just wasn't close enough to stay on their minds. Their lives went on without him. He should have too, except it hadn't. Forrest. She said his name before her thoughts had gathered. Motivated by the emotions roiling inside her son, and feeling them all inside herself as well, she knew she had to take action. Can I speak to you outside? Forrest rubbed Snowflake's snowflake. Stay out of trouble, you. She snorted, basically challenging him to make her. He laughed and wagged a finger her direction before following Mitzi out of the barn. Once they were a safe distance from the aged wooden structure, she turned to face him. His playful nature was put away as he adopted his adult face and stance. The glint in his eyes said he'd be up for playing any time, but there was also a business side to him. Goodness, she spent much too much time contemplating this man. She needed to put more brain power into figuring out how to save her son's heart. Clearly, Snowflake came from your ranch. He went to fold his one arm over the other and thought better of the idea, shoving his hand into his pocket. I've been looking for her for almost a year. Mitzi nodded. Billy found her last Christmas. She was in bad shape. Her leg was broken. Forrest let out a gust of air as he turned to go back to the barn. Mitzi grabbed his elbow, on his good arm, to keep him from charging in to check on her. We splinted it and took care of her. Forrest eyed her from the side. You did. He seemed to consider his words carefully. Did Snowflake do anything out of the ordinary? Mitzi thought back. She let Billy harness her easy enough. There were a couple of days she just wanted to sleep. She huffed a laugh. And she broke into the house to eat oats, but other than that, she's a pretty normal reindeer. Except I swear she can talk to me. We have full conversations. Oh, and she's my kid's best friend. She added all the last mentally. We want to keep her forest. She held her breath, praying he would agree. Forrest began shaking his head. Mitzi reached for him again but thought better of it. She's happy here. Billy takes her out every day, and they tromp through the woods together. She has food and shelter. What more could a reindeer ask for? Forrest scowled. It can't happen. Why not? Her tone was demanding, indignant. Forrest's eyes turned navy blue. For one, there's the permits. We hold the only one in the U.S., and we're pretty much grandfathered in. I'll apply. Secondly, he cut her off, you're in violation of at least seven statutes and three laws by keeping her here and treating her injury yourselves. Her mouth dropped open and she snapped her teeth shut. 
she would have died if not for us. Forrest held up both his hands. I'm not complaining, just educating. She viciously unzipped her coat to let some cold air in. She was burning with righteous indignation. I don't need your education, she spat at him. We've done fine up till now without it. He shrugged as if saying so you think or for an amateur. I wonder what would happen to your permits if people knew you'd lost one of your reindeer. His eyes widened slightly and his jaw flexed. She couldn't believe she'd thrown that at him. What happened to the woman who sat on the third pew and called out Amen? At the end of every sermon, Forrest brought out all sorts of feelings, lots and lots of feelings, and she had a hard time being level-headed. Not to mention he was being stubborn. You're in no position to issue threats. He lifted his braced arm as evidence of her misdeeds. Are you going to have a single mother hauled off for defending her property? Because I could have you taken in for breaking and entering. To get my reindeer, he fired back at her. Like that's an excuse. He threw up his hand. You can't keep her. Mitzi folded her arms. Watch me. He glared and then spun on a heel and took off for the barn. His retreat was so fast and so unexpected that she had to mentally tell her feet to follow him. When she finally got the message from her brain all the way down to her toes, he was already halfway there and she had to run to catch up. Forrest made it inside first. Snowflake. Mitzi skidded in and stopped, breathing hard enough that her breath floated around her. Snowflake and Billy had set up a checkerboard on top of a barrel. They turned to watch the two of them storm into the barn. Stop, she said. It's time to go. Forrest pointed at the ground. Billy threw his hands over his mouth. What are you going to do, ride her from Idaho to North Dakota? Don't tempt me. Forrest moved forward two steps. I mean it, Snowflake. Christmas is in three weeks. We have work to do. Snowflake looked at him with longing. For a moment Mitzi thought she was hungry for the promise of Christmas, whatever that meant to a reindeer. Then the animal stood up, pranced around the barrel, and plopped her chin on Billy's shoulder. She was defying orders. Mitzi could have kissed her. Forrest rolled his eyes. It's great that you have a friend, Forrest conceded. We can come back and visit, after Christmas. Snowflake lifted her tail and twitched her ears. She raised up to her full height and trotted into the stall. Billy's grin was so big he could catch snowballs with it. She doesn't want to go with you. Snowflake. Forrest asked. Mitzi folded her arms. Looks like she wants to stay. He gave her a no dull look that made her want to throw a snowball at his face. She's not the one in charge here. He strode forward, his long legs chewing up the distance in a matter of seconds. Snagging the lead rope off the peg, he approached Snowflake. Listen, there are Christmas things to consider here. Snowflake put her nose down, chastened. For a moment Mitzi thought she would change her mind, but when Forrest moved forward with the lead rope, she snapped out of it and backed up. Shaking her head from side to side, she used her antlers to keep Forrest from getting too close. After three tries and a near miss to his broken arm, he growled in frustration. You're going on the naughty list. Snowflake recoiled in horror. Her legs trembled and she stumbled to the side as if he'd struck her. What did you do? Mitzi surged forward. Billy was faster than she was. He threw his arms around Snowflake's neck and spoke soothingly. 
You're okay, Snowflake. You promised to stay with me, and you're doing that. Santa won't be mad. I'll write him. I'll tell him what a good reindeer you are. He softly stroked her chest as he spoke. Forrest stared. Mitzi brushed past him to stand on the other side of Snowflake. Me too. She stood with the reindeer and cast a withering look at Forrest. Forrest pointed from Snowflake to Billy. She promised to stay with you. He couldn't have sounded more shocked if Saint Nick himself stood there in his long johns. Billy nodded. She did. She promised. She's doing what she said, and that means she's good. Forrest rubbed his beard. Something shifted in him. Something that moved the tide of argument in their favor, though Mitzi was at a loss as to what that was exactly. She still didn't have permits and whatnot, but it seemed a reindeer's promise meant something to Forrest. Weird. Good, but weird. Hmm. That may complicate things. Can I have a minute alone with Snowflake, please? No. Billy yelled. Mitzi glared. So you can sneak her out the back. What back? Forrest waved his hand around, indicating the barn and the solid three walls. Mitzi rolled her eyes at herself for being so dramatic. It was just, I don't trust you. His jaw clenched. You're welcome to lock me in here with her if it will make you feel better. Fair enough. It was his reindeer, after all. She moved around Snowflake, who was nudging Billy's shoulder in a show of comfort. Bending down, she spoke quietly. This was Billy's decision to make. Hey, what do you say? Billy sniffed. We'll wait right outside, and as soon as he's done, you can come back in, okay? Why can't I just stay? Billy asked. Mitzi raised an eyebrow at Forrest. The burden of proof or evidence or whatever was on him. Forrest lifted a shoulder. I gotta have a conversation with her, bud. Just her and me. You know how that is. Billy nodded, as if he knew exactly how that was. Mitzi thought about the few times she'd unburdened herself on Snowflake. The reindeer was full of wisdom, which was also weird to think, but there was no other explanation for how she always seemed to understand. So talking to a reindeer wasn't just a thing for her and Billy. Okay then. She placed a hand on Billy's shoulder and steered him out of the stall, through the barn, and into the yard. She turned and shut the door behind them, then leaned against it. Billy did the same giving her a conspiratorial smile. Is he going to take Snowflake? I don't know. It's complicated. I hope not. She put one arm over his shoulder, and he leaned into her. But remember, no matter what, I'm always going to be here, okay? You and me are stuck together forever. He nodded, his heart right there in the tears on his face. How could Forrest not see that these two were meant to be together? And what would she do if he took her reindeer away? Come on. If we don't hurry, you'll be late for school. But he's, Billy started. He's not going anywhere. Mitzi was pretty sure Forrest wouldn't try and take off with Snowflake without at least giving her some warning. If he tries, I'll see him out the window. She pointed to the window over the kitchen sink. They headed inside, their shoulders heavy with Snowflake's unknown fate looming. Chapter 11 Forrest waited until he heard Mitzi and Billy walk away from the barn door. No sense causing them any alarm by talking about flying reindeer. Hey, girl. He motioned for Snowflake to come out of the stall. 
the little scamp. She flicked her tail into the air and sashayed past him. He snorted. Who do you think you are? Sparkle? Offended, Snowflake lowered her brow and glared, making Forrest laugh. Sparkle was the resident princess in the flyer's barn back home. She was stunningly beautiful and knew it all the way to the tips of her shiny black hooves. She was also not Santaslay worthy, which was part of the reason he was keen to bring Snowflake back to North Dakota. Want to play a little reindeer game? Snowflake's tail wagged back and forth, and her eyes brightened. He glanced around. His barn back home had all the toys. Here, he'd have to make do. Spying an old frisbee in the corner, he snatched it up. That'd work. Holding it up, he waved it around. Are you ready? He threw it straight up in the air without waiting for an answer. A moment later, he had to jump out of the way to avoid being hit as it came back down. Snowflake? Don't you remember how to play? He jogged over to the frisbee and picked it up. You gotta catch it. He positioned himself in the middle of the barn where the ceiling was the tallest and threw again. This time, he watched the frisbee instead of the reindeer and was ready to catch it when it came down. Snowflake pawed at the ground. What gives? She lifted her gaze to meet his. I gave up flying, she seemed to say. Gave it up? He checked his volume. What do you mean, gave it up? Why? She stared at the door where Mitzi and Billy had gone out. For him? You gave up flying for Billy? She nodded. He threw the frisbee back into the corner. So what? You're not going to fly for Santa? You're going to give up your dream to be one of the top eight reindeer in the world? She stared back, unblinking. Do you know how many reindeer would kill to have what you have? She lowered her nose to the ground. Snowflake. He walked forward and tugged on her harness to get her to look at him. Why are you doing this? He needs me. So do millions of children around the world. She didn't respond. And just because you don't fly doesn't mean you can stay here. There are laws. Rules we have to follow, or the ranch could be shut down. She blinked. He let out a sigh. I'm calling Dad. She nodded. I expected as much. He stepped a few feet away, and she wandered back into her stall. Not that the space gave him all that much privacy, but at least it created the illusion of privacy. He sighed heavily and pulled his phone out. His arm throbbed and his head throbbed, and he wouldn't mind curling up in the corner stall and taking a long winter's nap but he had to press on. He'd been looking for Snowflake for too long to give up on reuniting her with the herd. Not to mention they needed her. Santa needed her. The phone rang five times before his dad picked up. Merry Christmas. Let's hope you still think that in ten minutes. Forrest? Yeah, Dad. Would his parents never understand caller ID? It wasn't even new technology. He pinched the bridge of his nose and did his best to rein in his frustrations. What's happened? The good news is, I found Snowflake. Dad let out a hearty boom of laughter. I knew you could do it. The words sank over him, making him feel ten feet tall. Even as an adult, he thrived under his father's praise. It was a sign that Dad had done something right in raising them that Forrest still considered the man his hero. Thanks. But it's not all good news. Oh? He gave Dad a rundown of the situation, leaving out the part about his busted arm. She won't fly at all? Not even tempted. Forrest glared at the frisbee, wishing he'd held onto it so he could throw it now. And on top of that, they want to keep her. Dad was silent for a moment. I don't see how that's possible. Me neither. He frowned. Mitzi might come around. She understands there's regulations for endangered animals. Sounds like a smart lady. She's brave too. He looked down at his sling. Few women would go out in the dark of night to protect a reindeer. Not that he'd told Dad any of that. 
If he had to drive home with a sling on, so be it. But he wasn't about to tell his hero he tried to reindeer nap Snowflake. Oh? The note of interest in Dad's voice set off a warning. And stubborn and a little on the crazy side, he added quickly. Just the way you like him, Dad said, chuckling. Ah. Forrest hurried on. Her son is the real reason Snowflake won't fly. They bonded. A reindeer bond is a serious thing. I know. That was one of the reasons the Kringle girls had come to stay at their ranch every summer growing up. At the time, no one had known who the next Santa would be, so all five girls spent time in North Dakota with the herd. A Santa reindeer was loyal to him or her and would give everything they had on the long Christmas flight. Lux had a special bond with Dunder, one of the older and more seasoned reindeer. And Stella charmed every furry friend. Of course, Stella could charm just about anyone, so no one really thought much about it. Ginger, on the other hand, was a natural with the animals. Based on that, he should have figured her for the next Santa, even if the whole family assumed it would be Robin. But all that was another story for another time. We'll be praying for you. It's possible God has a bigger picture in mind than what you and I can see. I'm pretty sure he always sees more than I do. Dad chuckled. Well, if that's the case, open your eyes. Forrest laughed. As if it were just that easy. I'll do my best. You always do. Forrest blew out a breath. He checked Snowflake's feed. There wasn't much, and it was the generic stuff. He'd need to pick up some premium grain and feed at the local farmer's supply. Snowflake didn't look like she'd skipped meals, but she needed nutrients if she was going to get her hooves under her. He wasn't giving up hope that she'd one day fly with Santa. To do that, she'd have to be in peak physical and mental shape. He left the barn and made his way over to the house. Mitzi was at the sink, washing dishes and watching him through the window. He pointed to the door, asking if he could come in. She nodded. He pulled the metal screen door open with a squeal of protest and then pushed the thin wood door in. What cumbersome way to get into a house. Both Billy and Mitzi watched him as he struggled to take off his coat and hang it on the hook. This conversation might take a minute. I talked to Snowflake, she wants to stay. Yay! Billy threw his arms in the air. To his relief, neither of them questioned the fact that he just said he had a conversation with a reindeer. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as just saying yes. Billy bit his bottom lip. The kid was as dedicated to Snowflake as she was to him. Kind of reminded Forrest of himself at that age. He'd loved the reindeer, still did. Lucky for him, he was born into the Nicholas family and guaranteed a place on Reindeer Ranch. Before he could work up enough sympathy to switch sides in this argument, he focused on Mitzi. That was a mistake. Her large green eyes were rimmed with tears she fought to hold back. The red contrasted beautifully with the Christmas green that he found himself caught in them. Forrest's gut ached to ease her pain, even though he was the one causing it. He pushed on, wanting to rip off the band-aid and get this over with. Dad agrees we have to follow the rules on this one but we have some time. Maybe we can figure out a solution that would benefit everyone. So she's not leaving? Billy asked. Not yet. Forrest hated that his answer wasn't good enough. But there wasn't anything he could do about it. A reindeer belonged with her herd. Besides, Mitzi didn't have the resources to take care of Snowflake like they did. Her open cupboards were practically bare, and when she turned from him to put the milk away, he found that the fridge was just as empty. His dad's words came crashing back, a bigger picture. A timer went off on Mitzi's phone, and the two of them mobilized in chaotic effort to get Billy out the door in time for school. He blurred past Forrest, not saying goodbye, and made the door squeal on his way out. When he was down the steps and on the path Mitzi turned to Forrest. Hugging herself, she seemed to be in a state of resignation. Do you want some breakfast? And take food out of a kid's mouth? No way. No thank you. I don't usually eat breakfast. His stomach growled, giving away his lie. 
Mitzi eyed him and then picked up a couple papers that had fallen out of Billy's backpack. I can drive you to your truck on my way into work. Forrest found himself curious about Mitzi and her life here in Idaho. Where do you work? The hardware shop. She dropped all the papers in the garbage. That's his mind spun. He'd plan on going there today to get supplies for the sleigh. What if he'd gone there first? What if they'd bumped into one another without all this between them? He hated that he'd never know the answer to those questions. A bigger picture, the words echoed through his mind, and he tried to see things from another point of view. She needed money. He had money. What he didn't have was two working arms. She had arms. The sleigh that was already parked in Mitzi's garage. An idea was slowly forming. Do you build things? He asked before he had a handle on the plan. I do. She patted the farm table Billy sat at. Forrest looked it over. It wasn't fancy, but it was well done, with joints that lined up properly and a fine stained job. Yeah, this might just work. I'm not sure how to say this, just spit it out. She wrung out a washcloth and began wiping down counters. I don't have the time, energy, nor patience for beating around the bush. He smiled to himself. That was another trait he looked for in a woman, direct. Not that he was looking for a woman. Darn dad for putting thoughts in his head. I know you have our sleigh in your garage. Her shoulders slumped and she dropped her head. Sorry about that. I, I was going to fix it up for Billy for Christmas. He nodded. Smart thinking on her part. At least you didn't put the sled before the reindeer. A smile ghosted over her lips and was followed by an awkward pause. Anyway, he cleared his throat. You're right in that it needs repairs. Since I'm not currently able to work power tools, he pointed to his throbbing arm, which was getting worse by the minute. He really needed to take something. I'll happily pay you to do them. She stopped. Different emotions flitted across her face. Mistrust. Interest. Relief. Deal. She held out her hand for him to shake. He took her hand and a buzz went up his arm. It felt like one of those massage chairs, except instead of lulling him into relaxation, it jolted him alert. We can start tonight. Perfect. He nodded, feeling like he was on the right track. Wait, we? Yeah. It's your sleigh. If you're not around, I might just paint it pink. He shuddered dramatically. I'll be here. She smiled, a real, honest-to-goodness smile with teeth and everything that turned his brain to mush. Maybe he didn't have the whole picture, but he'd gotten a glimpse of things around here, and perhaps he was supposed to do more than just find Snowflake. Maybe he was supposed to help this small family have a Merry Christmas. If there was one thing a Nicholas could do, it was marry up the holidays. Chapter 12 Jingle bells, jingle bells, sang the dancing Santas as Mitzi walked by. They'd sold four of the forty-five on the shelf. She wanted to turn off their motion sensors and stop the madness, but Carla thought they'd sell better if people saw them swinging their hips from side to side. Movement draws the eye, she'd insisted. And causes a headache, Mitzi muttered under her breath. She worked around the shelf, doing all she could not to pass in front of the little bearded guys. The noise level was bad enough when customers came through, and if they brought kids. She might as well have bought stock in the aspirin company. So what was the big emergency last night? Carla asked. She wore a bright red sweater with a white reindeer outline on it. As far as Christmas sweaters went, it was pretty tame, especially for Carla. The woman would dress in tinsel if she could. I, ah. Uh, Mitzi scrambled to come up with a way to tell the truth without telling all of it. She wasn't sure how she felt about Forrest staying overnight. At the time, it had seemed like the right thing to do. He'd needed care and observation. 
but in the bright light of day, she realized how it might look to people in town. I had to help an injured man. Who? Carla's eyes were down as she counted paintbrushes. He's new in town. He, ah, uh, his arm was cracked. I took him to the Instacare. Carla's head came up. You're a real-life good Samaritan. It would have been a good deed, if she wasn't the one who'd broken him in the first place. No. I was just doing what needed to be done. She hurried away, her stomach twisting. Her ex was full of lies, and she despised them. Maybe that was why she hadn't allowed a man close to her heart in two years. Maybe she didn't trust men in general. Except, she'd let one sleep in her house last night. And the crazy thing about that. She'd slept too. She hadn't stayed up fretting over what he was doing, if he was going through her purse or sneaking out to do who knows what. Granted, she didn't have a claim on Forrest, so she wouldn't have a reason to trust him with her heart. What if it had been another man? What if it was Ely? A shiver ran over her. Nope. Ely would never have been allowed over the threshold, no matter how broken or bruised. Okay, maybe if he was injured beyond the point of putting the moves on her. With Ely, she always felt like he was one second away from pressing his advantage. She didn't feel that way with Forrest. With him, she felt safe. Which was strange, because he didn't like her all that much. Maybe that was the reason she didn't mind him being around. If he wasn't trying to worm his way into her heart, then he wasn't a threat. She frowned. Something wasn't right about that logic. As she unloaded boxes of PVC fittings, she mulled over the problem to try and figure out what she didn't like about the idea of Forrest not trying to kiss her. The bell over the door rang, and the Santas started up their offbeat song. She sighed and headed to the front to see if she could be of service to their new customer. Turning the corner, she caught Forrest standing in front of the dancing Santas, a bright, happy grin on his face. He was moving his good arm in the air and shaking his behind in a perfect imitation of the horrible mechanical gyrations. And boy, did he make that look good. Her heart raced, thumping in her ears and drowning out jingle bells. Her body flushed with awareness and her eyes dropped to his wiggling backside. Carla appeared next to her. Told you movement drew the eye. She winked and gave Mitzi a shove. Blushing furiously, thank you, fair skin and freckles, Mitzi stumbled forward two steps. He hey. Um. Her brain was a blank. Forrest looked over his shoulder, caught sight of her, dropped his arm, and spun around. These guys are great. I gotta have one. He reached for a Santa wearing a cowboy hat. You know what? Make that too. Mom will love this. Mitzi opened her mouth and then shut it again. Was he for real? This big tough wrangler, wearing a chocolate-colored cowboy hat, worn jeans, and a heavy coat, was buying a present for his mom. Be still her rapidly beating heart, was there anything sweeter on the planet? Forrest's forehead wrinkled. Is everything okay? She hugged herself, feeling silly. I was just hoping that Billy cares about me like that when he grows up. Forrest smiled easily. He will. You're a great mom. She stared at him. What? He wiped at his face as if he had crumbs on his beard. I just, how do you say stuff like that? Like what? Like you're a good mom. I just say it. She shook her head. My ex, he, she dropped the conversation. 
Her ex believed that giving a compliment cost him. He never handed them out without expecting something in return. Never mind. Forrest reached out and stopped her from turning away from him. His eyes were serious and his jaw firm in a way that made those sugar plums start twirling in her stomach. I don't know what happened with him, I don't even know his name, but I know that you deserve better. How? she whispered. He searched her face. Because you pack a punch. He tickled her funny bone, but not enough to reward him for being corny. She slipped out of his hand. You're so funny. I mean it. You're very disarming. She chuckled but kept her face turned so he couldn't see the smile tugging at her lips. Hey, I'm just calling it like I feel it. She snorted. Their eyes caught and held for a moment. She had that same feeling that she'd had the night before, the one where her stomach did scary, wonderful things. They stayed there for what felt like only a minute but made an impression for eternity before Forrest seemed to come out of a trance and realize where he was, or who he was. He was a Nicholas. Born into a life of privilege and expectations. Not that she knew what those expectations were for him, other than being a part of the ranch. Still, she could see all that in his expression. Needing a breather, she looked around for her boss. Carla was always good at jumping in, but she was nowhere to be seen. Either she'd been called to the back for a delivery, or she ducked out to give Mitzi and Forrest a moment alone. The second option was fairly mortifying in that it implied Carla believed Mitzi was interested in Forrest. She wasn't. Well, beyond watching him shake his groove thing. Will there be anything else for you? Forrest set the Santas on the counter. I need supplies for the sleigh. She flapped a hand. I already have everything. You do. She nodded, feeling proud of herself. It's in the garage. He rubbed his beard. How much do I owe you? She shook her head. It was scraps and leftovers, seconds and mismixed paint. I didn't buy any of it. He frowned. But it cost gas at least. Let me pay for that. She shook her head again. I was driving to and from work anyway. She motioned to the store. Don't worry about it. Okay. He took her measure. She hoped he understood that she wasn't in this to bilk him for all he was worth. Part of her felt so very blessed that she was getting paid to fix up a sled she'd planned to fix anyway. Sure, with the sleigh out of the picture, she'd need a gift or two for under the tree, not to mention a tree, but with the money Forrest planned to pay her, she'd have enough. Plus, she didn't want him to pity her. She didn't want to be his charity case. She wanted him to see her as capable and strong. And she didn't want to think about why. He wrapped his knuckles on the counter. Well, all righty then. I guess it's just the groovy Santas. Groovy. She quickly scanned the tags and rang him up. Weird that he'd picked the same word she did, groove, groovy. Had she said it out loud? Or were they just on the same page? He cocked a grin at her. Yeah, groovy is the right word. You sound pretty confident there, Wrangler. His eyes softened a tad. Wrangler. She hit the finish transaction button and then ripped his receipt from the machine. It's what you are, isn't it? A reindeer wrangler, if I remember correctly. He breathed in deeply. Yes, ma'am. He continued to look her over. Your hair's real pretty. Her hand flew to the top knot. 
I barely had a second to do it this morning. He picked up his bag. Doesn't matter. When you're beautiful, you don't have to try hard. He winked and then walked out of the store, leaving her with a rowdy round of jingle bells and a state of befuddlement. I like him. Carla's voice startled Mitzi, and she jumped. Don't sneak up on me. I didn't. Carla's grin was infectious. You were lost in your thoughts. She lifted an arm and shook her hips side to side like Forrest had earlier. Can't say that I blame you. Mitzi laughed. The door swung open and Ely sauntered in. How's my ladies this blustery day? Mitzi's laughter died in her throat, choking her. She refused to answer because she wasn't one of his ladies and would never be. However, Ely was Carla's stepson and she doted on him. Mitzi had to tread carefully because, as a mother, she knew that bond was thicker than loyalty to an employee or even a friend. We're doing fantastic. Carla waved her hand in front of a dancing Santa. He started singing, and she started wiggling. Come on, Ely, dance with me. He looked at her like she'd gone nuts. You've been drinking. Carla laughed and swatted at him. You Scrooge. I'm dry as a bone and you know it. Do you have time to work on that window? The draft is killing my heating bill. Can't you put some of that shrink wrap stuff over it for a while? I'm busy with my own home repairs. I'll make do. You do what you need to do. She patted his shoulder fondly and headed back to the paints, where she grabbed a box off the floor and started hanging the brushes on the hooks. Ely shrugged and made his way to the plumbing aisle. Mitzi busied herself at the counter, spraying the glass top and wiping away the fingerprints that accumulated faster than snow on the open fields. He came back through and waved the part he'd chosen at her. I'm taking this. She nodded. He never paid for a thing in the store. Carla was fine with it, but it irked Mitzi that he never made time to help Carla. She'd do anything for him, but it didn't go both ways. Isn't it almost your lunchtime? asked Ely. She glanced at the clock. I still have a half hour. He threw a look over his shoulder. I bet I can convince Carla to let you off early, you know, if we were going out to lunch. Mitzi gritted her teeth and forced a smile. Thanks, but I'm saving up for Christmas and need the hours. He nodded. You're smart with money. I like that in a woman. She held the smile in place with sheer willpower. When he'd gone, she forced her shoulders to relax. As soon as a new female moved in, Ely would forget all about her. She just had to wait him out. In the meantime, she made a mental tick list for the sleigh and pictured Forrest hanging out in her garage. Not that she was looking for a relationship or even a date. But he was funny, and laughter was in short supply in her life. Pretty soon, she was humming along with those Santas. Chapter 13 Forrest threw the grocery bags in his passenger seat and slammed a door. He was taking a mighty big risk. Mitzi was a prideful woman in the best way. She was strong and independent. She didn't need or want his help with anything, not even paying for supplies to fix his sleigh. Still, he couldn't stand by and watch her and Billy go without, not when he could do something about it. Now, how was he going to get all this in her fridge? His phone rang, and he answered it as he walked around to the driver's side and climbed in. He wasn't up for running much. If he did, his arm would throb something fierce, and he'd like to avoid that if at all possible. Hey, Caleb, he greeted his older brother. What's going on? Dad said Faith and I needed to talk to you about Snowflake. Forrest nodded quickly. 
Caleb was married to Faith, who was a veterinarian specializing in large animals. And as of their courtship last Christmas, that specializing went one step further and landed right on reindeer. She was enthralled with the herd and would hopefully help them breed more flying reindeer. Hi, Faith chirped. You're on speakerphone in the truck. Where are you guys headed? Forrest closed his eyes, picturing home. We're going back to the house. Faith just had a checkup. His eyes popped open. He had no desire to picture that. How'd it go? Is little Forrest healthy? Faith laughed. What makes you think we're naming him after you? I'm his favorite uncle, that's what. He started the truck and pulled out onto the main road, pointing his grill towards Mitzi's place. Caleb joined in the laughter. You're too much. Forrest smiled. When he'd left home, he thought he'd be glad to be away from his brothers and their endless teasing and whatnot. Instead, he missed at something fierce. Let me know when he gets here. I think Caleb will shout it from the rooftops, said Faith. With flying reindeer, it was a real possibility that Caleb would get up there to tell the world his son was born. Stay off the roof, Forrest warned. Don't worry. I'm grounded for a while. There's more than just me to think about these days. The sound of a soft kiss came over the line. Forrest could see Caleb kissing Faith's hand as he drove. It was a picture-perfect image with her other hand on her round belly. Part of him wanted that, wanted it bad. Why did you call again? He asked to change the subject and push away the yearning for home and hearth. Tell us what happened with Snowflake last year, Faith prodded. Then we can come up with some ideas on how to get her flying. Forrest filled them in on the basics. He wasn't even sure of all the details, but he knew enough to share. Sometimes when an animal goes through trauma, they shut off the behavior that led up to that experience, Faith said. What do you mean? Forrest turned onto the pothole dirt road and gritted his teeth. The sling held his arm against his chest for stability, but it didn't do much good if his whole body bounced around. Well, Snowflake took off on her own with a sleigh and ended up hurt. I'm assuming it was somehow her fault. So she's scared to fly again, Faith explained. Flying may cause some PTSD. Can that happen in a reindeer? Caleb asked. It happens in a lot of animals. Dogs that come back from war will often have nightmares and become aggressive in situations that remind them of a dangerous or harmful experience. She paused for a moment. Are there predators in the area? Wolves, Forrest ground out, his arms screaming at him. She may have been hurt and afraid for her life. That explains why she's so loyal to Billy. He found her and brought her to his house. Forrest slowed the truck and swung the wheel wide to avoid the nastiest of divots. What do I do about it? I'd suggest helping her feel safe with flying again, said Faith. You could start with basic training, some of the stuff we did when she was young, offered Caleb. Forrest chewed his lip. Whatever training exercises he did would have to be gentle. His arm couldn't handle Snowflake on a lead rope. I can do that. He pulled up to the house and put the truck in park. I've gotta go. I'm here now. Good luck, both Caleb and Faith called. And Merry Christmas. He smiled at how in sync they were. Merry Christmas. He clicked off the call and slid out of the truck. Making his way to the other side, he carefully grabbed the handles to the plastic bags with one hand. Mitzi was in the window. There always seemed to be dishes for her to wash. He wished he could have bought her a dishwasher, or at least helped out. Even one-handed, he could scrub a plate, maybe. But she'd probably roast him with a look for trying. Snowflake came bounding out of the tree line with Billy right behind her. She wore a red towel around her neck like a superhero and Billy had a green one. The image was so nostalgic that for a second, he thought he'd gone back in time and tripped into one of his younger brothers. Off to save the world? he asked. Billy nodded. We have five minutes before the bomb goes off. Snowflake snorted, telling him the imaginary bad guys would never succeed on her watch. 
He grinned and held out his arm. Don't stand there, go get him. They sprang into action, bolting for the barn where the bad guys were hiding. Forrest chuckled. Man, he missed those days. Knocking lightly on the door with his fist full of grocery bags, he glanced up at Mitzi. She opened the wood door. Hurry up, you're letting all the cold air in, she admonished him. I'm a one-armed man and there's two doors, he complained, but with a note in his voice that told her he was teasing. She smiled. You seem to be doing all right for a one-armed man. She noted the bags he carried and moved some of Billy's coloring sheets to the side of the table so he could set them down. He did, and then he promptly grabbed several and headed for the fridge. His hands started to sweat with worry. This was the gamble part of his visit, and he could soon be back on the road, bouncing his way down the path. He unloaded several items without looking at her. She appeared at his side, close enough that he could smell the pine candle that burned at the hardware store and something clean and fresh. Her shampoo? What's this? she asked. Reindeer food. He held up an apple and then put it on the shelf in the fridge. His mom always kept their apples in there so they bit into a cold piece of fruit in the summer. Maybe he should leave them on the counter. It wasn't like it was hot outside. There's some celery, lettuce, broccoli, and more, but he wasn't going to continue to list the items. She could go through herself after her left. I have a few bags of oats and hay pellets in the truck. I'll get those to the barn. He shoved himself deeper into the fridge so he wouldn't have to smell her anymore. She was tempting. And this is all for Snowflake? she asked from somewhere behind him. Yep. He finished filling the bins. The fridge was half the size of the one on the ranch. And it was old, 1965 if it was a day. A horrible avocado green color that had only gotten worse with age. They just didn't make em like they used to, he mused. Chicken fried steak? Mitzi held up the package she'd pulled out of a bag on the counter. Her eyebrow arched in disbelief. Forrest didn't have to work too hard to muster up some chagrin. Well, see, I've been camping for almost a year, and you have this really nice kitchen space. I was hoping I could make a dinner or two here while we worked. She snorted. Nice try. Nice kitchen space? It's old and worn out and you know it. No. More like worn in. Think of how many kids have come to this fridge for an after-school glass of milk. He tugged on the handle and pointed to the half-gallon he'd stowed. He would bring a gallon next time if she let this slide, but he'd figured that he'd have better luck getting a smaller one in on the first try. My guess would be over a thousand. That thing has been around since Fred Flintstone. Forrest grinned, and not because he was getting away with filling up her fridge in half a cupboard, but because she was cute when she wasn't worried. He took the package of steaks from her. There were four, which meant she could take one to work for lunch tomorrow. So do you have a pan for this, or should I start a fire in the yard and find a stick to roast it with? She rolled her eyes. I'd like to see that. But since you only have one arm, you can use my oven. Thanks. This time, the smile was for the win. His chest warmed knowing he'd taken care of a meal for Mitzi and Billy. He liked that feeling of being a provider. It felt like, well, like what he was meant to do. On top of that Mitzi was in a good mood. She had an easy way about her and about having him there that he enjoyed. He tried to open the package with one hand and ended up fumbling it. It landed on the yellow linoleum with a thud. Mitzi laughed. You're one-armed in all thumbs. He chuckled and shrugged. A little help? She sighed, a long-suffering sound. Men! He grinned. I'll put the potatoes on. He managed to wash them and get them in a pan that Mitzi handed him without being asked. I like mine with the peels on. We're in Idaho. I think we have to eat the whole potato, she replied. Is that a thing here? She shrugged. Sounds like an Idaho thing to do. I grew up all over, so I'm not really sure. He filled the pot with water and then set it on the stove. 
Why'd you move so much? My mom was military. We went where she was stationed. Where are your folks now? He wondered if they knew the conditions Mitzi and Billy lived in and if they tried to help. We aren't on speaking terms. Oh. His brain failed to come up with an appropriate response. My ex was, well, he managed to turn my parents against us shortly before Billy was born. I sided with him because that's what I thought a good wife would do. I haven't heard from them in years. Forrest ached for her. Your mom made cupcakes and ice cream cones for your birthday in the fifth grade. Mitzi's eyes brightened. How did you remember that? He smiled wide. They had so much frosting. How could I forget? She chuckled. When she was home, she was all about being mom. Her gaze traveled to the window and beyond, where Billy and Snowflake played. They darted from tree to tree, sneaking up on someone only they could see. After a moment, she broke out of her thoughts. Brushing her palms together, she said, Looks like everything is on autopilot for a bit. Do you want to check out the sleigh? He waved a hand for her to precede him. After you. They went halfway down the short hallway and opened the door to the garage. This part of the house must have been an addition sometime along the way. There was a step down to the garage that felt out of place with the rest of the layout. Mitzi flipped on the light. The space was chillier than the house, but with the door down, it wasn't as cold as outside. At least he couldn't see his breath in here. That would help, as his arm was sensitive to the cold. Darn cracked bones soaked it up like a sponge. A giant blue tarp covered the sleigh. Mitzi began to pull it aside, and it caught on the seat. He grabbed one corner and lifted, and together they managed to get it all the way off. The seat was out of square, like it had taken a hard hit when Snowflake landed. That was the most concerning. The other parts could be managed, but he'd need a place to plan his behind if he had any hope of controlling Snowflake in the air. You wanted this for Billy? He ran his hand along the once velvety bench. The fabric had gone stale and hard from sitting out in all four seasons. It doesn't matter. Mitzi moved to a work table where she had tools, paint, and other supplies laid out. It does, he insisted. She sighed. No. It's obviously yours, and I'm not a thief. She pointed to the logo on the back of the sleigh. I actually can't believe I didn't think of the reindeer ranch when I saw this. You'd have to stand behind the sleigh to see it, but it was their plain as day. Besides, I've moved on from that idea already. So let's get this thing done so I can get paid. She waved a measuring tape at him. Deal. If she needed the funds for Christmas gifts, then he'd gladly pay her up front. However, he'd already pressed his luck stocking her kitchen and didn't want to push for more now. Speaking of getting the sleigh done, Caleb thought it would be a good idea to give Snowflake a workout or two, just to see how well her legs healed. Oh? Yeah. I'll need to take her into the forest. He made eye contact and then quickly looked away. I wanted to let you know so you didn't think I'd run off with her or something. I appreciate that. She smiled softly. They were in this odd place with the reindeer. They both knew Snowflake belonged to him, but he let them keep her, for now. He didn't know how long that would last, and frankly he was scared to ask. Not knowing was better than facing the ugly truth that one day he'd have to tear this family apart. Not only would Mitzi and Billy be hurt, but Snowflake would be too. They measured the side of the sleigh that was cracked. Do you think we could reinforce it, or do we need a whole new panel? He asked. She had quite a few tools, but not a planer or a router. I think if we brace it from both sides, it'll hold it. At least until you get it home and one of your brothers can work on it. Which one was it who liked building things? She wrote numbers down while she talked. Pax, he replied. It wasn't surprising that she remembered Pax liked to build. He was only three years younger than them, and he'd entered every contest in town that had to do with woodworking by the time he was ten. He did the finished work on Caleb's house. They sent pictures, and it's incredible. 
He found them on his phone and showed her. She let out a low whistle. Due to his skills. Forrest bobbed his head. It was on the tip of his tongue to invite her to the ranch, to catch up with everyone, see how the place had grown, and meet a few of the non-flying reindeer, when headlights flashed against the wall. Mitzi bit her lip and looked guiltily at him. What was that about? A truck door slammed, and then the big garage door lifted. There was no automatic garage door opener on this old house. The garage flooded with frigid air, and his muscles tightened in response. The man from the street, the one who'd said he had a thing going with Billy's mom, stood there. What's going on? Forrest's stomach sank. He'd forgotten about this guy. Mitzi hadn't said a word about her boyfriend and, shoot, here he was making dinner for another man's girlfriend. Or almost girlfriend. Maybe they weren't completely serious, but that didn't mean he could step in and act like he belonged. He had more respect for Mitzi than to mess things up for her. I hired Mitzi to fix my sleigh, he offered by way of explanation. Then he lifted his broken arm as further explanation. He had a feeling that explaining any more would make him look guilty. Man, did he feel guilty. He told Mitzi she was beautiful today. I think that'll do for tonight. He backed up, heading to his truck. If you don't mind starting on that side panel, I'll ask my brother what else he recommends. Mitzi held up a hand, like she wanted to stop him from leaving. Before he could change his mind Forrest turned around and marched off. It wasn't until he was halfway to the Banby that he realized he'd left dinner on the stove. Oh well Mitzi could feed it to her man. His mood soured as he pictured the three of them sitting around the table, laughing and enjoying chicken fried steak and mashed potatoes. A sense that it should be him in that place had him shaking his head at himself. I'm going home. To North Dakota. She lives here. In Idaho. He spoke to the steering wheel. It doesn't make sense to picture us together. We live states apart. He shoved away his jealousy and turned into the Belly Up Cafe, needing something to fill the hole inside of him. Might as well be greasy fries and a burger. He should just feel good that he was able to help Mitzi without offending her. He should. But he still wished he was the one sitting at the table tonight. Chapter 14 What are you doing here, Ely? Mitzi put her hand on her hip and glared. She'd already turned him down for lunch today. How many times did she have to tell him no before he understood that the answer would always be no? I had a feeling I should come out and check on you. Looks like it was a good thing too. That guy is trouble. He jerked his head to where Forrest's taillights were slowly disappearing down the lane. Mitzi sighed the sigh of a woman who had had enough but was calling upon the good Lord to fill her with patience. Forrest is an old friend. We knew each other when we were kids. He's a good man. Ely blanched. No kidding. No kidding, she parroted. Hopefully, that would dispel any rumors Ely thought to start. The man was worse than the monthly book club who made it their business to know all the business in town. Does he know we, you know? He lowered his chin as if they shared a secret. We don't, Ely. His lip lifted in a sneer. We don't. Why did she feel like they were talking in circles? She was out of patience and apparently God wasn't going to give her any more tonight. Listen, Ely. I appreciate your help when we were moving in. It was really nice of you to move boxes and things. But that doesn't mean that you and I are together. We have an understanding. She threw up her hands. Not from my side. His mouth went slack. Listen, you're a nice guy. Really. And one day, you're going to make a woman very happy. But I'm not that woman. Okay. He continued to stare at her as if she were speaking Japanese. 
I need you to understand this, Ely. We are not a couple. We aren't going to be a couple. There is nothing linking the two of us together. She drew a breath, hating how harsh she sounded. She wasn't a mean person, but he'd pushed her too far for too long. It wasn't healthy for him to entertain thoughts of them together when there was no chance of it happening. Not to mention he could be missing out on someone better suited for him. She should say that. Ely, you need to look for someone else. I'm not interested in you. He grunted. Way to kick a guy when he's down. She cringed. She really wasn't a mean person. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I truly believe there's someone out there for you. He jerked so he wasn't looking directly at her. Yeah, sure. Like someone who isn't as high-stepping as you. What? Did you treat your ex like he was beneath you too? That was uncalled for, Ely. He was hurt. And lashing out. She could understand. No wonder your ex took off. Now he'd gone too far. You need to leave. He left without answering or saying he was sorry or closing the garage door he'd so thoughtlessly opened. Well, she wasn't exactly rolling out the apologies either. Maybe they could just move on from here. They could be polite, she could, anyway. After that display, she wasn't sure about Ely. Billy raced into the yard, alone. Mitzi searched the trees for Snowflake. She was shy around strangers, not allowing herself to be seen by anyone but Billy, her, and now Forrest. The reindeer was back far enough from the house that Mitzi could barely make out her body shape in the waning light. Hey, kid. See you around. Ely rubbed Billy's stocking hat. Billy swatted his hand away. Ely stopped and Mitzi poised, ready to chase him down and defend her child if needed. He wouldn't hurt Billy to get back at her, would he? For all his pushiness, Ely wasn't dangerous. At least, she didn't think so. He stared up the lane for a second before asking Billy, Do you know what happened to that guy's arm? It wasn't broken the other day when I saw him. Oh. Billy blinked. He looked at Mitzi and then back at Ely. My mom broke it. Ely snorted. You shouldn't tell lies, kid. Santa will put you on the naughty list. Mitzi growled. He's not lying. Ely spun around and sized her up. She folded her arms and glared. He muttered something she couldn't hear well and then drove away. Billy wandered into the garage, taking in the sleigh and the tools. Snowflake came in a minute later. Mom. Mitzi moved from where she was standing sentinel, making sure Ely was long gone and watching for any sign of Forrest's truck. Maybe he would come back. He said he had feed for Snowflake. Yeah. Maybe being that blunt with Ely was a bad idea. Her conscience pricked and prodded her. How many Sunday school lessons did she need on being like Jesus before she was actually going to start acting like him? Ely pushed so many buttons with that comment about her ex, giving life to all her old insecurities that she was the problem, that if she'd only given up more of herself, she could have saved them. By the time he'd left, there wasn't anything left of her to give. Mom. Billy asked again as he slid into her side, his arm around her back. I'm sorry, bud. I didn't hear you. She cupped the back of his head as he looked up at her. I'm hungry. The steaks. She tore off for the kitchen. The smell of home cooking hit her inside the door wrapped her in its arms, and gave her a hug. 
Her stress decreased by a third with the promise of a hearty meal. As she dumped the water out of the potatoes, she smiled. Forrest thought he was so smart, calling all this reindeer food. She knew what he was doing, and she was grateful for his efforts to save her pride. Is that dinner? Billy sniffed the air as he came in behind her. The chicken fried steaks were seasoned with just the right amount of spice, and the scent was heavenly. Mitzi smiled, feeling a sense of happiness that reached right into her heart because she could answer, Yes, it is. As she opened the fridge and took in the veggies, fruits, yogurt, and milk, she shook her head in amazement. Forrest was sneakier than Santa, and she didn't mind one bit. Even as she settled in to pray over her plate, a worry grabbed her smile and tugged it downward. Forrest wouldn't be here forever. He wouldn't even be around through New Year's. She shouldn't get used to his generosity. This meal was a blessing, and she'd take it with gratitude. But Forrest wasn't the answer to her problems or the solution for a better life. He was a part-time employer and maybe, someday soon, a friend. She pushed the bites of meat around on her plate, suddenly wishing he was sitting at the table with them. He'd tease her about putting ketchup on her mashed potatoes, and then he'd tell her the toaster was perfect just the way it was because it could easily start a fire if the heat went out and that would keep them warm. His positive outlook on the ancient fridge and dilapidated kitchen was like a fresh breeze. With a resolve she wasn't sure she truly felt, she dug into the meal and decided to let Forrest figure out his own life. He'd be back at the ranch soon and probably forget about her. Who was she to want to spend time with him anyway? She had other things to worry about. Chapter 15 Come on, Snowflake. I need to send this video to Caleb and Faith. Snowflake trotted down the small hill, her head held high and her ears perked. She stared off into the distance, like she was looking beyond the camera. You're such a beauty queen. He rubbed the spot between her antlers. She preened for him, asking if he wanted more photos. I think that'll do for now. Faith is going to talk to Doc, and we'll see what we can do to help you get your legs back. She lifted her right front leg and looked down. I know you can walk and run, but you were created to do more. She huffed and moved several steps away from him. Turning your back on who you are and what you were meant to be doesn't change it. She sauntered a we'll see about that. Arguing with her was fruitless. Come on, for now, we're going to work on your gait. She lifted an eyebrow. Don't believe it's off? Here, look at the video. He turned the camera her direction and showed her the video. She shook her head. Sorry. Forgot you can't see that. Well, he stepped back and geared up to demonstrate. It looks like this. He ran, dragging his left leg a little behind the right, kind of a slow hop motion. Snowflake snorted, I do not. Beth! He dared her to show him different. Forrest leaned up against a tree and waited. She started trotting, her one leg falling behind. She gasped and stopped, giving the leg a dirty look. She rushed to him. Don't just stand there. Fix it! He chuckled and rubbed her forehead. He could have offered her a hundred fresh carrots and she wouldn't have worked with him, but show her a flaw in herself and she'd beg for his help. Reindeer were proud animals, and as much as Snowflake wanted to ignore the fact that she could fly, she wasn't going to wander around with a hitch in her gait. She huffed and shook his hand off. I'm not your pet. He schooled his features. Better to not let her know that he'd goaded her into this. Besides, training a reindeer was a lot of fun, and he'd missed it. He itched to get to work, to see what they could accomplish together. He rubbed his glove over the sling. We'll start out easy, like when you were first learning. You'll progress fast, but don't get discouraged if you have a hard time, alright? She blinked a yes. 
he dropped the pack he'd been carrying and began walking around the small clearing, stomping down the snow on the perimeter. This is our training pen. I'm making the lines. She turned in a circle as he moved. Just like at home. You know the circle pen? She slightly lowered her nose. Yes. Right. Same idea here. The trees are a natural barrier. But I'm tromping out where the fence would be. She stomped her two front hooves in quick succession. Get on with it. Hold your antlers. He was about three quarters of the way around. We can't work without a proper training ground. This area was anything but a proper training ground. It wasn't completely smooth, but the six inches of snow on top of ice would help even things out. When he got back to where he started, he pulled a lead rope out of the pack. Snowflake lifted her chin so he could attach it to her harness. Let's see some wide circles. What do you take me for, a calf? I told you we're starting at the beginning. She rolled her eyes and moved so the rope was not tight but hung in the air between them. Then she flicked her tail and started trotting. Forrest turned with her, keeping the rope from wrapping around him. After ten paces, her back leg tripped and she stumbled. Don't worry about it, Forrest encouraged her. You haven't done this in a while. She started out again, her eyes slitted with determination. Concentrate on your feet. She threw her head and kept going, still stumbling every few paces. Remember how you used to lift off like a tornado? He laughed at the memory of hanging onto the lead rope as she lifted them both off the ground, making tighter and tighter circles. Her jaw tightened. I'm not amused. You know what you need? He pulled out his phone and pulled up Chuck Berry's Run Rudolph Run. When he hit play, the tinny sound of an electric guitar from the 1950s flooded the clearing. You need rhythm. Her ears twitched and her nose lifted. Her tail moved back and forth to the bass drum, and her hooves soon found the beat. She pranced. After the first verse, she added a sway to her hips. Forrest started singing along. All I want for Christmas is a rock and roll electric guitar. He stepped to the music, finding himself getting lost in the fun. You're doing it! Snowflake smiled even as she kept her eyes on where she was going. She was still thinking hard about making all her body parts work in sync, but she was doing it. The process would get easier from here. When the last few notes disappeared into the trees, forest called her to a stop. Catch your breath. Her ribs expanded and contracted with exaggerated movement. Her breath puffed out in clouds, and her steam wafted off her back. He'd never tell her, but she was out of shape. A flying reindeer should be able to trot for states before she was out of breath. He patted her neck. Think you can do another song? She nodded and swallowed a question in her eyes. I know what you want, you want Mr. Buble, don't you? Her tongue fell out and she panted. He threw his head back and laughed at her antics. She had a major crush on the singer. How about some jingle bells? She nodded and rubbed her nose against his shoulder like a cat. Knock it off. He playfully shoved her away. I know who you really love. She chortled and moved to the perimeter. Hang on, it's not that easy this time. He moved his pack so it would be in her way as she circled. She potted it and then scooped down with her antlers and tossed it away. Hey! He retrieved it, grateful she hadn't thrown it in a tree. Do it for Michael, Snowflake. Picture him singing just to you. She licked her lips and lined up at the starting spot. For the darling Mr. Buble. I'm trying not to be insulted. She lifted a hoof and kicked the top layer of snow. Don't care if you are. He hit play, and the song started. She turned one ear toward his phone as she did the reindeer equivalent of a shoulder bob to the beat. Giddy up, he called. She started out not quite up to the beat, but she figured it out soon enough. Forrest sang along under his breath. The first two times around, Snowflake had trouble with the bag. She didn't want to clear it, like she was afraid to jump too high. He'd have to work on that. 
jumping should be as easy as Christmas pie for her. They were over the fields when Forrest spied Billy hiding behind a tree that was skinnier than he was. He made and held a contact. With one arm in a sling and one hand on the lead rope, he ended up jerking his head to tell Billy to come over. The boy hesitated a moment and then ran right into the clearing and up to Forrest. Whatcha doin', kid? I was on my way home from school and heard your music. He swiped at his bright red nose. My mom likes Elvis Christmas music. But sometimes she plays this song too. Really? Forrest wanted to ask why, but he reminded himself that Mitzi wasn't available and he was leaving town. Why are you making her run in circles? The song moved to the next one on the playlist, and Michael sang about silver bells. Snowflake automatically slowed to match her pace to the new song. It was time to cool down, so Forrest allowed the change of pace. When he got her back to the barn, he'd need to give her a good rub down. She needs to get in shape. Snowflake shook her antlers at him. Hey! He pointed her direction. Watch your language. There's a kid present. She snapped her mouth shut and tossed Billy an apologetic look. Billy took it all in stride his thoughts on his questions more than on what Snowflake was up to. So if she gets back in shape, will she be able to fly again? Forrest's hold on the lead rope slipped and it fell to the ground. Snowflake stopped trotting and moved into a slow walk. You, you saw her fly? Forrest stumbled over the question. Shoot! He should have asked that differently. Usually, he was careful about these things careful not to expose the family business. Billy nodded. Well, the cat was out of Santa's bag now. How many times, he pressed. Billy frowned. Just the one time. The day we met. Forrest turned to watch Snowflake circle them. Her black eye was trained on them, and she listened to everything they said. Forrest rubbed his beard. Do you think she can still fly? Forrest asked. Or do you think breaking her leg made it so she couldn't? They'd never had a flying reindeer break a leg before. It was possible that the magic was gone. Billy shook his head. She flew when it was broken, that's how I got her back to the barn. Forrest blew out breath, the vapors clouding around his face. Why do you think she doesn't fly anymore? Billy chewed his lip as he thought. I think it's because she doesn't want to leave me. We're best friends. And if she flies, then she could fly away. Snowflake broke her circle and walked right over to Billy, her head down, waiting for a scratch. He hugged her hello. So it's psychological. Forrest felt like throwing himself back in the snow and lying there until spring. As much as they knew about reindeer, they didn't exactly have a reindeer psychologist in the family. Psycho what? Billy asked. I mean the reason is in her head, not her leg. Forrest unclipped the lead rope. She's believed she can't fly, so she can't. Billy nodded sagely. Like my mom. Your mom can fly? Forrest asked, teasing. Billy laughed, his eyes dancing. No. But she thinks she'll never fall in love again. Forrest was suddenly deeply interested in this conversation. She said that? Billy nodded. After my dad left. Snowflake lifted her head and turned it toward the barn. She bounded off, and Billy took off after her. Forrest grabbed up his pack and followed, determined to keep an eye on the reindeer and the kid. If Mitzi didn't believe she could fall in love, what was she doing dating Ely? He caught up to Billy and Snowflake just as Mitzi's ancient car pulled in the drive and shut off. Forrest placed a hand on Billy's shoulder. Let's keep the flying reindeer to ourselves, okay? Billy looked up at him. Mom doesn't believe anyway. Forrest felt those words like a knife to the heart. Sure, lots of adults didn't believe in flying reindeer, but for some reason, it hurt that Mitzi didn't. Don't believe what? Mitzi called. Her voice easily carried over the snow and ice-covered landscape. That reindeer can fly. Except Santa's, 
but they're special. Billy's mittens flew to his mouth, and he stepped away from Forrest. Is Snowflake one of Santa's reindeer? His eyes were wide with panic. Did I steal her from Santa? Snowflake pawed at the ground. Don't, she warned. Forrest considered the three sets of eyes boring into him, one of them begging for release from a supposed sin, one curious, and one hoping he'd keep his big mouth shut. Well, he'd never been one for subtlety. And if Mitzi didn't believe, then she'd pass off whatever he was going to say as an adult keeping the magic alive for a child. Besides, Snowflake needed to understand how important she was in the grand scheme of Christmas things. She's not, yet. But I really believe she could be. Billy let out the breath he'd been holding. Snowflake shot him a look. I can't believe you said that in front of him. Mitzi gave him a secretive smile. Snowflake is the smartest reindeer I've ever known. If Santa was going to recruit any reindeer, it would be her. Snowflake stomped toward the barn, scattering the geese and earning angry honks. The steam coming off her now was more figurative and fueled by anger than it was from her workout. The ducks came out of the barn to see what all the fuss was about. They got one look at Snowflake, lowered their heads, and flew to the other side of the yard. Mitzi looked at him. Did I say something wrong? Forrest watched the reindeer go. It was easier than noticing the woman next to him. She doesn't know how to take a compliment. Mitzi laughed, the sound ringing like bells hanging in the trees. Right. Because all reindeer can hold full conversations. She shook her head. Wait, can they? A little more careful than he'd been when talking to Billy Forrest remembered to deflect the question. You hold full conversations with her? She rolled her eyes at herself. Stop. I know you talk to her too. She's oddly communicative. She started toward the house. I got the panel stabilized last night. Forrest nodded. Great. He wondered if Ely had helped her. If they talked until late in the night and shared a kiss. He made a sour face. Gah. He was turning Christmas green with envy over this guy. Did he have any idea how good he had it? Maybe he did. If so, how could he let Mitzi and Billy exist on oatmeal and noodles? He shook his head. It wasn't his place to judge their relationship. It just frustrated him that a guy like that had a woman like Mitzi and he wasn't better for her. Mitzi pulled open the screen door and pushed open the wood door. What's that smell? She sniffed again. Forrest followed behind her, his nose burning from the transition from the cold to the warm kitchen. Oh. Uh, I put roast and carrots in your oven. She stopped, one arm out of her coat and one in. You came in the house? He cupped the back of his neck. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's just, they had a sale on the roasts today and I haven't had roast beef in ages and I'm, I, he cleared his throat. That was not emotion. I guess I miss home. Her eyes scanned his face. Man, he hoped his eyes hadn't gone red. They did that sometimes when he was not overcome by his feelings. She took him all in and then nodded slowly. So you borrowed mine? He lifted a shoulder. This place feels like a home. Her hand covered her mouth and her eyes turned red. That's really sweet of you to say. Hey, he said in a low, rumbly voice he didn't know he had. It came from that same place that wanted to provide for her and Billy. I should have asked. She waved him off and blinked rapidly. You're fine. Really? Truly? You're welcome here. Anytime. She laughed at herself. The picture of her eyes, luminous with unshed tears, full of joy and peace, stole his breath away. And thank you. That was a compliment I'll hang on to. He smiled. Good. For the first time, he noticed how close he stood to her. Close enough to smell that pine-scented candle and her shampoo again. He wasn't even sure how he'd gotten so close. 
but he was sure he shouldn't be that close to someone else's girlfriend, even if that someone else didn't deserve her. Should we, uh, get to work? Yes, she said, all breathy. Jumping away from him, she blinked and repeated herself. Yes. Okay. I'll go take a look at the progress while you get settled. Great. I could use a minute to get settled. She blushed and then moved to hang her coat up on the peg. He made his way to the garage. If he was smart, he'd figure out how to get out of town sooner rather than later. The more he worked with Mitzi, the more he wanted to work with her. For a wrangler, that was a dangerous thought. He'd grown up knowing his life would be filled with physical labor, and he'd determined that any woman worth bringing home would have to be one who was a true partner. Someone who didn't mind working as hard as he did, who liked it, even. He had a sinking suspicion that Mitzi was just that kind of woman. And there was nothing he could do about it. Chapter 16 At work the next morning Mitzi gave every customer a hearty Merry Christmas on their way out the door. She couldn't seem to help herself. Working on the sleigh was quickly becoming her favorite hobby. Billy had asked if they were going to make a My Heart Channel video on repairing sleighs, and she and Forrest had joked about it throughout the night. He'd narrate what he was doing, throwing in comments about aerodynamics and wind resistance. She'd talk about fabric selection and the tools they used. Billy had giggled non-stop. Snowflake had stayed in the barn, she'd been sulking. Forrest knew why but he hadn't brought it up. Whatever happened between the two of them would stay between the two of them. Mitzi was all right with that. The holidays were supposed to be merry and not full of drama. That was how she liked them. Therefore, she decided to let the two of them work out their differences on their own. After all, one of them was a grown-up and the other was a wrangler. She snickered at her thoughts. The door blew open and Carla came running through. Mitzi, she yelled even as she caught sight of her by the snow shovels. Are you out of your ever-loving mind, girl? Mitzi glanced down at her jeans and sweater, covered by a green apron with the store's logo. By the way Carla was acting, she half expected to have forgotten her pants. I don't think so. She smiled. Carla waved her arms as she spoke. You're letting a vagabond into your home. You have a child to think about. Understanding dawned, and Mitzi waved her hands like she was stopping a charging bull. Forrest is not homeless. He's staying at the Band B. Mary at the Band B said he came in looking like he'd crawled out of a cave. Mitzi laughed. She could picture him in his winter camo and with a longer beard. He would look out of place. I'm sure she's exaggerating. Carla shook her head. Ely said he'd been spying on you and Billy for some time before he made contact. That's creepy. At the mention of Ely trying to interfere and spread rumors Mitzi groaned. It was time she set the record straight. Carla, you know you're my best friend, right? She grabbed Carla by the upper arms and made eye contact. Being direct with Ely was a necessity, apparently, he got that trait from his stepmom. Right, she affirmed. So I gotta tell ya, Mitzi steeled herself. This one was going to hurt her friend. I'm not interested in nor attracted to Ely. I don't want to be with him, and I don't want him at my house. Carla huffed. No need to get snippy. Mitzi let her hands drop. I'm not. It was just difficult to get him to understand that we're not meant to be. Carla folded her arms on herself. I'm sorry, Carla. I really am. I know you had hopes for the two of us to be together. Carla sank in on herself. I did. 
She drew in a breath. Mitzi ached for the older woman. She'd taken her under her wing when she first came to town and taken pity on her with this job. Mitzi hadn't known the first thing about retail when she'd started, but Carla had patiently taught her how to run the store. She trusted her to lock up at night and make the deposit. And she watched Billy when Mitzi worked late. That kind of trust wasn't something Mitzi took lightly. I don't want to hurt you. You mean the world to me. Carla drew in another breath that lifted her out of her momentary funk. Family doesn't always mean a wedding ring. She grasped Mitzi's wrist and held on. You're my girl, no matter what. Mitzi hugged her tightly. Family, she affirmed. Carla squeezed and then stepped back. So, this guy, does he want kids? Taken off guard, Mitzi blinked several times. I, uh, don't know. Why? Because I want grandkids. She patted Mitzi's stomach. And at the rate Ely's going, you're my best hope. Mitzi laughed. Sorry. This baby factory is shut down. Carla wagged a finger at her. Don't say that. You don't know what the future will bring. He's leaving town. What? Why? Suddenly feeling despondent Mitzi turned to straighten the shovels. He lives in North Dakota, just passing through. Carla was silent long enough that Mitzi had to turn around to see if she was still there. She was. And she was looking at Mitzi like she was a puzzle to figure out. What? I'm just trying to see how that makes a difference. Like you said, I have a kid to think about. Billy lost his dad. I can't bring another man into his life who's going to leave. That's not fair to him. Carla nodded quickly. I see that. And you're right. She rubbed Mitzi's back. Then I'd say you need to watch yourself. Why? Because your heart's already turned toward this guy. You'll lose it to him without even knowing it. She patted Mitzi once more and then walked away, letting her words sink in. She'd had so much fun last night. The kind of fun that was light and easy and made a person believe anything was possible, even a flying sleigh. Carla was right. She couldn't let herself get carried away like that. She had bills, food to put on the table, and a boy to raise. When was the last time she'd worried about Billy? She was a mother, so his needs should be at the top of her list. But somehow, last night, she'd just forgotten that he didn't have friends his age, that he was lonely. She'd meant to call the principal and set up a meeting to talk things over, and she'd forgotten. Whatever spell Forrest cast over her, she had to fight it off. If not for her heart, then for Billy's sake. Chapter 17 Forrest pulled the rope over his shoulder, turned, and dug his toes into the snow for traction as he pulled the sled out of the garage. They needed to pull off the back and replace it but there just wasn't enough room in the tiny space. Sure, the sleigh fit fine, but getting back there to get work done was impossible. Mitzi had pulled the sleigh across the ice and snow without trouble, but it would take both of them to move it across the dry concrete. Almost there, Mitzi called from where she pushed in the back. She'd been able to shimmy between the sleigh and the wall, a process Forrest enjoyed watching much too much. He continually had to remind himself that she wasn't available. Which just wasn't fair, not when she was so great to be around. They'd come up against several obstacles already, and instead of getting upset or frustrated, she cocked her head to the side, looking at it from another angle, and pondered solutions. It was because of her think-through-it attitude that he kept his own frustrations about only having one arm to work with at bay. Stop! Since she had two working arms Mitzi was the break. 
she planted her feet and was dragged several inches before the sleigh stopped. Forrest picked up one of the old bricks he'd seen in the garage and braced the runner on the right. Mitzi did the same on the left. She stood up and zipped up her coat. Now that they were working with the door open, they needed to dress for it. Forrest wandered to the back of the sleigh and took in the damage. Made from a solid piece of pine, it had cracked down the middle and then half had fallen away. The nails poked up like snarled teeth. Mitzi grabbed a hammer and began tapping them straight so she could force them back out the way they'd gone in. You know, if you used something stronger than pine, it might have lasted longer. She went to the side, braced the hammer with a piece of wood so she wouldn't dent the side, and pried the nail free. Forrest stood there, feeling useless. Then again, if he had two arms, he wouldn't have hired Mitzi and she wouldn't have some extra cash for Christmas. Nothing happened by accident, and God could turn all things for their good. It was just hard to stand around when he was used to being in the middle of things. He pushed out a breath and tried to focus on the positives. True, he replied. But the weight of the sleigh has to be considered. Snowflake isn't a draft horse. Mitzi was on the third nail by now. I'm surprised she can pull this one. You got it here, didn't you? Forrest teased. Mitzi didn't look up from her task, but she smiled. The curve of her cheek did funny things to his stomach. Things he liked but knew he shouldn't. I won't tell you the swear words I used for fuel. Forrest laughed, and Mitzi joined in. In moments like these, he could easily picture them working together for the rest of their lives. Car repairs. Washing dishes. A broken vacuum. None of it would be too much for the two of them. Okay, let's see if this will fit. With the nails gone, Mitzi retrieved the piece she'd measured and cut to size before he arrived. It needed sanding, but he could work a sander once they got it installed. She positioned the piece. It's perfect. He grinned. She lifted her hands in the air in triumph. The piece fell back and hit her in the stomach. Oof. She laughed and put it back in place. Maybe I should wait to celebrate until it's secure. She went to grab the nail gun and couldn't reach it while holding the wood. Forrest jumped into action, getting the nail gun for her. He stepped close, turning the gun so it was easy for her to hold. Thanks, she said, a little breathy. Could being close affect her the way it did him? His heart pounded so loudly that he couldn't hear if hers did the same thing. She turned away quickly and lined up the edges. When she went to put the gun against the wood, the piece slipped. Could you just hold something? Moving purely on instinct, Forrest stood behind her and placed his hand on the pine. Her hair, pulled into a high ponytail, smelled like almonds and coconut. He drew in a breath, letting the scent of her wash over him. There was no trace of the pine candle. Today was her day off, and after she'd run errands, he had her all to himself. Homemade chicken noodle soup simmered on the stove, and from scratch rolls proofed on the counter for dinner. Strange how these small things had become big things to him over the last week. Like this? he asked, his voice husky. He was playing with fire and he knew it. The feelings inside of him were ready to burst into flames. But he could toy with his own feelings as long as he wasn't hurting Mitzi. Truly, it was a form of self-torture that he indulged in. No harm done. And when he left town, he'd take it all with him. She nodded and then gulped. From where he was, he could see her lashes. With her deep red hair, he would have thought they'd be red too. But they were a dark brown, thick and long. She hadn't put on any makeup today, and her freckles were on full display. He liked her like this and it was all he could do not to brush his fingers over her cheek and then down her neck. Mitzi's hand holding the nail gun shook as she lined it up. Odd. She had a steady hand earlier. Wanting to test the waters, to push limits he knew he shouldn't, he leaned down slightly and let his breath brush her neck. She shivered and then shifted so she was more tucked into him. The sensations this created overpowered him. Darn it! Why did he have to cross that line? 
it was all he could do not to take her in his arm and kiss her until steam rose off both of them. Wouldn't take much, he couldn't even feel the cold anymore. The nail gun fired and both of them jumped. Mitzi giggled. Oops. He leaned over her shoulder and saw that the nail had gone through both pieces of wood, but it was on an angle instead of hidden and it poked out. I'll grab the nail pullers. Mitzi turned, but Forrest didn't back up to let her go. He just didn't have it in him to fight the attraction growing stronger by the second. Leave it. Her forehead crease. Why? Because I want to have it to remember this moment. She lifted her eyes to his and then dropped them quickly to his coat collar. She lifted it and fiddled with the fabric. Why this moment? Because I... Honk! 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 Quack! Quack! Honk! Meow! The animals in the yard went nuts, flapping and darting about. Forrest and Mitzi both turned to watch the commotion. What the ginger snap? Mitzi stepped out of his arms and into the waning afternoon light. Sunset came early in these parts. As soon as the feel of her next to him was replaced by winter air, he snapped out of his temptations. As good as it felt to be right there, ready to brand her lips with his own, he would have hated himself for it. He was a better man than this, and he should act like it. What would his parents say? His mother? She'd tell him to get out of there to create boundaries. And he would. He vowed to be the man he'd been raised to be and no less. From here on out, he wouldn't fall into the traps that he'd jumped into so willingly. The ducks flapped and quacked their way to the edge of the tree line. The geese charged in circles. The cats took up posts on the fence posts and the hood of his truck. The calico had been sleeping there, warmed by the cooling engine at first. Snowflake poked her head out of the barn. She'd settled in for a long winter's nap after their PT session this morning but was bright-eyed now. Billy appeared, his hat in his hand, his backpack hanging open, and his hair disheveled. Forrest Mitzi and Snowflake surged forward to intercept him. The closer they got, the more rumpled the kid looked and the faster Forrest's feet moved. Billy didn't look at them until they were all on top of him. Mitzi hugged him to her, and Forrest knelt in the snow to look him over. What happened? asked Mitzi. Billy shoved her away. Stupid Jordan said there wasn't a Santa Claus. Whatever had happened between the two boys wasn't over, as far as Billy was concerned. Snowflake pranced circles around them, wanting to get in and be next to her kid but not able to with Mitzi standing so close. Bless the reindeer for not shoving Mitzi out of the way. She had matured a bit in that area over the last year. Forrest understood why Billy shoved Mitzi. It wasn't that he didn't want her love and reassurance, he just had too many emotions running through him to settle into her embrace. He'd wait for the boy to yell it all out. Once he did, he'd feel better. He placed a hand on Mitzi's back to reassure her that she was doing great. Billy's face grew red as he relived the heated exchange. He said believing was for babies and that moms bought all the presents. What did you tell him? Mitzi asked. Billy clamped his lips shut. Forrest nudged him. Go on. You can tell us. Us? He glanced at Mitzi, but she didn't disagree with him throwing himself into the adult side of this moment. Billy dropped his chin to his chest. I told him my mom couldn't afford presents but Santa always came. He lifted his dark green eyes to Mitzi. I'm sorry, Mom. I didn't mean to. I mean, I don't. SHH, Mitzi grabbed him and hugged him close. This time Billy threw his arms around her and held on for all he was worth. It's okay. I promise. Billy cried, his anger spent. Forrest knelt down and patted Billy's back. You stood up for what you believe in, Billy. That's what a man does. They both turned to look at him. I wouldn't want to mess with the likes of you. He cuffed Billy's chin. Billy smiled through his watery eyes. There's some warm water on the stove. Do you want to make some hot chocolate? Mitzi asked. Billy nodded. Yeah. 
he walked with his head up. Snowflake moved beside him, and Billy placed a hand on her shoulder. They make quite the pair, don't they? Mitzi asked quietly. Forrest pushed to his feet and brushed off his knees. Reminds me of me. He chuckled, thinking of the scrapes he used to get into. Mitzi didn't chuckle, nor did she tease him about one of the dumb pranks he'd pulled on her. He glanced her way to find a deep sadness in her eyes as she watched Billy hug Snowflake before he went into the house. I'm going to tell him there's no Santa. She started back toward the garage. Only a million alarm bells went off inside a forest. You can't do that. He jogged to catch up to her, barely noticing his arm protest. Why would you do that to him? he demanded. She sighed. Not an ounce of fight was left in her, there was just this sad resolution that tore at Forrest's heart. Snowflake is his best friend, and you're taking her. I need to consider ways that he will fit in here. If believing in Santa is keeping him from that, then, she folded her arms and rubbed her hands up and down them. I need to do what's best for Billy. What's best for, he sputtered. Ripping the magic out of his childhood isn't going to make things better for him. She narrowed her eyes. I'm doing the best I can, and I'm doing it alone. Forrest shook his head, scrambling for a way to make this right. You have Ely. The words tasted like reindeer droppings, and he couldn't believe that he'd gotten them out without gagging. Mitzi jerked back. Ely, she asked in disgust. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. That was an intelligent response. Yeah. What? Huh, she replied. Clearly they were both struggling to put thoughts into words. I just meant that. I mean he may not be here all the time, but Ely. Mitzi's horrified look made Forrest cut off. She made a face like she'd eaten a super sour patch ball. I don't have Ely. She flapped her hands. E.W. What made you think we, E.W.? Forrest's brain churned. He said you two had a thing. She rolled her eyes, her whole body getting into the act. Never. Oh my gosh. She brushed her hands down her arms as if she were trying to get spiderwebs off them. You thought I was with Ely? The rules and boundaries and everything else that Forrest had self-imposed to keep him from falling for Mitzi evaporated like his breath in the air. She shoved him. I'm insulted. Forrest shook his head. Circumstantial evidence. He was here, acting like he owned the place. I just, she rolled her eyes at him again. You could have asked. Feeling defensive, he answered without thinking. Then you would have thought I was interested. Are you? She quirked a brow. Maybe, he fired back. Both her eyebrows shot up. They stared at one another, each waiting to see who would make the next move. Which felt like a first move onto uneven ground. Forrest drew himself up. Do you want to go ice skating tomorrow night? Mitzi blinked. But she was quick to catch on that he was unsteady and vulnerable, and she met him on that unsteady ground with I'd like that. Great. It was great. It was so great. He felt like he could fly without Snowflake's help. I think we should take Billy. You do? An adorable line of confusion appeared between her eyebrows. Yes. Because you two come as a package. And because I want to get to know both of you. The line melted away and was replaced by a look of affection. Okay. He grinned. Okay then. He swung his good arm as they looked at each other for long enough that it became awkward. Um, should we get back to work? She pointed to the sleigh. Yep. We definitely should. Man, it was a good thing his brothers weren't here right now. He'd never hear the end of how dumb he sounded. Thinking of his brothers made him think of growing up with them and all the teasing. But it also brought him back to the Billy situation. Will you do me a favor? He asked as he held the board in place for her, this time letting himself enjoy the process without the guilt nagging at his soul. Sure. Don't talk to Billy yet. He was on shaky ground here, butting into her parenting. 
but his heart just wouldn't let him keep quiet on such an important issue. Let him believe for just a while longer. She bit her lip. I'll think about it. He nodded, knowing he didn't even have the right to ask in the first place. Chapter 18 Mitzi was hyper-aware that her blue puffy coat needed white gloves and a matching hat with one of those cute pom-poms on top, and she wore raspberry pink gloves and a navy hat. Hallmark heroines always had matching accessories, and they always got the kiss under the mistletoe. No matter how much she tried to tell herself it didn't matter if she got that kiss, her whole being yearned for it tonight. Forrest Nicholas, the boy who'd made her so angry as a girl, was the man who made her heart flutter as a woman. Who knew? I can't believe this setting. She glanced around them. Snow fell in large, lazy flakes that seemed to float to the earth like feathers. Every now and again, one would brush her cheek like a whisper from a winter fairy. Carols lifted the air. Hark! The herald angels sing, O oh, little town of Bethlehem, and silent night charmed the skaters. The rink was situated on the church lawn, run by the local pastor's wife as a fundraiser for the Sub for Santa program. A temporary tent was set up where the pastor himself fried fresh donuts, which he dunked in a sinful cinnamon sugar mixture before handing them over to eager patrons of all ages. There were several groups of great-grandparents who'd brought folding chairs that they set up so they could watch the festivities without worrying about breaking their hips. They kept their grandchildren full of hot chocolate, hugs, and cheers. Mitzi forished, and Billy made their way slowly around the rink. Billy didn't have his skate legs yet, and neither Mitzi nor Forrest were in a rush. They each held one of his hands and listened to him chatter on about Christmas and skating and Snowflake and his school program. And then I said that I'd be a reindeer, because no one else wanted to be one and Miss Breaker was really sad. Billy let go and pushed hard to get a few feet ahead of them. I'm doing it. He carefully continued on, doing his best not to watch his feet. You got this. Forrest cheered him. Several of the grandparents on the sidelines cheered for him. Billy grinned at them. Carla waved. She had a chair hooked over one arm and a portable heater over the other. She motioned to Billy. When you come back around, I'll buy you a donut. Okay. Billy pushed to go faster. Mitzi waved at Carla, who winked in return, making Mitzi's cheeks burn. Forrest took her hand. Let's open this up a little. He lengthened his stride and glided forward, pulling her with him. Mitzi wobbled and then righted herself, laughing. She pushed off and soon they were sliding around the rink at a good clip. Hey, you're not bad. Forrest's eyes twinkled with delight. I didn't spend five years in North Dakota for nothing, she quipped, making Forrest laugh. The sound was deep and wonderful and made her feel warm all over. Their next time around Billy waved from a chair next to Carla. He had a cup of cocoa in one hand and a donut in the other. They waved at him, and he grinned so wide. Mitzi sighed contentedly. I want this for him so much. You wanted frozen toes and a sugar overload. Forrest tugged on her arm, teasing. No, she tugged back and grinned. A sense of family. Home. Fun. That smile. Every kid should have that smile. She put her hand over her heart and let her knees go limp to show how Billy's happiness hit her right in the heart. Have you thought about calling your parents this Christmas? She hit a bump in the ice and stutter stepped to keep herself from falling on her face. I have. 
but cleaning up the past is on the back burner until our future is more solid. He frowned. Sorry. I know this whole snowflake thing is hard on you guys. She shook her head quickly. I wasn't even thinking about that. I was, she was embarrassed to admit how far behind she was in rent and how much life was winning. Just other things. He didn't press the subject, and they skated a couple laps in silence. A scratchy noise came over the loudspeaker, and Pastor Andrew cleared his throat. Ladies and gents, it's time for the mistletoe shuffle. Grab your partner and head on out to the ice for a little smoochin', Dot. His voice lowered. Let's keep it PG, folks. This is a family skate park. Forrest chuckled. Mitzi glanced at him, but he was watching the ice fill up with skaters and was maneuvering them between slower couples. Celine Dion began crooning, Christmas Eve and a feeling of love and giggles filled the air. Up ahead, Pastor Andrew held a fishing pole with mistletoe hanging off the end. He waved it over people's heads until they kissed, some of them barely keeping their skates on the ice. Mitzi's heart began to pound. Was Forrest planning to kiss her? She didn't want him to feel like he had to, so she leaned as if she may be headed to exit. He had an out, and he could take it and save face. She wouldn't hold it against him. He'd only just told her he was interested in her yesterday. She wasn't even sure what that included. Oh, stocking stuffers. Could this be any more awkward? Could she? Forrest pulled on her arm, bringing her alongside him and skating them right past the exit. She let out a breath, relieved. But now the fear of actually kissing him took root. Was it possible that she was more worried now than she'd been for her first kiss? What if she missed? They were skating. For the love, was there a harder target to hit than one that was above her and moving fast? Then there were the people around them, she could totally take out the lady with the baby carrier on her chest. That would be horrible. They came upon the pastor, and he swung the pole right over their heads and got the group behind him. The teenagers started laughing and pointing at one another, none of them brave enough to make the first move. She glanced at Forrest and found him studying her. Admit it, he teased, those mischievous cornflower blue eyes doing that twinkle thing again, you're disappointed we didn't get the mistletoe. She dropped her jaw and then narrowed her eyes. I wasn't even thinking about it, she fibbed. He leaned over and whispered in her ear, his deep voice reverberating all the way down to her skates. I was. She blushed. Hard. He moved behind her, placing his one hand on her hip. Let's try again. Feeling lucky? she asked. Oh, it's going to happen. She laughed. He moved so he was skating backwards in front of her, keeping his hand on her hip. She glanced past him and moved them to the right to avoid a slower group. I thought the guy was supposed to lead. He gave her a saucy grin. I am. Just then the mistletoe appeared over their heads, and those around them hooped. Someone yelled, hurry up and kiss her. Forrest leaned down, and all she could see was him. The cheeks that she longed to touch. His eyes, so full of question and surety, he was sure he wanted to kiss her, and he questioned if she wanted him to. His brows, so expressive when he laughed. And his lips his lips that were getting closer. He smelled like fresh air and manly body spray and candy canes. It was the candy canes that had her knees going weak. What man smelled like candy? She grabbed the front of his coat to hold herself steady, and his lips crushed hers. 
Her heart pounded and her mind spun. It was over before she could process every feeling inside of her. Her lips were warm and minty. Forrest smiled softly. Not bad for a first kiss. She giggled, the feeling blooming inside of her until she was laughing. Not at him or at the situation or at anything, just releasing the joy that had built up. Forrest laughed with her, moving to the side so he could hold her hand again. She pressed her free hand against her chest. I feel like I'm breathing for the first time in years. It was true. There'd been this weight on her, and it was gone. Really? Because I think you stole my breath away. He kissed the back of her glove, and she swore she could feel the heat from his mouth all the way to her skin. They didn't make it back under the mistletoe, but that was all right. Mitzi would float on that kiss all the way home. She could have floated to the North Pole on it, she was so happy. They skated for another half hour and spent some time chatting with Carla before it became apparent that Billy was worn out. Forrest picked him up and carried him to the truck with one arm. Be still her heart. They drove home with Billy sitting between them and laying his head on her lap. She smiled across the cab at Forrest. Thank you for taking us out. Forrest grinned back. I had a great time. Me too. She rested her head against the seat and let out a contented sigh. The cab was warm and her eyes were growing heavy. The days of staying up late and painting the town were long gone. But maybe that was okay. This quiet ride, with the two men she wanted close, was pretty perfect. Who needed fancy dresses, dinners, and diamonds? She'd take an open-aired skating rink and mistletoe on a fishing pole any night. Forrest's headlights bounced along the rutted dirt road, swinging across the barn as they entered the yard. What's that? Mitzi sat up taller her hand covering Billy in a protective manner. The barn door hung open. I know we locked that before we left. Forrest had insisted they have better security for Snowflake when they weren't around, and he'd invested in the lock. Sure did. Forrest's tone was dangerous. His neck strained as he worked to keep his emotions under control. She appreciated the effort and she was glad he was here. Not that she needed a man to protect her, case in point, Forrest's cracked arm. Her pulse spiked nonetheless as she thought about the helpless, sweet reindeer inside. Sit up, Han, as she pushed Billy up and made sure he was awake enough to hold himself there before she fumbled with her seatbelt. Not wanting to alarm him, she kissed his head before getting out. His eyes stayed shut and he leaned his head back, his mouth falling open. Forrest pulled to a stop with his headlights pointed right at the barn. He got out and moved to the front of the truck. Mitzi did the same. She pointed to the cut lock. Forrest nodded and pointed to the door and then to himself. He pulled out his phone and turned on the flashlight. She was already halfway in the barn when he grunted something about letting him go first. Snowflake, she whispered, swiping the light through each of the stalls. Snowflake. Forrest took the other side, where they had a stack of grain bags, thanks to him. The geese huddled in the third stall. As soon as her light hit them, they honked and flapped. Feathers flew. She dropped the light out of their eyes. Sorry. It's just me. They calmed some at the sound of her voice. She hurried to Snowflake's stall, and her blood ran cold. It was empty. Forest, she called, her voice laced with panic. She couldn't help it. What if something had happened to Snowflake? Over here. 
Forrest called. He was on the far side of the barn. She ran to him, preparing for the worst. Instead, she found Snowflake standing next to him, rubbing her face against his side. I'm so glad to see you, she said. Mitzi's eyes blurred. You're okay. She hugged Snowflake, who leaned her head down on Mitzi's shoulder. I'm okay. What happened? she asked the reindeer. Snowflake shook her head slightly. I was afraid. I'm so sorry. I'll get a new lock. You're safe here. She stroked the soft fur. Forrest studied the two of them. Mitzi grew defensive. She is safe here. What? he asked, all innocence. She stood up and gave Snowflake one more rub, purposefully ignoring the wrangler. I'll bring you a salad, okay? That's what she'd taken to calling the plate of fresh veggies and fruit she gave Snowflake every night. The reindeer loved them, and her coat was shinier. Snowflake dipped her head in thanks. Do you want to sleep in the garage? she offered. Snowflake shook her head and went to her stall. Okay then. Mitzi headed for the door. She didn't want to ruin the night with Forrest, but the spell was already broken and real life crashed down on her. Outside the barn, she shuffled her feet and kept her eyes down. Forrest joined her. Do you want me to stick around for a bit? She pressed her lips together. Yes. Yes, she wanted him to stick around. But tonight had been a dream. A crazy, wonderful dream. But it wasn't her life. And the sooner she realized that, the better. We'll be fine. Thank you, though. She turned, and something in the snow caught her eye. Is that, is that yours? She pointed to the shoe print. Forrest moved and put his shoe next to the print. I'd say size 11. His shoe was just barely larger. I'll stay with Billy while you check the house. She nodded. Or, I could stay with Billy while you check the house. He chuckled. I'll be right back. Mitzi debated climbing back in the truck, but she decided she wouldn't be able to hear Forrest yell for help if she was in there. The lights in the house turned on one by one. She rolled her eyes at herself as she pictured the pile of clothes on her bed that she discarded in her efforts to get ready for their date. Forrest's frame filled her kitchen door a moment later, and he came out, his breath puffing around him. I don't think anything was taken. Your room's been ransacked, though. She groaned. That was me. He chuckled, and she realized he was teasing her. She whacked his shoulder. Not funny. It was a little funny. She did her best to stifle her grin. Just when she thought they might be able to get some of the magic from earlier back, the truck door opened. Mom. Billy called groggily. Don't say anything. I don't want to scare him. She moved fast to get to the truck. I'm right here, bud. Billy slid into her arms, and she set him on his feet, steering him past Forrest. Did you want to call someone? She knew he meant the police, but there wasn't much to report. I'll talk to someone tomorrow. Do you think they'll be back? Could it be someone you know? He glanced down at Billy as he fell into step with them. No. He's moved on with life. Truly, she had nothing to fear from her ex. He wanted someone else and didn't look back. Maybe it was a homeless man. She widened her eyes slightly, asking if it was someone he knew. His family, perhaps. He shook his head. 
they would have called. And I'm the only one who would break into a barn, the rest of my brothers are way smarter than I am. She snorted in response. I'd call my landlady, but we're on thin ice here. She tried to keep the conversational tone in her voice so Billy wouldn't pick up on her worry. I don't need her to have a reason to not like me. Forrest nodded. I get it. She suddenly realized that he did, in fact, get it. Forrest understood all the things she said but also all the things she danced around. The sense that they were truly communicating, in a way and on a level that she'd never been able to find with a man, hit her like an avalanche. Cruel, cruel fate. Here she'd finally found a man she could talk to, really talk with, and he was leaving. Mom, Billy mumbled. We're going in. She waved at Forrest, wishing she could offer him a better, sweeter good night. He gave her a lopsided grin that said he had the same idea, and then he walked backward to the truck, which was still running. I'll stay until you flash the porch light. Thanks, if she called over her shoulder as she helped Billy through the two doors. Her room was just as she left it Billy's too. Whatever the man was after, he wouldn't find it here. She didn't have jewels hidden away or cash stuffed in the mattress. After walking through the rooms, she recognized that the house felt like no one had been there. She couldn't explain the feeling, but she just knew. She went back to the kitchen and flashed the porch light. Forrest answered by turning his brights on and off. Mitzi leaned against the door, reliving their time together. Forrest was a find, even rarer than a reindeer. As much as she didn't want to, she was losing her heart to him. She should know better. She should guard herself against him. But being with him was just wonderful. Was it so bad that she wanted that for herself, even if it was just until Christmas? Christmas. How would she ever be able to let the two of them leave? First Snowflake and now Forrest brought so much laughter into her otherwise gray existence. She was probably the only person on the planet who didn't want Christmas to come this year. If she could just hold on to these days, she might not have to let go. Chapter 19 I wish you'd tell me what happened last night. Forrest kicked a log into the small clearing he used to train Snowflake. He was spitting mad someone had broken into the barn, and he was perplexed that they hadn't taken Snowflake. If she'd been flying, he could understand her escape, but she wouldn't so much as get a hoof off the ground. On top of that, he hated, hated, leaving Mitzi and Billy alone. Yeah, she could wield a tire iron like a warrior princess, but that didn't mean he liked the idea of her having to. He glared at the reindeer. Your silence says there's more to this than I know. Snowflake looked the other way. I took care of it. Stop worrying. It's part of my job to worry about you. He shoved once more and the log was in place. Twice as tall as his pack, it would give Snowflake a new challenge to overcome. The whole family's worried about you. I get at least four texts a day asking how you're doing. He swiped his brow. No one asks about me, in case you were wondering. Snowflake chortled. Well, I am their favorite. Make running circles your favorite. He hooked the lead rope in place. She trotted off, sniffing the stump and then giving him the stink eye. I know what you're trying to do, and it's not going to work. I'm trying to get your furry behind in shape. Christmas is coming fast. She swished her tail. It's none of my never mind when Christmas comes. We'll see about that. He pulled out his phone and sent a text off to one of his oldest friends. It was time to call on the big dogs. If Snowflake thought she knew what she was giving up by staying here, she had another thing coming. His friend responded with a reindeer emoji and a Christmas tree, whatever that meant. With a shrug, he settled into the rhythm of Snowflake's hoofbeats. 
Where's my boob lay? She asked. I want to see if you can run steady without music. She blew out her lips. He chuckled. If you can, I'll play it on the way back to the barn. Fine. Her first few times over the stump were clumsy. She pinned her ears back and cleared it easily on the third try. Forrest watched, trying to determine if she was working on staying low or needed to concentrate to get the height. Billy came into the circle on his way home from school. He stood by Forrest and took in everything he did. Forrest remembered doing the same thing with his dad and thought he just might burst with pride. How was school? Same old. He chuckled at Billy's answer. He was about to ask how things were with Jordan when he heard the distant sound of sleigh bells. Snowflake's ears turned and she slowed down. You didn't. He gave her a wicked grin. Glancing down at Billy Forrest debated sending him off on an errand so he wouldn't see their visitor. But in the end, he decided that the kid could use all the magic in his life Forrest had to offer. And this was certainly going to be full of magic. Hey. He elbowed Billy. Check it out. He pointed north. Billy followed his gesture. Instead of looking at the sky Forrest watched Billy. He knew the moment Ginger cleared the clouds, because Billy's face went slack. Holding in the laughter was too difficult, and Forrest burst out a loud guffaw. He dropped the lead rope and waved to Ginger and then to Coco, who pulled the sleigh. Standing in her one-woman sleigh, wearing a red riding suit trimmed in white, Ginger Kringle waved back. Whoa, she called to Coco, pulling the reins to the right. Circling the clearing once, they landed and Ginger hopped out of the sleigh. Ho oh, ho ho Merry Christmas Forrest. Merry Christmas to you. Forrest hugged her quickly. Nice boots. She looked down at the shiny, shin-high black boots. Thanks. They have flat heels, perfect for a working mom. He shook his head. I still can't believe you have a family. You're so grown up. She wrinkled her nose. Santa never grows up. Santa? Billy breathed the name as if he were dreaming. He literally rubbed his mittens over his eyes. Ginger held her belly and ho ho hoed. Billy Edge! You've been a good boy this year, taking care of Snowflake isn't easy. She reached into her magic purse and pulled out a candy cane and a carrot. Snowflake approached, her eyebrow arched. Police. You wish you had me on your crew. Don't sass me, Snowflake, Ginger warned. Billy's head swung back and forth between the two of them. You know Snowflake? Of course I know Snowflake. Ginger smiled. I was there the day she was born. You were? Yep. I was the first one to feed her a carrot. Snowflake stepped closer, putting her nose under Ginger's palm. As tough as she claimed to be, no reindeer could resist Santa, it was in her DNA. Ginger freely gave the reindeer attention and love. Forrest grinned. If the pull of Santa loyalty didn't work on Snowflake, then he'd use peer pressure. Hey, Coco. Good to see you, girl. Coco bumped his front. You're thicker. Forrest chuckled. I've been eating well. He glanced at Snowflake, who was listening to Billy ask Ginger questions about making toys. Is that a fourth point on your antlers? She shook them excitedly. Do you like it? I do. Coco preened. Ginger continued. My younger sister is over toy production. She's pretty stressed out this year. There's lots of good boys and girls. Forrest began unhooking Coco. Do you want to play? She pranced in place. He was counting on her competitive side to bring Snowflake out of her non-flying slump. He chuckled. Do you want to get out of this harness and play for a minute? He almost had her out. She nodded. I brought some hula hoops from the toy factory, Ginger called over her shoulder. You smell like cookies, Billy said. Ginger giggled. I have a sister that smells like lemons and chocolate too. You do? 
Yep. Why don't we sit in the sleigh and watch the games? What games? Billy asked, following her like a duckling. Did you fly here from the North Pole? What's it like up there? How many elves live with you? What are their names? They kept talking while Forrest fetched the hoops. The reindeer circled one another happily, sniffing and catching up on all the news. Forrest cupped one hand around his mouth. Let the reindeer games begin. You two know how it goes. First deer to catch all five hoops wins. We'll play best three out of five. Their tails twitched with anticipation. Forrest stood in front of the sleigh and tossed the first hoop for Snowflake. She ran for it, catching it on her antlers. One! Forrest called. He threw the next one for Coco. She also stayed on the ground. When she dropped the hoop at his feet, she snorted. Give me a challenge. Okay. Okay. We're working up to it, he reassured her. Louder, he said. I don't think Snowflake can handle it, Coco. Snowflake turned around and kicked snow at him. He held up his arm to block the spray, laughing. Prove it, softy. He tossed the next hoop so she had to leap in the air. She did, but she didn't go any higher than she had going over the stump. He tossed the next round higher. Snowflake tried to position herself under it, but he tossed it sideways, necessitating an in-air catch. She missed. It's okay, Snowflake, Billy called. Try again. She looked at him and then at Forrest and then at Billy again. Putting her nose to the ground, she pretended to be interested in something under the snow. She was stubborn, but there was something else in the way she hunched her back, something that drew out a bucket load of compassion. Forrest stepped forward and ran his hand down her back. It's okay. We're done. She bumped him in thanks and then wandered over to Coco. Coco watched her with a wary eye, not sure what had happened to her friend. That was exciting, said Ginger. It took a lifetime of knowing the stocking half-full Kringle to detect the false cheer in her voice. Billy was a different case. A snowman could have seen the distress he felt at watching Snowflake. He thought this was his fault. Ginger picked up on his mood immediately. What's on your Christmas list this year, Billy? His eyes roamed all around Forrest as if he were afraid to look at him. Can I whisper it? Ho ho ho, of course. Ginger leaned in, cupping her hand around her ear. Her eyes sparkled with secrets. Forrest watched with a wonder for Christmas and the magic it brought out in the life of a child. This was why he did what he did. He sidled up to Snowflake. Watch this. Snowflake watched as Billy whispered excitedly into Ginger's ear. He talked and talked, his eyes dancing and his body wiggling with the power of the wish inside of him. There's kids all over the world just like that, wishing their little hearts out and hoping that eight reindeer will pull Santa's sleigh so she can deliver presents. Snowflake stared at Billy, watching him for all she was worth. Do you see it? The magic? Snowflake nodded. You can be a part of that, Snowflake. You can be one of the eight. I know you can, you just have to believe. It's not about believing. She continued to stare at the little boy who'd become her best friend. It's about love. That's a Christmas list if ever I've heard one. Ginger hopped up and motioned for Coco to take her place in front of the sleigh. Forrest hurried forward to harness her. The Kringle sisters knew how to harness reindeer but Forrest's dad always insisted that if there was a wrangler around, they did it for them. It was just one way he'd taught them to be gentlemen. We might need some help with that list. Ginger tapped her chin. Billy twisted his gloves together, nervous that he'd ask too much. Snowflake! Ginger called. Snowflake trotted over, her face one of wary interest. What do you think, Billy? Can we include Snowflake in this Christmas plot? He broke into a grin. Sure. Forrest laughed at Ginger's antics. She always knew how to bring a smile to a child's face. Still, a pit of worry formed in his stomach. 
he had a feeling he knew what Billy's Christmas wish would be. He wants Snowflake to stay with him, and that just wasn't a wish Santa could grant. She leaned over and cupped her hand around Snowflake's ear, which twitched when Ginger's breath hit it the first time, like it tickled. The reindeer nodded along. Suddenly, her eyes went wide and she stumbled back a step. Ginger ho ho hoed and put her hands on her hips. Don't look so surprised. It's possible. She moved forward so she could continue discussing her plans. Snowflake leaned into her, and soon her face was full of joy. She nodded quickly, almost whacking Ginger with her antlers. Ginger giggled. Be a good reindeer, all right? I will. I promise. Snowflake trotted in a happy circle. Ginger brushed off her bare hands. Kringles didn't mind the cold. That takes care of that. She ruffled Billy's hair and then motioned for him to hop out of the sleigh. He did, making his way to the front of the sleigh to tell Coco goodbye. I'm headed home. That list isn't going to check itself, you know. She winked at Forrest. He finished buckling the last strap. He kept his voice low because he didn't want to burst Billy's holiday bubble. Meeting Santa was a rare treat, and it should be a happy experience, one that he could draw on for the rest of his life. One that he could hold close when guys like Jordan tried to take it away from him. He leaned in. She needs to be with the herd. Ginger leaned in too and whispered, I know. Forrest stared at her. So, how's his wish going to come true? She picked up the reins. Believe, Forrest. Just believe. She flicked the reins, getting Coco to trot in a wide circle so they had more room to take off. Call me when you need a bigger sleigh, she called to Forrest. Why would I need a bigger sleigh, he called back. She laughed, as if he was missing something completely obvious. On, Coco. Coco bounded into the air and cleared the tops of the trees. Whoa! Billy gasped. Merry Christmas to all. Ginger waved. Forrest shoved his hat back and scratched his head. What is she talking about? A bigger sleigh? Billy shrugged. Forrest did his best to keep his spirits up. Their training session hadn't yielded any positive results, and on top of that, Ginger made a promise to Billy that Forrest wasn't sure he could abide by. Which in turn made him the holiday Grinch. That wasn't a role he was used to taking, and it didn't sit well with him. Chapter 20 But you told me we have until Christmas Eve to get the money. Mitzi wanted to scream at her landlady, who'd come into work to harass her again. Of course, she'd waited until Carlo was on her lunch break. Luann sniffed. I'm only asking for half now. I don't have half now. My side job pays in full when the job is complete. She ran her hand over her forehead, where a massive headache swirled like snow in a snow globe. She hoped it would settle down and let her finish inventory, but with Luann standing over her, that was unlikely. What job is this? asked Luann. I'll need a phone number to verify your employment. That was the last straw, and she wasn't talking about the straw and the manger in front of the church. No, this straw was dry and ready to light on fire. Mitzi rose to her full height. No. The word smacked Luann in the face, and she nearly stumbled into the display of ice melt. I will have the money by Christmas Eve. At that time, I will hand it over to you. But you can't come to my places of employment and harass me anymore. Getting me fired won't get you your money any faster. Luann glanced around the store to see who had overheard them. There were a couple of guys in the plumbing section and one lady browsing light fixtures. None of them were close enough to know what was going on. Besides, no one was really interested in the drama unfolding at the cash register. She smoothed her hair back into the tight braid. Well, 
no need to get upset. A desire to defend herself rose up, but Mitzi held her tongue. There was no use engaging her any further. She folded her arms and waited for Luan to leave. Luan sniffed again, lifting her chin as if she were a queen on parade, and tucked her pocketbook under her arm. The woman dressed impeccably. She probably had redeeming qualities, it was just hard to find them under all that greed. The door swished open and Luan was gone. For how long? Mitzi couldn't say. She hoped until Christmas Eve. Maybe laying down the law was what she'd needed to do all along. She grinned, thinking of the way she'd stood tall and stood up for herself. The guys set their products on the counter, and she greeted them with a Merry Christmas. They mumbled their replies. Mitzi didn't even care that they weren't as peppy as she was this fine holiday. She could share a little of her joy. She hummed as she rang them up and then smiled wide as she handed back the one man's credit card. Have a great holiday. He returned her smile. You too. She waved as they left. The woman was still browsing and lighting, so she went back to working on inventory. Carla came back from her lunch break. She stopped to watch as Mitzi sang softly with the music coming through the speakers. Well, someone's in the Christmas mood. She tucked her purse under the register and pulled out her apron, which she tied around her middle. Mitzi bopped a shoulder. I guess I am. Before Carla could give her a hard time about mistletoe, which Mitzi knew was coming as surely as she knew Forrest would come up with something warm and hearty for dinner tonight, Mitzi's phone rang. Luann, if that's you, she pulled it out of her back pocket and saw the school's number on the caller ID, hello, she answered quickly. It's the school, she mouthed to Carla. One mom to another, you always answered for your child's school. Mrs. Edge. This is Vice Principal Dimes. Would it be possible for you to come to my office sometime today? She was getting called into the Vice Principal's office. Can I ask what for? It appears Billy's been causing problems in his classroom. I don't think it's anything serious, but we should discuss it in person. Mitzi placed a hand over her stomach as if holding the place where someone had punched her. Billy doesn't cause problems. He's a great kid. He is. And we love having him here at North Hill Elementary. But there have been a couple instances, today especially. Floored Mitzi began untying her apron. I have a lunch break now. She made eye contact with Carla as she said the words, verifying that she was fine if Mitzi took her break. I can come right over. Wonderful. I'll see you soon. They said goodbye and ended the call. Mitzi moved fast. Sorry I have to split in the middle of this. She pointed to the inventory sheet. Carla waved her off. It can wait until you get back. No one will trip over it. Thanks. She hurried out to her car and made the three-block trip to the school in no time. North Hill Elementary was a tan brick building built in the early 90s. The windows were tinted and their frames dark brown. The mascot on the sign was a roadrunner, not the cartoon kind that kids love to watch on Saturday mornings, but a real one that looked like it would run right through you with its sharp beak. Mitzi gulped at the image and wondered if she was about to get run through. She pulled open the metal door, wondering how the kindergartners ever got into the building, it was so heavy. Inside, the carpet was maroon with flecks of tan. There were bulletin boards lining the hallway, each featuring a child's Christmas artwork or 100% spelling test. Paper snowflakes hung from the ceiling, 
and a red and white paper chain draped along the far wall. The office was the first door on the right, and she ducked inside the room made of windows like a fishbowl. Billy sat on a bench, swinging his legs back and forth. He looked up when she came in and ran to her for a hug. She held him close, not needing to say anything and not wanting to until she knew the whole story. Hey, bod. You okay? He nodded against her. You know I love you. He nodded again. You know I got your back. He tipped his head up, resting his chin on her belly and smiled. She bent down and kissed his forehead. Have a seat. I'm going to talk to Mr. Dimes. Okay. She approached the desk. Hello, I'm here to see Mr. Dimes. Right through there. The secretary pointed to the open door on the left. He's expecting you, Mrs. Edge. Great. Everyone knew she was coming in. Had they talked about her? About Billy? Still confused and a little more upset, she strode into the office. Merry Christmas, she said as she held her hand over the desk. I'm Billy's mother. Mr. Dimes got to his feet and shook her hand. He was a tall man, skinny to the point that she wondered if he was ill. His gaunt features were more suited to Halloween than Christmas. But his brown eyes were kind, and she found some comfort in that. Welcome. Have a seat. She took up the chair closest to her, and he settled himself back behind the desk. I have to say, I'm surprised. Billy's never caused problems in class before. Well, it's a special kind of situation we have going here. Oh. She folded her arms and then remembered that it could tell the person she was talking to that she was closed off. She'd studied body language a lot when she'd been married, trying to figure out what she was doing wrong, why her husband didn't see her the way he had before they'd gotten married. Turned out, it wasn't her he didn't want, it was any wife. She rested her arms on the chair. I'm still confused. He pressed his fingertips together and studied her over the top of them. It seems that Billy is under the impression, and rather insistent with the other children, that Santa is a woman. Mitzi let the words sit with her a moment. And that's a problem because, well, he shifted. It goes against tradition. Mitzi continued to stare at him. I don't see the issue. He huffed. Billy has a whole image of this Santa in his head. He described her to me in explicit detail, right down to the fact that she smelled like ginger snaps. He turned his chair to the side and spoke almost to the right of her instead of to her. Mitzi clenched her jaw. We love imagination. It's encouraged for students to think outside the box. But I'm concerned that Billy has created an alternate world in his mind to cope with his personal trauma. Whoa. Insecurities broke open like puncture wounds. Billy's been through a lot. But I don't see his making Santa a woman a manifestation of trauma. Her mind raced over the hundreds of articles she'd consumed about divorce and children. He may not feel comfortable with men after his father left. That's okay. There's no harm in what he's doing. There is if he upsets the whole third grade. We've had three children in here this morning, crying because they don't think Santa will answer their letters because they called him a him. That's unfortunate. Mitzi bit the inside of her cheek. I'm sure you can reassure them that Santa loves all children and he or she is not going to withhold presents because of a pronoun. It's more than that, though. He leaned in, resting his forearms on the desk. 
I understand women's issues, but sometimes, I mean, don't you think this is taking it too far? I don't want to tell you what to do in your home, but the world isn't ready for a female Santa. Mitzi stared at him in complete shock that he would even say such a thing. She wasn't one to get up on a soapbox, but something had switched inside of her at his words. The world wasn't. Was he serious? For the second time that day, she rose to her full height. For the record, the only people in the world who aren't ready for a female Santa are small-minded individuals with no imagination. His face went red. The beard. What about that? A woman could be just as good of a Santa as a man. And what about Billy? He doesn't have friends. He should be fitting in, not spewing feminine. Mitzi cut him off. The girls in this school should be encouraged to believe that they could grow up to be Santa rather than be told they can't because they can't grow a beard. She marched to the door but stopped and turned back. And as for my son, I'm proud of him. If the boys in this school are like you, then he doesn't need them for friends. She went to the front desk, her chest heaving. The principal had come out of her office to see what the ruckus was about. Mitzi met her eye, daring her to say a word. She nodded her head in acknowledgement before heading into the vice principal's office. Mr. Dimes, I think it's time we review the district's policy on empowering our female students in all areas of learning and education. Mitzi smirked. Someone had to say it, mumbled the secretary. She glanced up at Mitzi. What can I help you with? I'm checking Billy out for lunch. She hadn't known she was going to do that until that very moment, but being out of the school for a bit would probably be a good thing. The secretary typed for a second. Okay, he's good to go. Do you want a treat? She offered Billy her candy dish. He took a peppermint. Thank you. Mitzi could have kissed him for remembering his manners without prompting. That's right, he was a good kid. She hooked her arm around his shoulder and steered him toward the door. Where are we gonna eat? he asked. Thankfully, he didn't ask about the outburst, the principal, or why she was still breathing like she'd run five miles at a dead sprint. The whole thing was bizarre. Not ready for a female Santa. What was this, 1950? Forcing herself to figure out what to do for lunch helped calm her down. She had a bag in the car. They could split that and share a cocoa at the cafe, and it wouldn't break her bank especially since Forrest provided dinners most nights. Her food budget was looking all right, though she wanted to get a few special treats for Billy's stocking. She told him her plan, and he lit up. She vowed that one day, going to the cafe wouldn't feel like a treat. One day, she'd be able to afford eating out. For a moment, she considered inviting him to join them but he was at a follow-up appointment with the doctor for his arm and she didn't want to interrupt. Disappointed that he wouldn't be there, she decided to make this a special time with her little man. They moseyed into the diner and took up a booth. The place was only half full for lunch, and the servers joked with one another as they cleared tables and took orders. The place felt unrushed and happy. Billy knelt on his side of the booth, his shoes getting snow on the seat. She handed him some napkins and told him to wipe it off before his pants got wet. The server stopped by and took their order, and she pulled out her lunch and split the sandwich in two as they waited for Coco. Despite the way the conversation had turned out, she needed to address the issue with Billy. Billy. Do you know why Mr. Dimes was upset? He nodded and swiped his mouth with the back of his arm. She handed him another napkin. Because I told him I met Santa. 
She chewed, wondering where to take the conversation as Billy told her the story of Santa flying into the woods with a reindeer named Coco. Was that a coincidence or his subconscious making up details? Did you say Forrest was there? Yeah. He was the one who called Santa. Mom, he totally has her phone number. Mitzi blinked. Forrest had done this. She wasn't sure if she was mad at him or not. Probably mad. He shouldn't have interfered. It was one thing to stop her from telling Billy there wasn't a Santa, it was another to have playdates with a pretend Santa. And a pretty one at that, if she could believe Billy's description. Who was this woman? For all her might Mitzi couldn't remember a female wrangler, so it couldn't have been a relative. Who was she, and why was she hanging out with Forrest and Billy while Mitzi wasn't around? A shiver raced over her arms, raising goosebumps. She rubbed at them. Forrest wasn't her ex. They weren't serious enough for her to consider this cheating. A hundred other reasons why she needed to slow her racing heart and stop the shaking in her core raced through her mind. But she was having flashbacks to feeling looked over, not important, and degraded. Do you believe in Santa, Mom? Billy pushed the cocoa mug toward her. He had marshmallow foam on his top lip and was so full of innocent childhood hope that Mitzi couldn't bring herself to crush him. She smiled brightly and handed him another napkin. You have a mustache. She giggled. Taking a sip herself, she gave herself a marshmallow stash. Billy laughed and reached for the dispenser, handing her a napkin. You too. What? She feigned innocence. Is there something on my face? Taking the napkin, she blotted her chin and then her forehead, earning the giggles and change of subject she so desperately needed. Now if she could only get the picture of Forrest cuddling up to some woman in a red velvet Santa suit out of her head. She hated the baggage her ex had packed for her, but she also knew it was her responsibility to unpack it. As much as she wanted to confront Forrest over this, she wouldn't. She'd ask when the time was right and she wouldn't sound like a crazed, possessive girlfriend who'd kidnap him, tie him up, and leave him under the Christmas tree. She needed to calm down and focus on Billy for the rest of their special lunch together. Mr. Dimes's words about him not having any friends rang all too true. But if there was anything she could do about it now, it would be to help him know that he was special to her. She'd take on the rest of the world, and a wandering-eyed wrangler, when the time came. Chapter 21 Forrest put the gas hose in the tank and started it up. He cringed, thinking of the fuel he'd charged to the family business over the last year as he'd chased Snowflake all over the western half of the United States. The irony? She'd been right here the whole time. It had taken him almost eleven months to do what she did in one night. She was fast. Fast enough to be an asset to Ginger on Christmas Eve. If he could ever get her to fly again. As hopeless as it felt, he had to help her see the reason for the season. Or reasons, because there were so very many of them. His appointment with the doctor had gone well. His two and a half weeks of good behavior showed in the x-ray and he was able to take off the sling and just wear the brace until Christmas Eve. The added movement was positively liberating. The hair on the back of his neck stood up, and he turned to see who was watching him. He looked through the window, past the bags of groceries for dinner that night, and found Ely staring back at him. More like glaring. As soon as he realized Forrest was making eye contact, he shoved his cheeks up into a smile. He moved so he could talk over the truck bed, and Forrest did the same. Can I help you? Ely nodded, swiping his thumb across his nose. You find that reindeer yet? Forrest's hands clenched into fists. He had a medium-sized suspicion that Ely was the one who'd broken into the barn, but he hadn't wanted to alarm Mitzi. 
since it had been days since the break-in and no other forms of harassment had manifested themselves, he'd let it go. Besides, one shoe print in the snow wasn't enough proof to even have Ely questioned. Why? He wanted to ask a whole lot of questions, but the last year of training kicked in and he held back, letting Ely volunteer the info. I might have seen her. Might have, or did. Ely put his hands on Forrest's truck like he had a right to. His entitlement irked Forrest to no end. Only being raised with four brothers who had a gift of getting under a guy's skin gave him the strength to hold back. Yeah. I saw her. But I'm not saying anything until I get the thousand dollars. I'm not handing over a thousand bucks without some proof. You want me to cut off an antler or something? A yell of protest welled up inside his throat and cut off his air. Cut off her antler? Yeah, and throw off her balance and aerodynamics. That won't be necessary. What did she look like? She was pretty. Clean. Well cared for, don't worry. What color was her coat? It was dark, I couldn't rightly tell you except that it was a light shade of brown. Dark. As in, dark in the barn in the middle of the night when Mitzi and Billy were ice skating. What Forrest was looking for was an identifying marker, like snowflake snowflake shaped birthmark. Without it, the reindeer Ely saw could have been a regular deer. Why did Ely think he didn't know about Snowflake? Probably because she'd been there for almost a year and he hadn't seen her until he'd broken into the barn. Forrest considered his options. He could pay Ely and get a confession out of him, which would be thrown out of court because money changed hands. Or he could send him on his way. Really, if he put Ely off the track, that'd work even better. Well, sounds like it might have been her, but I already had a hot tip that looks like it'll pay off. Ely's grip tightened on the truck. I'll bet it will. He was suggesting there would be more in it for Forrest than just finding the reindeer. It's not like that, Forrest ground out. And I don't take kindly to what you're insinuating. He drew in a breath, making his chest and shoulders expand like one of the bull reindeer facing off with another bull. Don't get all upset with me. I just call it as I see it. Ely patted the side of the truck. He looked at Forrest out of the corner of his eye. You know what? I think that reindeer I saw was worth a whole lot more than a thousand bucks. She's talented. Forrest's blood went cold. It wasn't possible that Snowflake had flown in front of Ely, was it? She could have flown up to the rafters to get away from him. Would she have done that? He didn't know. But it wasn't a risk he could take. He opened his mouth to call Ely back, but he was gone. Disappeared. Nuts! This changed things. He pulled out his phone and called Pax. It's Forrest. Yeah. I'm not Dad. I can use caller ID. Forrest smirked. Listen, I need you to get up here with transport for Snowflake. We need to get her out of town as fast as possible. You know the fastest way to get her out is to fly her, right? He scowled. That would be simple if she would fly. She's still refusing to go more than three feet off the ground. Not to mention the fact that the sleigh wasn't ready. All they had left was to cover the seat, but he wasn't sure how long that would take them. He'd been hoping to stretch it out a couple of days so he could at least spend Christmas Eve morning with Mitzi and Billy. Pax let out a slow whistle. All right. I'll talk to the family and work out the details. Forrest's stomach clenched. The goodbye he'd hoped to put off was suddenly staring him in the face. Thanks. He hung up the phone. Now all he had to do was figure out a way to break a young boy's heart, smash his Christmas wish, and tell the woman he was quickly falling in love with that he was leaving town. What a Scrooge Why Christmas list. Chapter 22 Working on the sleigh with Forrest was the same as it had been every night before. She came home to a delicious meal in the oven, praised his mama for teaching him how to cook. They were back in the garage, so it was warmer. The overhead light cast a yellow hue on everything. 
The tools made the same amount of noise, and the wood still gave her splinters if she forgot to put on her gloves. And yet, everything was different. Forrest didn't tease her about wanting to paint the sleigh robin's egg blue, like an Elvis Presley Cadillac. Nor did he sing along when she put on the King's Christmas album. It wasn't just Forrest that was different. She felt it too. Instead of looking for reasons to invite him closer, into her personal space where he might steal a kiss, she worked on the other side of the sleigh. He'd taken the sling off each night and done arm circles and controlled movements to help with the muscle stiffness that came from being immobilized. That seemed to be paying off, as he hadn't lost much of his muscle mass in that arm and shoulder. Not that she was noticing his shoulders or the muscles. All right, she was. But what red-blooded woman wouldn't? Besides being wary of him because of the whole beautiful Santa incident, she was stressed because he wasn't being himself. All of this together made for one big ball of tension in her chest that she couldn't seem to loosen. They pulled out the seat and carried it over to the workbench where she'd laid the fabric he'd ordered. There were many things at the small town hardware shop, including sheet sets and Dutch ovens. But they didn't carry quality fabric, so Forrest had bought some online. They set the bench down, and she picked up the corner of the red velvet. This is thick. It needs to be. He set himself to the task of removing the old bits of fabric that remained. Having his sling off allowed him to do a lot more. The difference was amazing. What she thought would take them several nights might be done tonight. And then the sleigh would be ready to go. And she wouldn't have a reason to keep him here anymore. She drew in a breath of courage. Listen. There's something. They both stopped and then half smiled. Mitzi's half smile was because the topic she needed to bring up wasn't a pleasant one. So what was his for? You go first. She motioned for him to proceed. He pressed his lips together. I think the sleigh will be ready to go tomorrow night. She nodded. Looks like it. He kept his head down. Which means I'll be able to leave. She stared at the top of his head. Is that what you want? I don't really have a choice. People always have a choice, Forrest. She threw the fabric on the work table. What she wanted, no, needed, was a man who would fight for her. One who put her first. How could she settle for anything less after what she'd been through? He shook his head. I should be home for Christmas. Is that it? Is that all this is? a desire to be with your family for Christmas. She willed him to look at her, just look so she could see the truth or lie in his eyes. I know you don't like it, but I have to take Snowflake. Is that why you won't look at me? Because you think I'll be mad at you? Or are you hiding something from me? His head snapped up. Hiding. What would I be hiding? She folded her arms, and yes, she was closing herself off to him and his charms. Maybe something about Snowflake and Santa. He balked. In that one move, he confirmed all her fears. There was another woman. The air whooshed out of her. Listen, I couldn't care less that you have some Santa woman on the side. The words were pure lies. She cared. She cared so much. Then a new thought struck, and her stomach fell out. Or maybe I'm the woman on the side. Mitzi, he reached for her, and she backed away. Don't. His arms fell. She fought tears. The big, ugly kind that made her nose run and fair skin go splotchy. I don't think you need me anymore. 
Just turn the light off when you leave, okay? His face crumpled in, like he might cry. But that was ridiculous. Why should he be upset? He had his perfect Santa who smelled like ginger snaps and charmed forest animals like some princess. And what did she have to offer? A messy bun, a run-down house, and a bag of issues. She hurried into the house before he could respond, too upset to listen to his excuses or apologies. It was better this way. Better that she found out now what kind of a man he really was and that she saved herself from doing something really dumb like falling in love with him. Sure, because that hadn't happened. Not even a little bit. She stared up the ceiling, willing the tears not to fall, because somehow she had to muster up enough stability to be the strong one when she told Billy that Snowflake was leaving. He was at the church tonight, and by the time he got home, he'd be wiped. She'd have to tell him tomorrow. Her stomach hurt and she held herself tight. She could face this, she'd been through harder things. The trouble with giving herself a pep talk was that she knew when she was lying. This was one of those times. Divorcing her ex had been painful but necessary and a relief in so many ways, because she didn't love him anymore and didn't see a future with him. With Forrest, it was different. Chapter 23 For two days Forrest did his best not to see or think about Mitzi or Billy. Each of them caused him grief and guilt he could hardly bear, but for different reasons. With Billy, it was the knowledge that by taking Snowflake away, he was crushing the boy's spirit and probably his belief in Santa. No matter how much believing Forrest could muster up, he didn't see a way how Ginger could make this right. With Mitzi, he just wanted to hold her this Christmas and every Christmas thereafter. She didn't need him in her life, but she'd chosen him and trusted him, and that was worth more than all the gifts he'd ever found under the Christmas tree. And yet, he couldn't stay here. Not with Ely after Snowflake. If he knew she could fly, there was no telling what he'd do to her to make money. The man had an evil gleam and just enough sneakiness about him that he set Forrest on edge. If there was one thing Forrest had learned growing up, it was that family came first, and the reindeer were family. He couldn't leave Snowflake in harm's way just so he could spend more time with Mitzi. Maybe after the holidays he could come back, probably not, though. Not after the way she'd looked at him the other night. He was such a jerk. He finished working with Snowflake. She was strong enough and had stamina. He'd run her for a good 45 minutes, which was nothing for one of Santa's reindeer, and she hadn't broken a sweat. She also seemed more intent on training, putting herself into each exercise and not giving him as much attitude. Perhaps she felt better. Not good enough to fly but she probably enjoyed feeling strong. All these thoughts tumbled through and around in his head as he made his way back to the band B, where he planned to hide out until he had to go to the diner or cafe. If he never ate another plate of grease in his life, he'd be thrilled. First Street was packed with people, and he had to tap the brakes to keep from plowing through them. They were all gathered around a large trailer with the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch logo on the side. It looked like they'd only pulled into the gas station across from the hardware store a couple minutes before, as people were spilling out of the buildings to see them. Excitement coursed through his veins. His brothers were here! Forrest found a parking spot and jogged over. Homesickness spurred him to run faster. He hadn't seen either of his brothers in eleven months, and he missed them. When he'd first left home, the sense of being lost had almost overtaken him. But with time, he'd gotten used to being on his own and only talking to them on the phone. The normal wasn't at all normal, and his whole being suddenly knew that. Hey! He threw himself at Pax, pounding his back and laughing. Pax hugged him back just as fiercely. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes? Jack came around the truck and pulled him out of Pax's very manly hug to give him one of his own. His eyes shimmered with, well, they weren't tears because wranglers don't cry. I can't believe it's you. Look at that beard. 
and let the teasing begin, Forrest said, laughing. If you want teasing, tell us that this is all about. He touched Forrest's brace on his arm. Not on your life. Forrest pulled his arm away. Don't tell me you fell off during a workout, said Pax. I told you not to take off the training wheels, joked Jack. Forrest was so happy to see them, he didn't even care that they were giving him a hard time. Bang! 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 The sound of a disgruntled animal who'd been in the trailer too long broke them all apart. Who'd you bring with you? Forrest asked eagerly. Who else would be that grumpy? Jack pounded on the side of the trailer, responding to the reindeer inside, as he made his way down to the door. Dunder. People stepped back to let him through, curious enough to stand close but not in a hurry to get in the way. Dunder! Forrest called through the open slats, trying to get a glimpse of the legend. Dunder was retired from the North Pole. It was possible the retirement was only temporary. He'd been sick last Christmas and needed a vet, so the Kringles had brought him back to the ranch. He used to be Santa's lead reindeer. He was still strong, had a soft spot for Lux Kringle, and never lost his antlers, which was unprecedented in the reindeer world. Jack lifted the latch and then pulled the door open, revealing the majestic creature in all his glory. The crowd gasped and began pointing at him. Elementary school children pushed through the adults' legs to see what all the fuss was about. School must have just gotten out. Billy's blue hat bobbed on the outside of the crowd and then disappeared in the direction of home. He must be going to see if Snowflake was still there. An ugly taste filled Forrest's mouth for what he had to do. A girl in a pink coat gasped and covered her mouth. Is that one of Santa's reindeer? she asked excitedly. He was for a while, answered Forrest. He rubbed between Dunder's eyes. His chest expanded with love for Dunder and every reindeer in their care. Now he's our reindeer king, overseeing the herd and making sure they behave themselves. Dunder snorted in agreement, bringing laughter and giggles from the crowd. He sauntered down the ramp, where Jack met him at the bottom and took hold of his harness. Not that Dunder needed anyone to hold him, but the people were more relaxed when they thought a wrangler was in control. How fast does he fly? asked another kid. The boy standing next to him punched him in the arm. Reindeer don't fly, idiot. They do too, Jordan, said the girl in the front, stomping her foot for emphasis. And you're not getting any presents this year because you're on the bad list. So this was Jordan. Jack held up a hand to quiet the murmurs. Now, now. No need to fight. I can call the North Pole right now and find out who's on the list and who isn't. Forrest grinned. They'd done this routine a number of times when hired for Christmas parties and the like. Of course, for those events they didn't usually take an actual flying reindeer. For one, they'd had a drought of reindeer who could control their flight. For two, they didn't take risks exposing the reindeer as flying reindeer. For all governmental purposes, they kept a herd of average reindeer who were on the extinction list. Predictably, Jordan gave them a saucy look. I'm not worried. Jack patted his shoulder. That's what I like to see, confidence. He dialed the phone and hit the speaker button. Ho ho ho, North Pole, said Ginger. Ginger Kringle speaking. Ginger! Jack here. Ho ho ho, I can read the caller ID. Forrest and Pax exchanged an amused look. Do you have a second? I wanted to check a name on the list. I'm working through the CS for the second time right now. The crowd muttered in response to this. What's the name? She asked. Jack looked at Jordan. Jordan, Carmichael, Jordan filled in. His eyes were wider than before, and he looked from face to face for reassurance and didn't find any. Jordan Carmichael? Whom Ginger played her part well. Then again, she was Santa, so it was just her being her. Well, I have him down for harassing younger kids at school for believing in Santa. Says here he doesn't think reindeer can fly either. The crowd gasped. The little girl put her hand on her hip and smirked at Jordan. 
Jordan turned green, as did several other kids his age. He's borderline naughty list. But if he can pull it together, I could still drop off that video game he wrote me about. You wrote Santa and then said she wasn't real? gasped the girl. She looked ready to tear him apart. Tell April I know when she's been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake, said Ginger. The little girl's mouth fell open, as did all the kids and adults. How did Ginger know her name? mumbled the crowd. No one said it out loud. Did you hear anyone say her name? Forrest laughed. That was the icing on the Christmas cookie. How cool was his job? He got to work with Santa, that's how cool it was. It's been good talking to you, Santa. Jack winked at the crowd. I'll see you on Christmas Eve. No, you won't. I know when you were sleeping, Ginger sang, and then she cut off the call. The crowd chuckled and then burst into applause. Jordan shoved his way out of the crowd. The kid had a lot to think about. Forrest watched him go, and then his eyes fell on Mitzi as she made her way across the street from the hardware store. His heart stopped at the sight of her. Candy canes! That woman was beautiful. He drank in her dark red hair piled on top of her head and the way her coat hugged her curves. He savored every visual sip of his eyes over her figure and then watched her eyes. He hoped and prayed that she'd see him in one second and that she didn't in the next. Excuse me, said a woman on the front row. Can I get a picture with the reindeer? Sure. Reindeer love having their picture taken. Pax took her phone out of her hands and lined up with her and Dunder behind him. He flipped the camera to selfie mode and positioned himself in the shot. His goofy face was at the bottom of the screen. Say Merry Christmas. She laughed at him including himself in the picture but managed to get out. Merry Christmas. He snapped the picture. You gonna talk to that lady or just stare at her all day? Asked Jack. Forrest snapped out of his stupor. No, he turned his back on Mitzi and rubbed Dunder's shoulder. The big animal leaned into him, sensing his discomfort and wanting to help. He glanced back at him between photo ops and gave him a look that said, I feel you. Bro Forrest thought he was hiding his broken heart pretty well, but if Dunder could see it, then it was as plain as a whipped cream mustache on his face. He made his way around the trailer to the front of the truck to see if his mom had packed goodies. She was on top of things like that and wouldn't have sent Pax and Jack off without a basket of something sweet between them. He opened the door, and bingo! Cinnamon rolls. He reached for one, desperate to take comfort from his mother's cooking. The roll was as full of cinnamon as ever, with just the right amount of frosting. He turned around and found Mitzi standing right behind him. He jumped and almost dropped the roll. Tin soldiers, woman, don't sneak up on me like that. Her arms were folded and her back was hunched, and he didn't think it was from the cold. So you're taking Snowflake today? She stared over his shoulder. The cinnamon turned to sand in his mouth. Yeah. He forced down a swallow, his throat tight. I thought we'd wait until morning. But yeah. We're going home. I'm sorry. Sorry? Sorry you have to take Snowflake, or sorry for something else? Sorry for everything. He shook his head. Did you find the envelope? He'd left the money for the sleigh repair between the wood and screen doors the day before. Yeah. Thanks. She stared at her feet. Every part of Forrest called out to hold her, to whisper sweet promises and be the man she needed. Maybe after Christmas. She shook her head. Don't. I can't take a half-hearted, backhanded, vague we can't see each other again someday. He scowled. I wouldn't do that. Right. She kicked at nothing and then turned to leave without saying anything else. Forrest was angry. You think I was leading you on, he said, loud enough that a few people cast him looks. Mitzi stopped in her tracks, her shoulders lifting to her ears. You think I didn't really care about you, he pressed. She whirled around. I know it. I heard all about you and Santa. 
She said Santa as if it were a dirty word. Did your girlfriend finally catch up to you? His brain put together the pieces as fast as Dunder in his heyday speed. Ginger, he asked in disbelief. Ginger's happily married and has a baby. Mitzi threw up her hands. Whatever. Forrest marched toward her. I can understand you hating me for taking Snowflake. I'm prepared to take all of that, because I deserve it. It sucks. I wish she could stay. But she can't, and I have to be the bad guy who does the right thing, even if it's killing me. Mitzi's eyes began to mist over. But I would never cheat on you. Dunder cleared his throat and gave Forrest a look that said, Get it together. Women like nice guys, not ones that bellow at them. Then why didn't you tell me about her? I had to find out from Billy's vice principal, she shouted back. That was one connection Forrest couldn't make. He tried again. And again. But he had no idea how Ginger's training session with Snowflake had gotten to the vice principal of the school. The confusion must have shown on his face, because Mitzi rolled her eyes at him like he was being slow on purpose. He was gearing up with a snappy comeback when Billy slammed into Mitzi, almost knocking her over. On instinct Forrest reached out and grabbed them both. Billy, she chastened him. Forrest was caught up in the scent of her. That dumb pine candle and her shampoo. For the love. Was he destined to get lost in her every time he smelled pine? Mom! Billy screamed, even though they were all in a tight circle. She's gone. Snowflake's gone. Mitzi met his gaze, a mirror of his own panic. Forrest pulled them both close. I found her once, and I'll find her again. The force of his words raced through him. We'll find her, he promised. Chapter 24 Mitzi shrugged her shoulder, gently pushing Forrest off of her and Billy. His arms were wrapped around the two of them to keep them from falling, and it was too much. She couldn't let herself get comfortable there, no matter how much she wanted to lean on him. Focusing on Billy, she did her best not to think of the wrangler standing so close she could smell the laundry soap on his flannel shirt. And if she thought too hard about it, she'd realize how soft that shirt felt against her cheek. Didn't the man know how to zip up his coat? It was cold out here. A fact she was acutely aware of now that his body heat was taken away. What do you mean, gone? she asked Billy. I mean gone, he wailed. Forrest jerked his head, and one of the men at the back of the trailer made their way over. She did a double take. You have to be a Nicholas, she blurted like an idiot. He smiled easily, that same smile full of trouble that Forrest used to make her stomach dance. Although she had no such reaction to this man. That's right. He touched the brim of his hat. Pax Nicholas. Of course. I was your reading buddy when you were in kindergarten. No kidding, Dot. He reached out to shake her hand. You did a great job. I graduated college and everything. He said it as if she were individually responsible for his successes in life. She smiled and turned to include Forrest in their reunion only to see a dark scowl on his face. Load up, he told his brother. We have a situation. Pax got moving. Mitzi marveled at the trust between the two of them, the easy way they all work together. You're going looking for her. Forrest nodded. He started waving the people who had gathered away from the trailer. Move along, folks. We need to get moving. Hope you have a Merry Christmas. He sounded happy, but there was tension in his shoulders. People grumbled but did as he asked. Mom, Billy said quietly. I'm scared for Snowflake. Mitzi rubbed his shoulder. Forrest said he'd find her. 
Billy buried his face in her stomach and held on. Her heart lurched. Mitzi. Luann had her arm in the air and weaved through the crowd. Not now. Come on. Mitzi took Billy's hand and pulled him toward Forrest's truck. She glanced over her shoulder to see Luann disappear on the other side of the trailer. She'd effectively dodged her. Phew. She didn't have time to haggle with the woman right now. There was a reindeer on the loose. Get in. She helped Billy into the middle seat, trying not to think about how he'd sat there on their ice skating date and how she and Forrest had held hands over the backrest while he slept on the way home. They watched through the windshield as Forrest and his brothers loaded up the reindeer. Do you see those men? she asked Billy. They're all reindeer wranglers. If anyone can find Snowflake, it's those three. She kissed the top of his head, hoping he felt reassured. The more time that went on, the more worried she became. What if Snowflake had run away? She could be anywhere by now, and the sun was almost down. Most of their search would be in the dark. Come on, she urged the wranglers. Forrest pointed toward her house, giving directions, and then he marched toward the truck, his eyes on the sky. He must be worried about losing the light too. He pulled open the truck door and only hesitated a moment when he saw his passengers. We're going to help you look, Mitzi stated. Forrest climbed in without agreeing or disagreeing. They have to turn the trailer around. We'll beat them to the house. She touched his shoulder, silently thanking him for not putting up a fuss. Technically, Snowflake belonged with the Wranglers and he could have told them to stay home or get out of the way. But no one loved the reindeer more than Billy. Knowing she was safe, even if she had to go to the faraway land of North Dakota, was better than spending his Christmas worried about her. They pulled into the yard just as the sun set. There was a light glow along the horizon, but that would be gone soon too. Forrest turned the truck and they ended up facing the barn doors. One of them hung crooked on its hinge. The geese and ducks were all over. Mitzi threw open her door before the truck came to a stop. Snowflake, as she screamed, unable to hold back the terror. She skidded to a stop inside the barn door, her eyes working to adjust to the dark. Snowflake. Her voice echoed through the rafters and a bird took flight, scaring her. Hay bales were scattered everywhere. Bags of feed had been torn open, their contents spilling all across the floor. When Forrest ran in, he hit the grain and skidded. Billy was right behind him. Fudge ripple. Forrest lunged for the ladder and climbed up. Snowflake. Billy ran in and out of stalls, checking each one. Mitzi stood in the middle. The reindeer wasn't there. She could feel it in the emptiness. The wrangler's truck lumbered into the yard, loud in the darkness of fear that swept into her mind. This wasn't her. She pointed to the mess. Forrest jumped down the last two rungs. It was Ely. Ely. Billy joined them, putting his arms around her and holding on. She patted his back. You think Ely stole Snowflake? Forrest nodded. His eyes darted to Billy. Why? Mitzi asked. He didn't even know we had a reindeer. She thought about the night someone broke into the barn. You think he was the one who broke the lock before? Forrest looked around the barn. He asked me about a reward for her. But I told him it was off the table. She tightened her hold on Billy. So you think he took her? That's absurd. What would he do with a reindeer? 
Sell her to the highest bidder. Is there a market for reindeer? She had no idea. She flies, mom. Billy looked up at her. He's going to sell her as a flying reindeer. Of all the, hush Billy. She couldn't deal with his Santa infatuation right now. Forrest called Pax from the yard. They all raced out. We found tracks. A truck and trailer going into the woods. That way. He pointed down the four-wheeler track to the tire ruts. Now that he'd pointed them out, she couldn't believe they'd missed them before. Do you ever haul through here? He asked her. Never, she replied. Forrest was already moving toward his truck. Get Dunder out. There's a sleigh in the garage. Call me when you're ready. Will do. Pax took off for her garage. Jack went to the back of the trailer. She and Billy joined Forrest. The sleigh will get places a truck can't. Forrest and Billy exchanged a look. Billy grinned. Yeah, it will. Forrest chuckled. Mitzi felt like she'd been left out of a joke. Whatever. They had a reindeer to find. Chapter 25 Billy came around to Forrest's side of the truck to get in. She doesn't believe, he said quietly. Does she? Forrest shook his head. It's harder for grown-ups. Even as he said the words, his heart tightened in pain. If Mitzi didn't believe in Santa and flying reindeer and Christmas magic, then she wasn't the one for him. As much as he loved her, and make no mistake, he loved her, he couldn't take her back to the ranch. He'd seen what happened to people who didn't believe in Santa when they had to live with the magic. Doc, their longtime vet, had been married once. His wife didn't believe, and it had driven a wedge between them. Seeing a reindeer fly didn't make a person a believer. The belief had to come first, because it was more than just flying and gifts. Let's find Snowflake. Forrest lifted him into the truck, and he scooted over the seat until he was next to Mitzi. He pulled around and lined up with Ely's tracks. This road was even worse than the dirt path into Mitzi's place, and they all bounced around the cab doing their best not to knock into one another. His phone rang, and he answered. You're on speakerphone. He needed both hands on the wheel. There's a lot of light north by northeast from your location, said Pax. The sound of rushing wind howled in the background. How do they know that? Mitzi asked. They're in the sleigh, he offered for explanation. Can you take a right? You'll get there faster, said Jack. Forrest looked at Mitzi. She squinted out her window. I think we can. Yeah. Turn by that big boulder. There's another four-wheeler path there. They turned, bouncing around like popcorn in the microwave. Can you get in there? He asked his brothers. In the sleigh, they could land and have snowflake in no time. There's too many trees. We'll look for someplace close to park the sled. 10-4. Kill your lights, Pax told him. He did. The light of the moon cast a blue glow over the snow and made it easier to see the dangers. Up ahead, there was a yellow glow. That must be the lights they could see from the sky. What is that? Mitzi scooted to the edge of her seat and stared through the windshield. It looks like a movie set. Hurry! Billy slapped his hand on his leg. Forrest pulled into a small clearing crowded with equipment. As soon as Forrest cut the engine, the sound of two generators roared through the cab. Plugged into them were outdoor spotlights, the kind people used to work on their yards after dark. There must have been eight of them, all pointed up at the twenty-foot ledge overhead. They piled out of the truck and looked up. Snowflake's back end appeared, her hooves dangerously close to the ledge. He's going to shove her off the cliff. Forrest gritted his teeth. Ely would scare Snowflake into never flying again. And film it, Mitzi added, 
pointing to the three cameras set up on tripods. That dirty, forest's curse was cut off by Billy breaking into a run toward the bottom of the ledge. There was a small path there that zigzagged its way up to the top. How Ely managed to get Snowflake up there in the first place, he wasn't sure. All he knew was that it couldn't have been gentle. Snowflake would have fought him tooth and antler, using both to make her point. Forrest was going to be sick. She wasn't used to being manhandled or roughly treated. Mitzi took off after Billy. Forrest shifted around, looking for a better way to get up there. If his brothers could get here with the sleigh, they could fly up and get her. He patted his pockets for his phone. Dang! It was in the truck. He sprinted back, hoping they could make it before Ely managed to shove Snowflake off the cliff. Chapter 26 Billy, come back here. Mitzi climbed as fast as she could. This wasn't so much a trail as it was a place to grab a hold of things and drag yourself up. A bare root here, a tree branch there. Billy was a good ten feet ahead of her and climbing fast. We have to help her, he called over his shoulder. Mitzi couldn't agree more. She just didn't want her nine-year-old on the front lines. He cleared the top and disappeared from view. Stop, he screamed. Get out of here, kid. Ely yelled. Leave her alone. Mitzi found a new gear and scrambled over the edge. The image in front of her caused her heart to stop. Snowflake stood with her back to the ledge. Her eyes were wide, and she kept glancing behind her as if she were looking for more ground. All that greeted her was open air. Billy was making his way out to her, his hands out to his sides for balance. The spot where Snowflake stood was only four feet wide. Ely was between her and her child, holding a hot shot. Normally used for cattle with thick hides, the hot shot sent a small electrical shock, like they'd get if they brushed against an electric fence. They were not made for reindeer, and the sight of it in his hand enraged her. Snowflake never hurt a soul. She took in other animals who didn't have a home for the winter and let them into her stall. She'd become Billy's best friend when he didn't have one. And she'd done all she could to make Mitzi's life better, being a listening ear on the darkest days. A scream of injustice built inside of her, and she surged forward, grabbing on to the hot shot. Let go, as she said to Ely, who was trying to tear the stick from her hands. No. I'm going to make millions off this video. He tugged her closer to him. Spit landed on her cheek as he screamed and grunted. She held fast, the shiny end of the stick glinting in the spotlights as it whooshed past her face. By killing a reindeer at Christmas. I'm not trying to kill her. Ely yelled. He pushed away and yanked her back like a rag doll. Her feet slipped and she went down to one knee. Ely twisted the stick and she lost her grip, her palms smacking the ground. No, she yelled. Ely turned and jabbed at Snowflake. Billy threw his arms around her neck. Stop it. Get out of the way. Ely threw his hand to the side, slashing it through the air. Mitzi scrambled for his feet, trying to trip him. He kicked at her his arms windmilling. Get away from me. His arm went wide and he nicked Snowflake. She yipped and reared with Billy still holding her neck. Mitzi watched in horror as the animal's back leg slipped over the edge. In a heartbeat, she bit Billy's coat and tossed him over her back as they fell over the edge. No! Mitzi's scream blocked out any sound. The blood rushed through her ears, and she couldn't draw in a breath. The sound of thunder shook through her ribs, 
and a blur of brown movement caused her to turn towards Ely. He was on his back, the giant reindeer from the trailer standing over him and blowing hot air all over his face. Ely cowered into the snow. He had nowhere to go and one angry reindeer to deal with. Mitzi crawled to the edge and flattened herself onto her stomach to look over. She didn't want to see Billy down there, but there was a chance he'd survive the fall, wasn't there? As she cleared the rim, she heard his giggle. What in the world? Forrest cradled Billy against his chest, like he'd caught him out of thin air. Snowflake stood beside them, shaking her antlers and her tail. Relief, sweet relief, rushed through her veins, and for a moment, she was too weak to move. He's okay. Forrest called up to her. Billy giggled again. She met Forrest's intense gaze, unable to express her relief. He's okay, Mitzi. He's okay. Hearing the words repeated was exactly what she needed to get her body jump-started. She scrambled back and to her feet. The Nicholas brothers were just reaching the top of the bluff when she found the way down. He's over there. She nodded her head in the direction of Ely. Thanks. They made their way over to the dunder, speaking softly to him. Mitzi didn't listen to their words. She was too intent on not falling as she went down the hill much faster than she'd gone up. She hit the ground and ran pell-mell into Forrest and Billy, wrapping them both in her arms. I can't believe you saved him, she gasped, pressing a kiss to Forrest's cheek. It wasn't me. It was Snowflake. He nodded to the furry face. Snowflake looked quite pleased with herself. Mitzi grabbed her cheeks and planted a kiss on Snowflake's face, right between her eyes. Snowflake sneezed, and they all laughed. She reached for Billy and he landed in her arms, hugging her tight. How did you? she asked Billy. We flew, Mom. She hugged him tighter and mouthed thank you again to Forrest. He grinned and rubbed Billy's head. The sound of rocks and ice and snow falling behind them caused them all to turn around. Dunder was at the bottom of the trail as Ely came through. He looked like he'd been in a schoolyard scuffle with his hat askew and his clothing rumpled. The Nicholas brothers were perfectly put together. Mitzi walked over and put her hand on Dunder's back. Did you rough him up a bit? she teased. He snorted. Just enough. A giggle escaped her, which built into a belly laugh. It was one thing to think Snowflake could talk, but to have another reindeer do so was too much. Dunder looked at her with understanding. He nudged her gently, toward Forrest. Don't let him get away. She gave him a look. Oh, so you're a matchmaker too. He shook his head. I just call M like C, M. He turned and lowered his head at Ely, using his great big, and sharp, antlers as incentive for him to stay put. Ely hung his head, defeated. Pax called the sheriff. Billy tugged at her coat. Are you mad at me? Mitzi swept down and wrapped her arms around him. No. Why do you think that? Because you got mad when I said Snowflake can fly. Mitzi looked back and forth between the two reindeer. She shook her head in amazement. Who am I to say if she can fly or not? She shrugged. Billy smiled. Hey Billy, called Jack. Come help me, will you? Billy scampered off. Mitzi stood up, brushing her hands off. I'm going to hurt tomorrow, she said to Forrest. He was watching her intently. Why didn't you correct him? She glanced down. 
You were right. Childhood is precious. He almost lost his tonight. I, I can't keep him little forever, but as his mom, I should protect his innocence. She looked around at the bright lights and video cameras. Not that this is good for him. Forrest touched her arm. You did amazing. Scared the pumpkin pie out of me, but you did amazing. She smiled. I think we can put some of that pumpkin pie back in you. After all, tomorrow is Christmas Eve. He smiled. Yeah. I mean, I won't say no. She laughed. What about your brothers? Do they need a place to eat dinner? His smile faded. They're going back tonight. It's best if we get Dunder back to the ranch before Ely has a chance to tell his story. She frowned. Snowflake too, right? He nodded. I'm so sorry. She put her hand on his arm. No. I understand now. It's not safe for her out here. She paused for emphasis. I mean, a flying reindeer, the whole world will come looking for her. Forrest eyed her. Are you being sarcastic? She rubbed her frozen lips together. I'm choosing to have more magic in my life. Maybe it was really that simple. Making the choice to believe, to live in a world where Santa smelled like ginger snaps and the reindeer in her barn could fly. I don't know how she and Billy survived that fall. She lifted her shoulders. I mean, flying is one plausible explanation, isn't it? Oh, totally. He put his arm around her and steered her toward his truck. And what about love, is that plausible too? She lightly punched his side. I think so. You know, if the right guy came along. What if he wasn't just any guy? What if he was a wrangler? She glanced up at him from lowered lashes. If it's the kind of wrangler who cooks dinner, then I think he'd have a shot. He chuckled, and she leaned in to hear the deep sound. Sirens filled the night air, and their quiet moment was broken. She gave him a longing look as red and blue lights began to flash. They needed to finish this conversation, but now was not the time. With a sigh, she turned to face the police and all their questions. She only hoped they believed what happened here tonight. Because it was kind of unbelievable. But in her heart, she knew. Chapter 27 Forrest buckled the last strap of Snowflake's harness. He had a talk with his dad, and they decided she should stay the night, as long as she promised to get home as fast as possible when the time came. She agreed to everything and even looked pleased with herself. Forrest didn't trust her any further than he could throw a hula hoop in the air. But he wanted to stay, so he didn't question her motives. Tonight was a very big night for the girl. He ran his black glove down the front of the classic velvet red suit with the white fur trim. It was a big night for all of them. Snowflake leaned down and wiggled her shoulders. The leather straps fit a little tighter than they had a year ago but one look from her was enough to let Forrest know he shouldn't mention it. She closed her eyes for a moment and then opened them again. It'll do for now, she said. He glanced at Billy. You think she'd ready? He lifted a mitten. She did all the exercises. True. Forrest pondered the morning's workout. Snowflake had flown, her old speed was coming back to her. She managed to weave between trees and under low-hanging branches without trouble. If anything, the years she'd spent on the ground had helped her gain more discipline. Do you think Mom is ready? Billy asked. Forrest stomped his black boots to keep the circulation flowing in his cold feet. He was scheduled to play the part of Old St. Nick for his hometown parade, bringing up the rear in the annual Christmas Eve parade. 
If they didn't get going, one of his brothers would have to fill in. He put his hand on the boy's back. I hope so. I really do. So much was riding on this Christmas Eve that his hands shook as they approached the back door. Billy did his best to match his stride with Forrest's. Forrest pulled open the screen door and then pushed in the wooden one. Mitzi was at the stove, stirring a pot of hot chocolate. She wore a pair of jeans that had sparkling thread on the pockets. They drew the eye, and he had to remind himself that staring wasn't the gentlemanly thing to do. She faced them quickly, her face lighting up in the process. Man, he loved that she did that for him. And he loved even more that he was the reason she brightened. If he could spend every day of his life making her smile like that, he'd be a lucky man. Well, look at you. She grabbed the air in front of her belly. Ho ho ho. He chuckled. Do you like it? He opened his arms wide and spun around, showing off. Mitzi shook her head in amazement as she moved to stand closer to him. I love it. You look so handsome. He swatted at a straight piece of white hair that tickled his chin. The beard itches. She nodded. I'd expect so. She reached up and smoothed it into place, then pecked him on the lips. Hopefully that will hold it. He wanted to hold her. But there was an honorary elf standing next to him who danced like he needed to visit the restroom. Forrest settled for cupping her elbow and giving her a kiss on the cheek. She leaned into him, savoring every last moment. When he pulled back, her eyes were closed and she was smiling. After a second, she came to herself. Hey! Did you guys get everything done out there? Her hair was down in long waves, and she had on a Christmas sweater with Rudolph on the front. She was gorgeous. And if everything went well tonight, she might agree to be his. Words left him at the thought. Yeah. We're all set. Billy shoved Forrest's side, jolting him back to the task at hand. Ask her. Forrest cuffed Billy's shoulder. Whose surprise is this anyway? Billy wrinkled his nose. Just hurry. What surprise? Mitzi cocked her head. Forrest took off one of the heavy mittens and swiped his hand down his side. He had a long conversation with Billy in the barn about wanting to date Mitzi and what that meant for the boy. Billy was under the impression that Forrest was moving too slowly, but there were steps to take. He wasn't quite sure how fast he'd move through them, that was something he and Mitzi would have to work out together. But he didn't want to skip steps important to a woman. I was wondering if you wanted to meet my family. Mitzi giggled. I've met them, remember? He smiled. She'd been to the ranch several times as a kid. But there was meeting the Nicholas family, and then there was meeting the Nicholas family. Third grade field trips don't count. He winked. Besides, this time I'd like to introduce you as my girlfriend. Finally! Billy threw his hands in the air. Forrest kept his eyes on Mitzi. Having a wingman was a good thing but a critique crew was making him nervous. So how about it? A soft smile grew on Mitzi's lips. I'd like that very much. He grinned. Yeah? She giggled. Yeah. Good. He picked her up and spun around. Let's get going. Billy hooped too. He ran to the door and opened it. Forrest headed that way without putting Mitzi down. Her eyes widened. What? Now? She looked down at her sweater and skinny jeans. I can't go like this. I have to pack. Billy grabbed her coat and scarf from the hook. There's no time. The Santa parade starts at six. Tonight? She kicked her feet and Forrest set her down. She kept her hands on his shoulders and he wondered if there was a better feeling in the world than being near her like this. He used to think flying a sleigh was the closest thing to heaven, but he was wrong. We'll never make it in time. It's, like, five hundred some odd miles from here. Forrest took both her hands in his and lifted them, kissing their backs. She was on the verge of a big moment. 
she decided to believe last night, but he was asking her to take a leap. We can make it, Mitzi, if you believe we can, we can. Chapter 28 Mitzi stared into Forrest's cornflower blue eyes. There was a depth there that he rarely showed, one that she felt privileged to see. In that depth was a whole lot of faith and trust, and he was asking her to have the same. She held her breath. Could she do this? Could she throw her heart into the magic and the fun and the childlike wonder of Santa and Christmas and miracles and happiness? The things she'd been through had made her a realist on many levels, but they also stripped her of a part of herself. She wanted that back. Whatever was on the other side of his question would be a part of her life with Forrest, and that was enough for her. Besides, she'd seen some crazy things the last couple of days. She could believe that there was something special about this night, this eve where the greatest miracle of all happened in a lowly stable. Soft snow fell outside, and there was a level of expectation that made her arms tingle. She leaned in so her forehead touched his chin, closed her eyes, and whispered, I believe. Forrest kissed her quickly, a hot, branding type of kiss that seared her in the best way. Before she could sink into it and really enjoy the moment, he was pulling her out the door. Billy held the screen door open for them, and Forrest helped her into her coat on the way out. He lovingly wrapped her scarf around her neck. You're going to love this, he told her. She smiled back at him. I already do. Being with her guys, seeing them so happy, it filled her up. Headlights washed across the yard, making them all squint. Billy covered his eyes with his arm. Who's that? Mitzi groaned. Of course she would show up tonight. Hang on. She dashed back inside and grabbed the envelope of money and a loaf of apple spice bread wrapped in a tea towel. Before Luann could stop her car Mitzi was at the window, knocking. Luann jumped and grabbed at her heart. She gave Mitzi a stern look, but not even her sour expression could sour Mitzi's mood. The window went down several inches, and Mitzi shoved the red envelope through. Merry Christmas. Luann felt the envelope to see how thick it was. Mitzi smiled. You're welcome to count it. She held up the bread, and Luann lowered the window another inch. I baked this for you. I hope you have a wonderful holiday. The look on Luann's face was priceless. You baked for me. Mitzi tugged at the bottom of her scarf. I did. I hope you like it. Luann sniffed as if she expected to smell rotten apples. It's not horrible. Mitzi laughed. That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Luann chuckled, and a look of humility came over her. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you too. Mitzi stepped back as the window went up. She watched Luann navigate the turn to head up the lane. Her heart was warm with kindness, which was a big deal after all that she'd gone through with Ely the night before. He was out on bail, released into Carla's custody. Carla said she intended having a small family Christmas with lots of Bible time and a possible come-to-Jesus conversation, depending on how humble Ely felt. Mitzi wished them both luck. Other consequences would come for Ely, but she decided to let God and the courts measure out justice. Besides, Christmas was a time for forgiveness and remembering the Savior. She gave one last wave to Luann before returning to Forrest and Billy, who waited patiently. Forrest welcomed her into his arms. You okay? Mitzi had told him about Luann and the harassment in their long conversation in front of the Christmas tree last night. 
They talked and talked until she'd fallen asleep. It was one of the best nights of her life, and she looked forward to many more of them. Mitzi smiled up at him. Everything's perfect. He grinned. Then if you'll step this way, your sleigh awaits. He led her to the edge of the property and then down a trail that had been stomped into the snow. Billy ran ahead, too excited to wait for the old folks. In a few more steps, she saw the sleigh she and Forrest had fixed up, with the board to brace the side panel on the green velvet seat. He draped pine swags along the sides and added red bows. It was beautiful in the waning light. At the front, harnessed and pawing the ground, Snowflake urged them to get a move on. I've been waiting forever. She stomped her front foot. Can we get going already? Billy jumped in and scooted to the side. Come on, Mom. You sit here. He patted the seat. Mitzi eyed Snowflake. You sure she can pull all of us? Snowflake snorted. I work out, you know. Hey, I'm just asking. Forrest climbed in after her and took up the leather reins. Thankfully, there was an extra set in the trailer his brothers had brought with them. They'd had the harness too, just no sleigh. So things worked out nicely when they needed them to, almost like someone was looking out for them. That was how things worked for his family, if she remembered right. They always seemed to find a way. He sat next to Mitzi and lifted the reins. Okay, we're off to North Dakota. Mitzi smiled. He looked dashing in his Santa suit. She snuggled into his side, and Billy snuggled into hers. With a flick of the leather, he called, Giddy up. The runners squeaked against the snow. Snowflake dug her hooves in and kept her chin high. The stubborn reindeer wouldn't so much as groan as she worked to get them started. They quickly began to slide in earnest. Mitzi grabbed onto Forrest's arm, slightly alarmed at the speed at which Snowflake accelerated. The wind whipped through her hair. It was crisp and cold, but she was happy. She laughed with joy. This is fun. Just wait. Forrest called out, his deep voice ringing through the trees. He flicked the reins again. On, Snowflake. Billy giggled in anticipation. Snowflake took one giant leap and was off the ground. Mitzi squealed and closed her eyes, grabbing on to Forrest. Look, Mom. Billy yelled. Mitzi opened her eyes and her head spun as trees whipped past them, the sound of boughs scraping the wood loud and crashing in her ears. Forrest laughed. Forrest, she yelled. We're, we're flying. Mitzi squeezed Billy and held on. Snowflake bellowed like a trumpet. Take us home, girl. Forrest pulled on the reins angling them toward North Dakota. Mitzi held on tight, not out of fear, but because she was in love with this moment. Forrest turned, and she realized he had a worry crease between his eyes. Reaching up, she smoothed it away. He kissed her, and her stomach dropped out. Snowflake cried out, and Forrest pulled away quickly to correct their course. Sorry. He called to the reindeer. You're not the only one who hasn't flown in a while. We'll behave ourselves. Mitzi leaned up and whispered in his ear. Speak for yourself. His eyes went wide. I intend to make good use of the mistletoe. I look forward to that. He winked and then focused on where they were going. Mitzi leaned forward and looked over the edge. Houses blurred past them, all lit up for Christmas like one of those villages people collected. 
She settled back in her seat, vowing to buy herself one of those villages to help her remember this absolutely perfect Christmas moment. It wasn't long at all before Snowflake lowered her antlers and made her approach on the town. They landed in the alley behind the grocery store and then trotted out to join the rest of the Christmas Eve parade already lined up and ready to go. The place hadn't changed much, and she felt her heart leap. Being here felt surreal and perfect. It's about time, called Jack. He wore a warm rancher's coat and a gray felt cowboy hat. He grinned widely. As of twenty minutes ago, you have a new nephew. Forrest grabbed onto her hand and squeezed, his joy at the announcement flooding through her. Jack didn't give them time to ponder over the announcement. I see you brought some passengers. Forrest grinned. Snowflake refused to leave this guy behind. He patted Billy's head. And I wasn't leaving Idaho without my girlfriend. Jack's eyebrows shot up and he broke into a sly grin. Though he had to know that things were serious if Forrest had flown her in the sleigh, announcing it as bold as a Christmas wish was not usually his style. Welcome back, Mitzi. Mitzi blushed all the way down to her toes. Thanks. Jack turned to Billy. You want to come with me? We have some secret Santa business to take care of tonight. Billy bounced out of the seats as if it were made of springs. Mitzi knew it was not, because she was the one who'd stuffed the padding. Yeah. He looked at her, asking permission. Go ahead. She waved him off. He bounded after Jack, asking a hundred questions a second. Mitzi smiled after him. This was a safe place for her boy. She'd loved roaming around Sleigh Bell County with her friends. It was a child's haven. Forrest nudged her with his shoulder. I love that kid. She nodded. He's the best kid in the whole world. When Forrest didn't respond, she turned to look at him and was captured by the love in his eyes. Her breath slowed, sounds dropped away, and all she could see and feel was him. He took off his gloves and cupped her face. I mean it, Mitzi. I love him. She gulped, overwhelmed by the honesty of his words. And I love his mom. He tenderly traced her cheek, waiting for an answer. Something solidified the feelings reaching through her for a place to hold on to. It was the fact that he didn't rush her. He nuzzled her neck and kissed her ear and made her lower belly burn so strong that she had to grab onto his jacket for fear she'd lose her mind. Finally, she was able to breathe out the words, I love you. When his lips claimed hers, she let go of his coat and fell into his heart. It was there that she found all the love she'd been searching for. It was there that she settled in and never wanted to leave. Chapter 29 Christmas morning didn't so much dawn as it got less dark. A large snowstorm had moved in overnight, blanketing the town with clouds and a layer of fresh snow. It looked like it would be a record-breaking snowfall by the end of the day, and they were only a fourth of the way through the winter. Forrest tapped lightly on the door to Mitzi's room. Neither she nor Billy answered. A pang of worry hit him, and he tapped again before opening the door, only to find the bed made and the place empty. He hurried downstairs and into the kitchen, anxious to see Mitzi after their words of love the night before. He almost passed up from holding his breath waiting for her to respond. Mom sat at the table, showing Billy a family photo album, while Mitzi helped Dad flip cinnamon pancakes. Sense that spoke of holidays gone by filled the air. Apple, maple, cloves, all of them reminded him of the love of hearth and home. His chest expanded. He was home. After a year-long search in some of the most destitute mountain ranges, he was finally back with the people who loved him, and he brought the people he loved into the circle. 
Morning, sleeping beauty, Dad called. Mitzi checked him over, her gaze turning appreciative. His chest warmed as he remembered their goodnight kiss that had taken half the night. But Santa didn't know we were coming, Billy said to Mom, cutting into Forrest's thoughts. Who says? Mom argued. Maybe you should go check under the tree. Billy shot off like a cannon. Mitzi handed Dad the spatula and followed. Forrest fell into step behind her, placing his hand on her lower back. She leaned into his touch, and he dropped a kiss to the top of her head. Morning, gorgeous. Morning, handsome. I could get used to this. He put his hands on her hips and drew her to a stop, kissing her neck. She giggled and wrapped her arm up behind his head. Me too. Mom. Billy screamed, breaking them apart. They rushed in and found him in the middle of a mound of presents. What in the world? Mitzi approached. Billy held one up. This one's for you. He handed it to her. She checked the tag and found her name. Spinning on Forrest, she lifted an eyebrow as she shook the gift. He raised both of his palms in the air. It wasn't me. She opened it to find a beautiful cream-colored sweater dress. I've always wanted one of these. She hugged it to her. She grabbed up the card, flashing it to the side so he could read it too. Merry Christmas. Love. The Kringles. Here's one for you. Billy handed a medium-sized box to Forrest. And these are for me. He started opening gifts. Mitzi set her box aside and went to help him decide which one to open first. Forrest opened his and found a small velvet box and a note that read, I parked the big sleigh behind the barn. Let me know when you get Mitzi and Billy moved in. Robin will make a pie. Ginger. Forrest cracked open the small box and found a beautiful engagement ring inside. He snapped it shut before Mitzi could see it and tucked it in his pocket. With a grin toward the fireplace as a thanks to Santa, he jumped into opening presents with Billy. Soon his brothers joined them and his parents. In the chaos of ripping paper, reading cards, and exchanging hugs, he slipped the ring on Mitzi's finger and whispered words of forever. She answered with a look and a kiss. He have to thank Snowflake for getting lost last Christmas Eve. In all his travels, he'd never dreamed he'd find the one his heart had been searching for. He was glad he'd gone through the toughest year of his life, because the best things in his life had come out of it. Epilogue Natasha Newberry chewed her bottom lip as she stared at the clock. It was noon on Christmas, and she hadn't opened one gift nor sung one carol. What she did do was join the Zoom meeting with her boss. We need someplace fresh for the film. And I don't want to film in summer with fake snow, I want the real thing," said the woman on the screen. One of the top directors in the family movie business, Jennifer Oden wouldn't let them off the call until the details were hashed out. Natasha bounced her leg, debating. As an underling in the production company, she was only on the call to take notes, not offer suggestions. But she really wanted to get this meeting over with and join her family for church. Being in Hollywood most of the year sucked her soul away. She needed some Jesus time to refill her cup before they started filming the next project. Butting in could mean getting fired. Or it could be her big break, a chance to show that she had more than coffee making and note taking skills. What about that place in Alaska? asked the assistant director. Clear water or something. Jennifer flicked her manicured fingernails. Too rustic. I want modern billionaire meets reindeer. That did it. Natasha raised her hand. I think I have something. She quickly hit the share screen button, easy enough to do, since she hosted the meeting, and pictures of the reindeer wrangler ranch appeared. This is a reindeer dynasty if there's such a thing. She silently cursed herself for sounding unsure. The Wranglers all work with a large herd of reindeer. 
but do they have the permits we'd need to film there? Natasha clicked on their website, showing all the accreditations and certifications they'd acquired. All that we need and more. So why isn't everyone filming there? asked Jennifer. Natasha shrugged as she clicked back to her video. I'm sure we can find out. Someone will have to call Anne. Do it, said Jennifer. Me? Natasha pointed to her chest. That's something a representative of the company should do. I don't. I want all the information by the new year. If everything goes through, we'll start filming right after we wrap up the fall session. That would be after Thanksgiving. I'll take care of it. She put on her best professional smile. No one said goodbye before they left the meeting. She stayed until their screens disappeared. She'd once clicked out before everyone was gone and earned a lecture on professionalism. She took a moment to jot down the number for the ranch. Look out, Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. Hollywood is coming. You've been listening to A Nutty Christmas Reunion A Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Christmas Romance Book Written by Lucy McConnell Welcome back from the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. It's, I wanted to just let you know how grateful I am to all of you for reading slash listening and enjoying these stories. If you would like to find more of my romance stories, check out the rest of my channel. Also, if you're more of a reader than a listener, or if you just want a chance to see what the books are like on Kindle, head on over to Amazon and pick up a copy of any one of my books. They are all free in the Kindle Lending Library. If you find one that's not enrolled, drop me a line and let me know. I will see you back here next week when I have another Reindeer Wrangler Ranch story for you. The next one in the series will be all about Hollywood coming to town, and it's a great fun little romp on the ranch. This one sticks to the ranch, so I can't wait to see you next week. Time, same channel, all the good things. Thanks for listening. Remember that you are loved, and I'll see you later.